committees will, you can deal with them. You know, right. In okay. Sequential as opposed to okay. Are you ready to go? I'm ready. No need to run, Gabriel. No need to Do that first order. First order, yeah. Morning, everyone. Call this uh, transportation committee meeting to order. Um, I am uh, Councillor McKean, and I will be the chair today. My inaugural flight as chair. So hold on for a bumpy ride. Uh, joining me today are. Uh, Committee member, uh, Councillor Ed Gibbons. We uh, we have people away on injury reserve, and one may be drafted to another league. So we're uh, we're down a little bit. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mayor Don Iveson, who is a member of the committee as well, and we have drafted Councillor Ben Henderson. You're on standby. The idea is that we. It's on waivers. Yes, so it, that we, what we, we don't want to lose quorum this morning, and if I uh, had to jump up urgently, we would not lose quorum, so this, that's the advantage to that. We're also joined this morning by Councillor Mike Nichol, Councillor Andrew Knack, and Councillor Amarjeet Sohi. So, again, welcome everybody, and um, I need someone to, oh, first of all, Mayor Iveson, would you uh, uh, take I, a motion? I would uh, move to appoint uh, Councillor Ed Gibbons as uh, acting vice chair for this meeting. Thank you. Uh, all in favor of that, everyone. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, adoption of the agenda. I need a motion. I will, uh, I will move the agenda as presented. There's no additions. Thank you very much. All in favor of that. Thank you. And uh, Councillor Gibbons, I'm going to go to you on the minutes. I'll move adoption of the minutes, March 25th, 2015. Thank you very much. Any comment? None? All in favor? That, oh, Councillor Nichol. I just uh, would like to wonder if we could consider, uh, as a matter of tying them in together, the performance standards on bike lanes, uh, the alternative bike lane for 95th Ave, and my inquiry all together as one. Absolutely. Pardon? I'm sorry, Adam. We're, st we're on minutes at the moment. Minutes. I yeah. thought we were, I heard agenda. Yeah. All in favor of the minutes. That is carried. Uh, protocol items. I see none. Uh, now, selecting items for debate. Councilor Gibbons. 6.1, 6.2, 6.3, 6.4, 6.9, 7.1, Thank you. Any other takers? I'll move the balance if you want. Thank you very much. All in favor? And that is carried. Uh, and we did have a suggestion earlier. Well, we have... Um, uh, Mr. Chair, before you go any further, you might want me to read what the committee's done just so that those people can take off. First bump on my bumpy ride. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, this morning, Transportation Committee has passed the following items without debate. Uh, item 5.1, status report, business case for workspace enhancements, Westwood garage replacement, revised due date of May 27th, 2015. Item 5.2, Scona Road traffic safety and speed mitigation strategies, revised due date of May 27th, 2015. Item 5.3, enforcement practices, high traffic areas, revised due date of June 29th, 2015. Item 5.4, detailed study of residential parking issues and options, Central McDougall, Oliver and Queen Mary Park, Revised due date of May 6th, 2015. 
Item 6.5, the West Edmonton Mall Transit Center, options for temporary enhancement, refurbishment, and renewal. Item 6.6, .6, request for non-statutory public hearings of valley line vehicular access closures. Item 6.7, a change order exceeding $20 million, asphalt concrete supply. And item 6.8, sole source purchase over 500000 for road paper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, we will move on to request to speak. And before I go any further, we've had a suggestion, uh, of course, that, um, and we will deal with this next, uh, moving the um, low-income transit pass first up and then the the items uh, on we have a number of items on bike lanes that they be dealt with sequentially rather than uh, cross-referenced and that seems to make sense because they are different enough uh, but councillor uh, uh, yes mayor Iveson. well i'll move that uh, we make 6.2 time specific for first item of business and that we make um, 6.3 6.4 uh, seven one and seven two uh, sequential, so that we'll 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 do them in that order. Or really, I guess actually the they're all kind of tied together, right? You could also move six point nine to be the last item of business, and that would actually well. There's move the also other two what six point one though. Yep. So we uh, so what actually what if we make what if we make six point two first item of business, six point one second item of business, and six point nine last item of business. And then that would group all of the, uh, was there a speaker on 6.9? Okay, sorry, let me try that one more time. Why don't we make 6.2 the first item of business, 6.1 the second item of business, 6.9 the third item of business, and then if we work through all the remaining ones in order, then they'd be all grouped together. That works for me. I accept that motion. Well, my, oh. my, only con my only concern is, is that I have one or two business people here that can't spend the entire day uh, here. They'll, they have to get back to their, to their companies. So as long as I don't know how to deal with that, that's why I said if they're all, we pile them all together, we can deal with the from the standards issue, uh, which is, you know, we're talking about performance standards, which directly ties into uh, the bike lane removal, the bike lane utility issue and the alternative bike lane for 95th. But if it's sequential, it's sequential. But we're just gonna be kind of going over the same stuff, right? That's, that was my only point. Um, any advice here? Uh, no, no, and I, you, you have speakers that, that you, your advice is we might lose them. Um, that, Mr. Chair, if you fun. want to make those items, you, you can cross-reference them if the committee desires. Uh, you can also make those time-specific if you desire, if that would work for the, the business members in the room. So we were, the, the advice was that we do it sequentially, but... Um, well, we could, we don't have speakers on, if I may. Yeah. We don't, have, um, we don't have speakers on 6.1, so we could deal with that last. Yeah. Um, and that would move all the bike items forward. And uh, we move 7.1 up in the order. Then is that the one you said? Seven point one is the is the um, item that Councillor Nickel is concerned about. Right. If you do want to deal with those items sequentially, you could deal with that item the first of those four, if that would work better. Well, I think 6.3 sets sets the rest of them up, right? Yeah. So, so if we, yeah. Okay. But but what we can do is move 6.1 to last so that we get to it all a little bit sooner. Yeah. Okay. So we haven't voted on my motion yet, I don't think. So I, if it, with the... So it would, so the order so we would go point, in is... 6.2 first. Yeah. 6.1 second. No. No. Last. no. Last. Okay. Okay. Six point nine will be really quick. Yeah. So we do six point two, then six point nine is second item of business. Then six point three, four, seven point one, seven point two, and uh, 
then back to 6.1. So we move them then, right? We yep. have that motion yep. before us. Comments? All in favor? That is carried. Now, speakers. Councillor Gibbons, I pass that over to you. Starting with uh, 6.2 low income transit pass pilots, uh, number one, Karen Good from Youth and Empowerment and Support Services, John Cookman from Edmonton Social Planning Council, Isaac Grew from Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board, Brandy Bedisti um, from Boyle Street Education Center, Bruce Robinson from Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board, and John Vanderbell to answer questions only. Under 6.4, alternate bike lanes on 95th is uh, Christopher Chan, uh, Edmonton Bicycle Computer Society, Bruce Robinson, Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board, and Elaine Solez. Um, number uh, 6.9, bylaws uh, replace bylaws 12454, Transit um, System Advisory Board bylaws, Bruce Robinson, uh, which comes from the Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board. Under 7.1, um, bike lanes removal, um, Christopher Chan, Edmonton Bicycle Commuter Society, uh, number two, Matt uh, Althimes, uh, and Elaine Solzhez. And under 7.2, we have Elaine Solzhez as, as well. Mr. Chair, we also have Elaine Solzhez on item 6.3. I'm, I'm sorry? I, item 6.3 also has um, oh. Elaine Solzhez as well. Oh, up there, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. And the, under 6.3 is Elaine Solzhez. Thank you, Councillor. Questions, comments? All in favor? That is carried. Um, now, we have item uh, 2.3 we've dealt with all the time specifics. Any Councillor inquiries this morning? Okay. So, first up, item 6.2. Mr. Weinzer. Mr. Chairman, uh, as the uh, uh, administrative folks are coming up, I can give you a bit of a background on the, on the uh, report. We have no presentation. Uh, however, this report is in response to a May 7, 2014 request from Transportation Committee. Uh, we've worked closely across the city between transportation and community services in, in looking at how this could be implemented. Uh, and if, if committee uh, directs that the program proceed, uh, we'd advise that a more detailed implementation plan uh, be prepared with uh, how that could be put into place in an orderly manner, um, uh, incorporating some decisions that committee and council would make around um, how much of a subsidy, if any, uh, you'd like to pursue and where the uh, where the funds should be coming from. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Or uh, part of the. Thank you. Uh, we'll get you then to step back and again, uh, speakers. On our uh, on the uh, item 6.2, Karen Good. Uh, I'm just going to read all the name and John Colkman. Uh, there you are. Itzak Rue. Thank you. Brandy Vasisti. Hi, Brandy. Bruce Robertson from the Transit Advisory Board. John of Vanderbilt. I think that's our panel. So I know a number of you have been here before, <clears throat> but one more time, you have five minutes. Four minutes on the green, yellow will give you one minute, and when it turns red, I'll ask you to wrap up, and, and, I, and I really don't want to be rude, so I'll hope you wrap up quickly when it hits red. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, good morning. I have not done this before, so I'll try to uh, be brief with my comments. Um, most of you will, will be familiar with Youth Empowerment and Support Services. We're a 31-year-old organization serving youth from 15 to 24. We have an emergency shelter, daytime programs, as well as long-term housing. We're operating seven days a week, 365 days, and every hour of it. So um, that's sort of our position in terms of where we're coming from. And uh, I'd just like to make a few comments with regards to the pilot program. Um, we are um, in full agreement with the strategic alignment of the transit services, and we're really glad that the city is 
um, beginning to uh, approach some of these matters in terms of low-income individuals. Um, I would like to make a few points as it relates directly to youth. Um, I guess first and foremost is, is a process in place that allows for a single application and common proofs of income and residency. Um, and although this is very efficient uh, to work through the leisure centres as you have in the past, it's very difficult for youth. So the first challenge is youth getting to those places to actually apply for um, this pass. So uh, the requirement of transportation to get to those places is certainly part of the challenge and it continues from there. Um, proof of ID, difficult to provide government sourced ID for many youth. Sometimes all they have is a school ID and sometimes they don't have that. Um, proof of residency is difficult because many of the youth that we serve in particular are homeless or are, are temporarily homeless. Um, and we are making efforts to improve that, um, huge focused efforts on improving that, um, but it, it remains an issue. In the past, through City of Edmonton Services, we've had some challenges where our organization has tried to um, confirm residency in our long-term housing programs and had that letter refused. So some way of addressing how we prove residency is essential. And then comes this issue of income. So many youth who are between 15 and 21 may or may not have ever filed a tax return. If they've been thrown out of their homes, if they're homeless, they aren't necessarily carrying their CRA tax assessments with them if they've even filed. So proving income is difficult. For the kids that are working, we could get a pay stub. We can, we can maybe work with something like that for income proof, but the tests that are currently suggested in place will be really challenging for many of our kids to prove. So there's just a few hurdles that we're putting in, in the way of this. Um, the community initiatives that the city has undertaken to deal with homelessness and poverty issues are fantastic. And they talk about a collaborative approach and a place-based approach. Um, so if down the road we see these youth hubs, it would be a great way to be able to put those passes in the hands of kids that need them um, and get them on the road to jobs, to schools, to family and to supports. So that would certainly be something we would, we would ask you to consider in terms of how to distribute those passes. So that's certainly part of, part of um, the issues, I guess, that we're looking at. We have person-to-person -person intake processes in place already with professional youth workers, so we have systems there that would likely allow for us to be able to distribute passes or uh, tickets in some sort of reasonable manner. I know there's the issue of, of controlling um, abuse and risk um, of these sorts of things. We know from the 2014 uh, count that there were about 240 youth in Edmonton identified as homeless. Um, Homer Trust sees that number closer to five to 600. Um, either way, it's not a huge number in terms of risk of abuse of the system to maybe look at processes that will be a little bit more youth friendly and a little easier for kids to access. So they're already coming to certain organizations. I represent only one of them. There's lots of my colleagues here. Um, so they're already coming to certain places and if we could distribute from that place-based approach, um, I think that that might be something that would work quite well. Um, we would also be very interested in, in uh, seeing a process in place that maybe did consultation with lived experience individuals. I know as part of the working group that we had one representative, um, but again, because of where some of these meetings are held, transportation to them is difficult. So we would love to see some lived-in experience consultation done in some of the places where the people are already coming, and we'd love to volunteer yes to be one of those spots to do that. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I did not tell you that Deb Cotley said, make sure you talk about dignity. 
So in this process of dealing with kids, it's so important to talk about how can we do this without making them prove they're poor um, and, and prove that they're not with their parents and prove that they don't have access to income sources that might be in their families. So I'll close with that. Uh, and I thank you for your consideration of some of these suggestions. Thank you. That's good. Thank you very much, Mr. Copeland. Thank you for the, the opportunity to speak. Many low-income Edmontonians can't afford their own vehicle. They therefore rely on public transit to get to their jobs, medical appointments, do their shopping, or, or get to recreational facilities. A discounted transit pass for all low-income Edmontonians, regardless of their source of income, is a concrete step the city can take to help end poverty. The Edmonton Social Planning Council therefore strongly supports the implementation of a low-income transit pass. We urge the Transportation Committee and City Council to support Alternative 3, the implementation of a low-income transit pass priced at a 60% discount to the regular adult monthly pass. This is the same discount already in place for the AISH monthly pass. It would be confusing and unnecessarily complicated for the AISH and Low Income Transit Pass to have different prices. The existing AISH Pass should instead be folded into a Low Income Transit Pass available to all low income Edmontonians. Moreover, anything less than a 60% discount would create uneven and unfair levels of support for low income working people, Alberta Works recipients and AISH recipients. Regarding Alternative 5, a Low Income Transit Pass is a complement, not a replacement, for the Donator Ride program. Moreover, many low-income residents may prefer the convenience of a discounted monthly pass compared to the inconvenience of having to obtain individual do Donator Ride tickets from social agencies. To reduce administrative costs, we are pleased the Transportation Department supports the adoption of a single application and documentation process for both a low-income transit pass and the existing leisure access program. It's a good idea to have a single application process where the low-income transit pass could be sold at community recreation centers. It is puzzling, however, that the Transportation Department is proposing to locate its own staff in the community rec centers rather than training the staff already there to sell the transit pass. Having the same city employees sell both passes could further reduce administrative costs. The ESPC cautions against raising other transit fares to achieve revenue neutrality as outlined in Attachment 8 of the Transportation Department's report. As the Transportation Department notes, raising other transit fares would reduce transit ridership, thereby conflicting with a key goal of the city's The Way We Move Transportation Plan. Even if the Transportation Department's $8.5 million net cost estimates ends up being correct, a low-income transit pass still represents good value for money and smart public policy. City Council is frequently called upon to make these kind of policy choices. Just last week, Council decided to reduce 2015 property taxes because of an unanticipated reduction in the education portion of property taxes paid to the province. Not to comment on the decision per se, but it bears pointing out that the $31.4 million saving could have covered the anticipated cost of a low-income transit pass for a period of four years. Implementing a low-income transit pass is a tangible way for the City of Edmonton to show leadership in ending poverty. As noted in the Transportation Department report, affordable public transit has been identified as a key focal area for action by the Mayor's Task Force for the Elimination of Poverty in Edmonton. We all know the City of Edmonton cannot end poverty on its own. Ending poverty also requires action by federal and provincial governments and the community at large. One step the city can take to make a real and lasting impact on poverty elimination is to create a low-income transit pass. The Edmonton Social Planning Council therefore urges the adoption without delay of Alternative 3. Thank you for this opportunity to present. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Copeland. Mr. Rue? Uh, good morning, councillors and mayor. Thank you for your consideration um, report from administration um, to your motion regarding ETSAP's original proposal that ETS introduce a transit 
pass for low-income Edmontonians. EDSAP would like to recognize administration for their effort in coming back to Transportation Committee with a report and for comprehensive research they've done on this issue. You've read the EDSAP report um, presented last May to you, the data around the need for low-income transit pass. According to Statistics Canada, about 100,000 Edmontonians live at or below uh, the low-income cutoff. These citizens who rely disproportionately on transit have been severely affected by ETS fare increases. The price of an adult monthly pass has risen by 51% since 2007. In the EDSAP report, we have shown that most other Canadian cities provide subsidized rates for lower income citizens. Finally, you've read in the EDSAP report of how a low income transit pass reflects the sentiments expressed in various Edmonton guiding documents like the way ahead, which emphasize, and I quote, the ability for people of all incomes to have access to core services, including transit. If we all look beyond these statistics and justifications, we will notice that this idea is really about, and it's the core, low income transit pass is about improving the lives of Edmontonians. For a relatively minor cost, the introduction of a low income transit pass by ETS will substantially improve the lives of some of our most vulnerable citizens. It will allow Sarah, a single mother of three, to purchase books for her daughters. It will allow Omar, a recent immigrant, to expand his employment opportunities beyond where his feet can take him. And it will allow Kevin, the sole income earner in his family of five, to have a few extra dollars in his pocket at the end of each month to save towards his children's education. I hope we all see this future that is possible with your help. EDSAP encourage uh, TC in the strongest possible terms to invest in the future of Edmonton by directing ETS to proceed with a low income transit pass with haste as a three year pilot project. We believe that the benefits of a low income transit pass far outweigh the cost and we trust administration to deal with most of the details regarding the implementation of a pass. There is more than sufficient time to resolve any issues associated with the introduction of a low income transit pass. These issues should not stand in the way of making a positive decision today to move forward with a pass. Do not look at obstacles. See the opportunities. The board, however, would like to speak to two details from the ETS report. First one is, we would like to caution against ETS merging the H pass with a low income transit pass. If this action will increase costs to existing H pass holders, it is a no-go. If this will happen, then a good news story around the introduction of a low income transit pass will almost certainly be overshadowed by negative feedback about increasing the cost of transit for those on age. And one group of vulnerable Edmontonians would be pitted against another. Not a good idea. Second, we would like to express some concerns around the TATS zero net operating proposal from ETS. This proposal suggests quite substantial increase in transit fares, particularly for seniors away to find the low income transit pass. It should be noted that it's up never intended that this initiative be cost neutral. And we would like to reiterate our recommendation to the council. However, if it is determined that a zero net operating proposal is desirable, then it's up would much rather see funding a low income transit pass is found in ETS operational budget. 
and they can sort that out in a good way. It is EDSUP's opinion that the city could find significant cost savings that would help to reduce administrative costs Thank around you, the delivery of this. Thank, Thank you. Ah, oh, oh, oh. Ms. Basista. Basisti. Thanks. Sorry. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think a lot of what I wanted to say was said already. I'm a youth worker at Boyle Street Education Center. It's a charter school for high-risk youth between the ages of 14 and 19. Um, this is my ninth year there, and I can say with a lot of confidence that a lot of our youth um, don't live at home with their families. They don't have a fixed address. They couch surf. Um, they get a lot of these $250 fines. So I was really happy to see that the city is interested in putting forward a low-income pass. Um, I guess my concerns primarily would be um, whether or not they require an address um, just getting that proof of income, a lot of them, as Karen had said, it's hard for them to do, do their taxes. They don't necessarily have the ID. So it just puts everything back. And in the meantime, they need to get to their appointments, get to school, get to their jobs. So um, I guess I would just hope that City Council takes that into consideration. I know it's a very small um, group of the population that you're hoping this pass is going to serve. But um, I guess I hope that you would consider maybe training one of the members in each of the agencies that serves these youth to do the intakes and distribute the bus passes rather than having the youth go to the rec centers. It just makes more sense. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. We know these kids. And if you can teach us you know, what you require, they don't have to tell their story over and over again. They don't have to try and get across the city to get the pass. So I guess that's, I guess that's all I needed to say. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next up, Mr. Robertson. Oh, I'm just here to sort counsel. I'm just here to answer questions. Please. Thank you. John Vanderbilt. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, that's our panel. And we'll uh, start with the committee and questions. Councillor Henderson. Well, didn't you get drafted? Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, you know, I'm going to go with Councillor Sohi. Defer to Councillor Sohi. He asked this to be moved up for his oh, thank schedule. You. So I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to follow up on uh, with you about the uh, uh, the challenges for homeless uh, youth not having identification and. Uh, Others and also the criminalization of uh, young people when they get on the transit and uh, uh, they don't have the fare, they get a ticket, end up in the court system, costing more actually than uh, uh, what the uh, what the otherwise cost be. So working with agencies is a good idea, but there could be another option would be uh, open to some having a certain number of low-income passes given to agencies, then you decide how you, how you distribute them, but you purchase them at, uh, at the discounted price. That would, could be one. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds pretty good. Okay. I mean, kids still get rolled, quote-unquote, for their bus passes, and some of them, they lose everything, right? Like, just being so transient, they don't have a place to put their stuff, and if they have learning disabilities, like, it's hard for them to hold on to things, yeah. so... I mean, there's, there's always something, right? But that would certainly be a good first step. Okay. And Mr. Kolkman, on the, like you do a lot of research in this area, your organization. Uh, and uh, one thing that I noticed in the report, that vast, uh, the, the, the increase in ridership is uh, of existing users of the system who are unable to access public transportation now because they can't afford to. So having a bus pass, allows them to use transit more often, which improves their uh, employability options, their access to community. So the economic benefits, uh, have you done, I know you haven't, may not have done a detailed analysis, but can you comment on the, uh, uh, on the overall access to market, uh, access to labor uh, for employers? and for people gaining meaningful employment because the way our jobs are distributed throughout the city. 
Yeah, I, I think uh, the administration itself d does have some data that it was able to collect from Calgary, which uh, which does have has had a uh, what I call a universal low income transit pass now for for a number of years, and and there's no question that they themselves are projecting a, you know, what as certainly an increase in ridership, and and I th and I think that that does assist in a number of ways. It's consistent with. Uh, you know the the way we move uh, plan to to increase uh, transit ridership, uh, and as you point out, it it uh, has you know a multitude of benefits. Uh, I know when we first discussed this as well, we had a number of students from Northwest College here talking about how great it would be to have a low income transit pass to get to things like ESL classes, and and certainly it will make uh, you know it, it easier for more Edmontonians to get you know to those entry level uh, jobs. Uh, uh, if they cur currently can't afford to uh, to buy a transit pass and have to kind of either walk uh, or perhaps rely on others for for rides or whatever the case might be, so I I think it has a multitude of benefits uh, and one that I didn't mention, uh, which again was you know the the subject of uh, some research by iHuman, mm -hmm. uh, which which spoke last year is the uh, you know uh, and, and one thing I think we should be measuring uh, or trying to measure is is the the reduced incidence. Uh, or, and conflicts with the, the justice system in terms of getting, you know, and, and it was alluded to by uh, this morning again, uh, you know, uh, that's, I mean, that's really expensive. You know, once you find somebody and they can't pay their fare and then you have to put a warrant out and, I mean, that just, you know, and, and so I think it would be good, you know, I think we, you know, and I presume the reason it was called a pilot is so that we would put in place mm -hmm. ability to kind of measure some, you know, some of the costs and benefits. It also reduces the conflict with uh, transit operators and, uh, and transit security. Right. And the issue of uh, not having identification is not just only for the, uh, the homeless uh, youth, but also with uh, uh, the recent refugees, they don't have documentation, and, uh, and temporary foreign workers who are uh, going into that situation now because they're losing their status and they're going to lose their documentation. So it's a, it's a bigger problem that we have to somehow uh, uh, overcome uh, and find a solution to. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Councillor Gibbons. So a question to um, Randy. What, what does happen with the young people that get the $250 fines? Well, by the time a lot of them come to see me, the ticket is already overdue. And it's a little complicated because we serve youth between the ages of 14 and 19. So if they're under 18, um, they can usually get the fine reduced. But if you're over 18, you either have to pay it um, or if you want to fight the ticket, right? Um, but then it's kind of their word against the peace officers. And oftentimes they say, well, I forgot to stamp my ticket or it fell out of my pocket or something like that, right? Um, if they're over 18, we now have... Uh, contact uh, Michael Gunther, they can write a letter just explaining their circumstances and he can possibly get the ticket withdrawn, but that's if the ticket isn't overdue. So if the ticket is overdue, they either have to pay it or they go to jail, basically. And I've actually had kids that have gone to the remand to pay off a couple of bus tickets. So John, how does the Calgary program work? The universal one you just mentioned. Well, the, the, basically the way it works is uh, it's available to any low-income Calgarian, regardless of their source of income. Uh, so unlike the Edmonton Pass, which is only available to people on the H program, it, it is also available to people who are on Alberta Works Income Support, as, and, and more importantly, perhaps even uh, to low-income working Calgarians. And, and the same thing, because probably the majority of low-income people in Edmonton uh, are, are working at least part-time, often full-time. and. Uh, and, and they're required to pay the same, you know, uh, $89 per month as, uh, you know, as those of us who are, you know, uh, who are more fortunate. And, and Calgary has done some tracking in terms of ridership. Uh, they, they've uh, indicated that it has, you know, sort of increased that transit ridership overall, which is a, a desirable goal. I, I'm not aware of research done there on in, in interaction or conflict with the transit security uh, system, but, but as I mentioned, uh, iHuman presented a report on that uh, uh, to this uh, very committee, I believe, uh, when, when the issue last came up May 7th, showing uh, that there, you know, when they gave transit passes to kids, there was, you know, way less, 
uh, you know, conflict with, with transit security and with the, uh, the justice system generally. So, so you brought something up that uh, you were opposed to the um, selling them out of rec centers, but what, what would be wrong with doing it through the agencies that was suggested? Well, I, actually, I favor uh, selling them through rec centers. I just suggested that because the, the rec centers are already set up to sell the, the leisure access pass, uh, you know, couldn't the same people be trained to, and they're also doing the documentation, you know, in terms of, of, uh, of what your income is and so on, and it's a single application process, couldn't they be trained to sell both? So I'm in favor of that, okay. And, okay. and I'm certainly also in favor of, uh, of, of you know, because the more places where, the more places where these, these passes can be obtained, the better. And so, so I'm going to jump on ways of doing it through uh, so some of the agencies, uh, that, that's a wonderful idea too. Karen, so what do you think about going through the agencies of, um, instead of putting the uh, young person in a position where they've got to go in and explain themselves and they really, you know, they're at an age that they really don't want to explain that they're poor, they don't, homeless, whatever. So what was suggested, I think that's not a bad idea. No, I absolutely agree with that. I think uh, by, by distributing it through agencies who in many cases already know these kids very well and their circumstances, um, we're treating them with um, some respect and dignity. We're making it easier for them to legitimately use um, services rather than take those chances and getting that $250 ticket and ending up in jail and all sorts of other problems that come with well, it. I guessing, think distribution will help a lot. I'm guessing that they just don't have one $250 ticket. They have a number of them because yeah. they're going to look guilty as the security is walking through. You know, it's body language, it's everything. It's dress, it's whatever. So I'm guessing that they have more than one. So, Ms. Rue, you, you brought up the fact of um, comparing H to lower income and things like that. It wasn't, you know, in my life in, uh, in politics, it doesn't seem that long ago, but it was probably 14 years ago that we really fought to get the H involved. So they had something. Back in the days when I was an MLA in the Northeast, a lot of families couldn't get downtown for um, um, doctor's appointments, dentist's appointments, and whatever. So can you explain yourself again on that, uh, what you brought up in your presentation? The way I understand your question is, is there a reason why we brought each up or is yeah. it? You're, you were seeming to be a more of a, a bit of a conflict to what John said and what you said in a matter of time. No, so. uh, what we just say is that we don't want to see that uh, the each program the cost is increased to subsidize or to implement the low income pass. So uh, if a low income pass is implemented, it should be at the same rate as each and not at a different rate. and if they amalgamate the two programs, don't increase the each rate uh, to the low-income pass rate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor or Mayor Iverson. Well, well, Councillor Henderson. Um, yeah, just to, just to, some of this ground's been covered, but uh, looking looking at a lot of the work we've been doing with, the, you know, because obviously we've been on the, the poverty poverty reduction or probably elimination piece uh, now for two or three years, and Mr. Coleman, I know you've been doing a lot of work on that, but. Um, right from the beginning, one of the things that we recognized was the transportation in terms of allowing people to improve their quality of life, get to work, get to support services, get decent food, all the kind of things that are really fundamental to helping people change and better their condition. Transportation is pretty key, correct? And is a major impediment to a lot of that happening right now. And it doesn't feel like it is to us, but 90 bucks or 100 bucks a month on an already overstretched, you know, where you're, you know, you know, I'm even looking at the single here, you know, at, 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 at 23,000 a year, that's 2,000 a month, of which probably 1,000, 1,200 is going into, into accommodation. You've got food, you've got, I mean, there's, 100 bucks begins to look pretty daunting at that point, correct? And that's, I think, what we need to understand. And, and these are people that are, these are people, you know, to be at that kind of income, you're probably working full time and trying to hold down a whole bunch of jobs and get to those jobs, and that's part of what we need to be able to recognize as we look at this, yes? Um, yes, uh, I agree. Uh, it's not just, you know, you can always look at, at any kind of cost in isolation and say, well, that's not too bad, but it's all of them together, as you point out. There's many other pressing um, expenditures. Uh, shelter probably being the biggest one, but, but food and, and, and certainly transportation you know, that $89, uh, the difference between $35 a month and, 
and $89 a month is, is very significant for, for a low income uh, and, Edmontonian. And when you're, you know, and again, when you're trying to keep, when you're, when you're already struggling trying to find accommodation to begin with, you're probably not close to the places where you're likely to be finding work. You're probably not closest to the places where you're likely to find decent food. You're probably not close to places where you're likely to find the other kind of things that will help health and all those other conditions that we know will create change, right? That, that's correct, yeah. So the real question, it seems to me right now is, I mean, we know that there's huge benefit in doing this. We know that if we really want to make a dent in this, I mean, right, everything that the poverty elimination work has said is we have to take care of the transportation question. The real question that I think is coming up here right now is whether or not uh, we're throwing up, whether or not how to get it to the people that are going to be most benefited by it. And I guess I think in part what I'm hearing is, what are the, you know, is it better to make sure we can get it to the people who actually need it and uh, recognizing there may be a small amount of people that don't need it that may fall through the cracks than actually create a system that makes it impossible for the people who do need it to be actually using it. And that's, I think, what I'm hearing. Ms. Good, that's essentially your point, right? Yes, yes absolutely. You know, that if we obsess too much about fraud, one, it's going to cost us a million bucks. We'll spend a million dollars worrying about fraud that could go in actually to doing the program. And, and, and are we actually helping ourselves at that point when if we're prepared for a little, to, to understand there may be a few fall through the cracks, there may be a way to make sure that the people that really need this are served. And that's got to be the, we, we need to be clear about who we're trying to serve here, right? That's probably where we need to start, yes? Absolutely. And, and I, I guess that's the other question I would have for all of you. I mean, obviously youth who are trying to get to school, who are trying to get to work, who are trying to get to, to try and make stuff happen and get out of the position they're in or one group that we're trying to serve, yes? That's, that's a given. And, and I guess the question, because this came up when we met a few months ago, whether or not the past is actually the answer to them or whether or not there's something, you know, whether or not uh, being able to help them with individual use is more useful. Um, I think either is a step in the right okay. direction. So whether it's single um, use or whether it's um, passes, I think either way, um, dealing with the transportation issue is, is a huge step towards eliminating poverty and starting to get people on the right track, regardless of age. And, and I think, Mr. Kogman, you know, again, understanding a lot of this is going to be mostly targeted towards working poor to people who are trying to, to, trying to get to that job, to get to that job interview, to, to, to make stuff work, and, and, and transportation may be an impediment to happen. That's the target we're probably after. But time is of essence to them, right? So that if you have to go through a huge, if you're having to take a day to try and figure out to get your, your pass every month, that's going to be a huge impediment for them as well, is it not? Y yes, uh, I agree. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's people, there's equity, making sure there's equity between people on Alberta Works Income Support with the people on, on AISH, uh, uh, given that many of them face the same barriers. And it is a lot about uh, sort of the, the working poor Edmontonians, or the, as I prefer to say, the low-income working Edmontonians, uh, and making sure that, that they are able to, you know, to have, have good access to the, uh, uh, Edmonton Transit System. The other, the other point I would make is, uh, again, I mentioned it about Donator Ride. I mean, it's, Donator Ride is a very good program, and, and I think uh, Council is to be commended for its leadership on that program. But I see it, uh, again, as a compliment. And if somebody just needs, a, you know, an individual ticket to, to get somewhere and, you know, and can get it from a social agency, that's great. But, but there's an, a, a whole other group of Edmontonians who I think for whom a monthly pass is a, is a, is a better option than just having to get you know, individual uh, uh, donate a ride tickets, simply because those can be hard to access too if you're not a, a regular uh, a client of the, the agencies that, you know, that distribute them. But I, again, I would encourage, uh, you know, the, the city not to see those as being, uh, uh, to see those as being complimentary. Yeah. Thank you. Mayor Iveson. So the, um, the uh, and I'm, I'm grateful to have uh, uh, both uh, Ms. Good and Ms. Basisti here to, to talk a little bit about this targeted issue of, uh, of uh, youth and poverty and homeless youth who are vulnerable youth. Um, and, and you estimated the number that are homeless as 250 to 500. Is that, is that the catchment or are you dealing with a larger group than that that, that would benefit from some concessions around transit? Do you want to go first? Sure. Um, 
uh, last year, yes, saw 500 individual youth. So um, we know that many youth won't define themselves as homeless. They'll say, I'm not homeless, I'm on his couch. Yeah. Um, so, so sometimes the trouble is in even identifying them. But in the homeless count that was done, it was 240 youth. And uh, in the community strategies count, it was 500. So we know we're somewhere in that ballpark. And that's, that's homeless at, any, at, at one point in time, but people fall into homelessness throughout the year. So, Ms. Basisti? Um, during the intake process, we usually ask people, actually we always ask people if they have been homeless in the past year or, um, and I would say probably 40% of the students that registered our school reported being homeless. And so I would say over the course of the year, because we have continuous intake, we probably register about 500 kids. So if you do the math, it's definitely underreported. Because I, I think it might be useful for us to think about accommodations for working with those youth and, and we're, uh, there's already some work happening around uh, after a motion that Councillor Sohi put forward to deal with this question of uh, uh, youth winding up on the wrong side of these bylaw infractions and the unintended consequences in the justice system for, for them and, and for all of us paying for remand center nights for God's sakes. I mean, we're putting our money in the wrong place, obviously. Um, um, how many nights in the remand center of savings could we, would it take to just get bus passes for these 500 kids, you know, and, and is creating a bunch of extra bureaucracy to, to, to administer 500 passes. I get that we have to figure out how to efficiently distribute the 20,000 for the working low income people that John's talking about. But for these youth, I wonder if there's uh, a different approach, again, working with your agencies to get, to get, um, concession passes uh, in the hands of these youths because they don't even have 50 bucks a lot of the time. I mean, they have nothing. Yeah, yep, definitely. There was talk about some of the university students in post-secondary donating their U passes. I don't know what's happened with that idea, but, you know, it's kind of a possibility. It's a really nice idea, but it, that then undermines the economics of the U pass, which is kind of a separate transaction. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a, a kind suggestion, but it doesn't, that just costs the city in a different way. So I think we, it's better to keep it transparent and, and to be able to follow the money. And the reason why is because we need to be able to go back around to the province and make the case that here's all the stuff we're doing because low income people are concentrated in the city of Edmonton, homeless and at risk people are concentrated in the city of Edmonton. And we happen to run a transit system which smaller communities don't. And we have this higher concentration. This is, this is one of the huge premises in our conversation with the province about the city charter is to substantiate the work that we have to do because these people come to the city, fall through the cracks, and wind up needing interventions to support their success, like low income or, or, or uh, heavily subsidized transit, to enable them to get back on their feet. So. And you're absolutely right about a lot of them not having any money at all. I mean, if they qualify for learner's benefits, which is through Alberta Works, it's $800 a month. That's all they get for everything and that doesn't include their bus pass, so that's, so, you know. I, I think, and, and this is something I think that the, the task force is struggling with too, is, uh, I mean, if, if there was, you know, six or eight million bucks to put somewhere, where's the best place to put it? Is, do you distribute it across 20,000 people evenly, or there are certain segments you might really want to target with not an open-ended permanent subsidy, but, you know, is, does it make sense for some of these passes to be given away free to individuals for a short period of time while they're being stabilized, while they're accessing services, while they're going to school, something like that, on the premise that at the end of that, they're going to be earning income and can buy a regular bus pass like everyone else. I don't know if you have any advice to us about that. I would love the, uh, the idea of giving bus passes to schools because a lot of the kids, it's, it's enough that they've even come to school. Like they may be the most stable person in their household and just that they're coming to school, you know, it's a big deal. So asking them to get a job on top of that is pretty challenging. So I just want to ask one other question to, to Mr. Colkman and Mr. Rue before I run out of time, which is on this question of the H discount versus the regular discount and 50% versus 60%, because H did go up quite significantly a few years ago. It's still very low, but the best practice according to the attachment in here is about 50% is the discount that other cities are offering. So just to avoid the potential conflict, I get that as political advice, but given that everyone else is doing about 50%, uh, and given the change in age, how would you react to that? <laughs> well, 
Well, first of all, uh, Calgary is now at about a 40, uh, see, I guess I'm making a 55% discount because they kept their, the last time they increased the regular monthly pass, they, they did keep their, uh, their uh, uh, low-income transit pass at the same $44 per month. Uh, I, well, I, I would like to think that the, the Edmonton would show a, a bit of leadership here. I, I personally think uh, if, if most cities are doing 45, you know, uh, 45 to, to 50 percent of a low-income transit pass. Why doesn't the city show a, a bit of leadership and uh, and and do it at, at 40 percent? And and I do. I, I concur with what's said here. I, I think you, you're going to you know uh, this this idea that you're going to you know some people have to pay more in order for others to pay less. Uh, it's going to go over rather badly, I think, with with uh, the disability community. And, and 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 I think in some ways it would be almost unfair also because it they didn't really see it coming right they 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 have the age pass i know there's some issues around uh, dats and so on <coughs> for people with severe uh, physical disabilities but but that's a separate issue right and and uh, so but i i i think i think it would be of surprise to them were you to um, increase the, the cost of their pass and i already outlined the reasons why i think there should be a single pass i just think having if there's an equity question and there's also just an administrative complexity question of having two different kinds of low-income transit passes so I guess in conclusion I, I think it should it should be priced at the same uh, as the age pass uh, you know based on, on a 60 percent admittedly that might mean that uh, the age pass would go up sometime if the regular adult monthly pass went up right so but I like the 60 percent discount idea I'm, I'm way out of time Thanks. thank you thank you though um, I have a couple so one of the things uh, and and of course, the mayor uh, brought up a couple nights in the remand and the cost of that. Those are not our costs, though. Those are the province's costs. Um, so, but, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm interested in this p potential unintended consequences here, it, it, starting with Donate a Ride, which is a, a program uh, based on philanthropy. People donate to that program. And uh, one of my concerns is that with this move, Donate a Ride will lose its reason to be. Comments? Um, well, it's, uh, it's certainly my understanding that uh, Calgary has both programs. I, I, in fact, I believe that uh, ETSAB had done a bit of research on that in the past, if I in, in the presentation they made last year, and one thing that's interesting about Calgary, though, is my, my uh, the the number of donator ride tickets was somewhat lower, uh, certainly per capita in Calgary, and 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 I think that that might reflect that there are some people out there who currently get the donator ride tickets who who actually can pay something, um, and and might be willing for added convenience and so on to pay thirty five dollars uh, per month. So so I think one of the things that the city I think we should keep both programs, but I think you'll be wanting the administration to measure the impact on the donator right program but so, I, I do think they are they're different right in in terms of uh, you know the donator right is more for the occasional you know you, you need to get to an appointment or something like that right uh, I guess it could also be expanded to 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 be purchasing low-income transit passes and donating those to agencies or something that's another possibility. Yeah, that might be another way to to approach that one as well yeah. another option to consider yes uh, uh, to uh, Ms. Basisti and, and, and Ms. Good, you, uh, <coughs> unintended consequence again. So you are, let's say we agree and you can distribute these passes, you do some sort of vetting, we ask you to do some sort of vetting. Well, there not, will not be pressure on then, on your organizations to do fundraising so that you're paying for those passes for the kids. And does that, will that add an extra burden onto you? Um, I, I guess the potential is there for us to have to do some additional fundraising. I see ourselves more as a distribution point um, for them to be able to easily purchase um, and for us to find support from individuals that are interested in getting kids from A to B. So there, there are some of those challenges and perhaps we'd have to raise more, but we're getting kind of used to that I, mantra of raising more. That kid could say, I don't have anything. I don't have any money. Yeah. I really need that pass. 
you know. Yeah, our youth workers are a really savvy bunch okay. um, and pretty professionally trained. And, and, uh, and, and it's not hard to see that kid that Brandy's talking about that really actually has absolutely nothing in their pocket. Yeah. 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 They're not too hard to peg. Any comments on whether or not we're going to sort of download some pressure onto you? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a group effort, right? Um, it might be good to look at how you source like the income for the donate a ride program and I agree I think both programs should kind of work side by side um, I guess the other thing I would say is that with the donate a ride program it's probably better if that goes towards like an agency where you're just stopping by like court or something like that just because the kids have to go to the agency first to get the ticket um, for us, we would probably appreciate getting some free bus passes from you guys, but we could probably um, approach members of the community to see if they want to sponsor certain kids, I guess. Okay, thank you. Anybody beyond the committee with questions? Councillor Esney, you're the only one remaining. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations. We'll ask you to step back. We'll bring administration forward for questions. Good to see you all. Um, we'll start. Councillor Gibbons. I'm going to start with the question of the rec centers. Um, when I first heard that there was, you were thinking about putting a ticket um, um, sales item in the Clareview, I questioned the location, but since thinking about the location, I'm thinking of, of that somebody's in there, more eyes on the uh, doors, the people coming in, and but it also gives it presence. If we're building a hub to for a community, why isn't a hub part of selling tickets? So is that part of your reasons behind doing that? I'll start, I'll start off, Councillor Gibbons. Uh, very much to have these facilities, the two rec centers that we're proposing in this, to be community hubs, as you say. Uh, the challenge we have in terms of the existing cashiers is that they are fully occupied in their in their current jobs. Uh, there may be some sort of misconception that all they're doing is doing admission fees, but those front counter staff are certainly fully occupied doing all a whole range of safety talks with customers as they come in to deal with the issues we had a couple of years ago, to do the age issues, to do the wristbanding, to do the sales, equipment rentals. There's a whole bunch of activities that those cashiers do that occupies their full day. The other issue we have on our existing front counters is, uh, is space. Um, the stations that we have are, are fully used on the recreation side. So that's why we're proposing a separate counter in these two facilities to be the transit um, desk, if you will, um, which we believe brings more eyes to the facility, makes some more, more reasons to be in the building and so on, which, is a, which we believe is a good thing. No, you answered all my questions on that. So, who do I ask, Mr. Stolte, um, on the fact of 60% subsidy, uh, both the H as well as the uh, low income, what's your thoughts? What kind of cost factor? If we went to Ocean uh, Program number three, benefits, what's the cost factor and something like that? Again, the key cost factor would be the loss of, uh, or, the, or the potential loss of uh, revenue that we would, would be looking at from uh, existing passengers moving from uh, regular transit fares to the low income pass fares. Um, that, again, the, the cost factors that we're looking at, if I can. Is it, that. I mean, is it really a, a dollar and cents? Because really, if you start thinking your security, it's got to be repeat offenders quite often it's got to be what we have to sending somebody the court system all in all doesn't that just wash out 
I don't believe it would wash out. Uh, there is a significant uh, revenue impact that is being uh, projected here in terms of the actual cost for uh, uh, dealing with the, or, or going to the courts. Uh, we don't have a figure available for that right now. Okay, so my next question to that, if it doesn't wash out, the fact is um, it's not necessarily a loss uh, factor to your department as such if we thought of different ways of funding this. Would you not suggest? It's not a negative cost to the department, no. There will be a negative cost to the tax base because we draw from the tax levy. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sohi. So, uh, you heard that from uh, the um, the agencies, and uh, and I also had some conversation with uh, uh, people who do provide services to uh, recent refugees who uh, who don't have any documentation, uh, and the issue of the uh, the temporary foreign workers. Uh, so. These are comp they are complicated issues to deal with, but we have to, because these are the people who would need access to public transportation, the, like anyone else living in uh, in, in low income and uh, in, in that uh, situation. So, any thoughts on um, uh, working with agencies that serve homeless youth, homeless population, also organizations like Mennonite Center or Catholic Social Services, another uh, immigrant uh, serving agencies and refugee serving agencies. Uh, um, Councillor, there's three areas that we've, that's been identified as we've heard from committee today. One is the youth, one is the refugees or, or new Canadians, and the other is low income. We've based this report on the low income as per the inquiry. So okay. we see three different streams here. If we move from, we're, we're working with the agencies is quite probable with the youth and the, and the immigrants, the new immigrants. We could see working with the agencies in that case, whereas the low income is a different stream and okay. the low income requires the documentation behind it. Yeah, even though the, the criteria for access i mean income based it, it it's this it's the same it's just how you how you implement it based on uh, the needs or uh, lack of documentation from different segments of the population there's i think there's two different avenues here is the low income would generally be a continuous program for an individual where you have newcomers to, to canada and the youth we anticipate that those people would move into the mainstream they'd be able to move up. So what I would see is this being a non-cost to the agencies that are giving these out and the limitations on the people who can use them. So it might take them six months and get into the workforce and starting to move along. Yeah, but if we were to go so once way. those people, for example, in the, in the case of homeless youth, it's gonna take many, many uh, efforts uh, and there are many other issues related to that. Uh, so, you know, with mental health, addiction, and all those. So it's going to take long t time for uh, them to be overcoming up uh, those challenges and uh, being, gain uh, being employed gainfully. And uh, with, the, with the recent immigrants and the refugee population may not take as long. So I think this has to be a flexibility in the, in the approach in order to make sure that nobody falls through the, through the crack because you want to be as comprehensive as possible. To, uh, uh, so this program is accessible. That's correct, but it, I guess we have to get clear indication from committee which one of those or two of those you'd like us to endeavor to move towards, because we certainly haven't identified the costs with association with the youth or the new immigrants. However, we know, do know who the agencies are. We do have task force in place in the city looking at the homeless people, looking at poverty along those lines. So. So the uh, on 60% discount, the cost of 8.5 million has not factored in uh, in the in the homeless youth population and uh, recent immigrant population. That's correct. It has not. No. Okay. It's a be a different program altogether. But that's my understanding that is based on the the census data, based on how many people are living in poverty, and that will include 
homeless youth that will include recent immigrants, that will include refugees. Yes, you're correct. I'm sorry, the way I took that was it, individual, it, individual, so I expect... Oh, yeah, I, I, I understand I the implementation aspect, but the yes. overall cost of uh, the program doesn't include those. Yes. Okay, all right. You got me nervous there for a bit, right? No, no I'm glad that it... You know, I, I thank you so much for your work. I think this is a, a long overdue, and uh, we're moving in the in the right direction. I, 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 on your you uh, on your business model, you have a cost recovery model. You would like to continue to recover the cost of uh, the system through uh, uh, collecting fares, and you want to maintain that. So, any any loss of revenue for ETS as you suggest, should be coming out of the main tax levy, not uh, out of your system, right? Yes, that's correct. As all discounts yeah. come out that we have right now, yeah. we have multitudes of discounts that are, are come off the tax levy. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Iveson. Well, I, I think uh, there's the question of mobility for uh, people in working poverty, people who are trying to get upskilled, people who are uh, have some capacity to go through these exercises, can produce documentation, so on and so forth. That's 19 out of the 20,000 people that we're talking about here. The same folks who are able to navigate our, the same kinds of folks, I guess, that, that are able to navigate our um, uh, leisure access pass program, which this is this borrows from heavily, right? So then there's this last maybe 1,000, and maybe it's 10,000, but for purposes of this program, there's you know, if there's 500 uh, uh, youth at risk who are driving a lot of um, peace officer time, costing us a bunch of uh, court time from our law department and ultimately costing the province money through court time and through remand time, then, you know, there may be a separate question here, and this is maybe something the task force should grapple with, which is that if we need 500 bus passes for these kids, and they're a thousand bucks a pop for the year, or six thousand monthly passes, five hundred times twelve. You know, it's six hundred thousand bucks of lost revenue. Assuming they're all paying today, which they're not, because we're sending them to jail because they're not paying. So we're not losing any money here. I mean, there is no real opportunity cost, and they're either on the system today because and and not paying, uh, or using donator ride tickets, or um, or not paying and getting caught or not paying and not getting caught. So, or not getting on the system because they're banned from it because, and then not able to get the service and so on. So I think, I think we should maybe compartmentalize that. I think this is something I'm thinking we should take back to the task force to think about whether there's a, a distinct program there that we could put together for those kids um, that would help deal with some of these issues. Um, and then we can stay focused here on the, the folks who have the capacity to deal with the paperwork. Um, and who can produce the documentation? So, so that's that's a that's a starting thought. The as to this question of of the rec center, if we set up sales points at the rec centers, which are high traffic areas, do you think that I mean you would not only administer the low income bus pass program, you would also vend the normal fare products as well there, yes, and provide right. provide uh, schedules and other customer service. Yes. Do you think that is there any likelihood that that will increase revenue or decrease the cost of distributing through third parties some of our fare products or or I mean is there any revenue recovery from that any incremental advantage to it we haven't identified point? a revenue recovery it does make it more convenient for uh, for people who use the rec centers to buy their transit products but and it you don't have a third party the handling best. cost for for the third party vendors as well if we're delivering more directly. So I think that's something we should look at as part of implementation, maybe an offset here. I think the other question though is that yes, the front counter staff, uh, to Mr. Smythe's point, are, are fully occupied, I, I get that. But is it the front counter staff who, who manage the, the leisure access program paperwork or did they go into a, a side room to have that handled? Uh, the, the intake function yeah. is, is done basically downtown in CN Tower here. We have a small unit that does all that intake process, so they deal with the all the all the customers, if you will, access. and and lo lots of those that intake process is just, is done through the mail. But there certainly is a front counter option as well. 
See, I, I think there's got to be a one city opportunity around this that CLT should really think about. Um, and I think this is a theme in the, in, in the poverty task force too, is that that's a touch point with a person who has uh, identified themselves as being low income. And that's an opportunity to not only give them leisure access to rec centers and potentially through this give them access to transit, but also say, by the way, would you like a library card? That's now free. By the way, can we refer you to services? And that should be done by a social worker and not by a clerk. Mayor Iverson, the, the, the intake process that's in the, in the documentation is, is quite integrated. So the uh, applicants would come and, and, and apply basically for their leisure access pass, and then that, that would then give them the, um, the evidence, if you will, Automatic eligibility. to... Uh, to go in and apply for the transit, the transit pass. So that, that and, it is. And I see that between the lines here. I think we can go further with it. I think we can, like I said, take that as a touch point with, with Edmontonians who were, we would maybe be able to bring other services as well in partnership with agencies and partnerships with the province. So that's that an integration question that we're looking at at the task force too. So yes. as long as you're open to that. And I guess my only other question, that, well, actually I got a bunch of other questions, but, but what I'd like to understand is how, um, the uh, when we implement a smart fare system, does that assist with the the rollout and logistics and costs of this in any way? In your view, in our view, yes, it can. Uh, the smart fare system would be an account-based system, so the uh, the the information uh, related to uh, or whether whether there is eligibility would go into the individual's account that's access or using a smart fare system or a smart card. That's what I was hoping you'd say. Good answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Henderson. Well, just, um, just to be clear, because I, I have to confess to having some frustration in the fact that we've got a, a $1 million bill a year to provide this program and a, and a $1 million one-time cost, no matter what we do. So the, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we go with only the 35% discount, most of the money we're giving back will go to set up the program and to administer it. Right? Well, actually, you know, the, the, the revenue loss is actually, you know, at least for the first three or four years, would actually be less than the cost of administering it. Well, I've, it's, it, it's a million, it's a million it, it bucks a year. It depends on your perspective here. In, in all cases, in all three of these scenarios, there is a revenue loss and there is the one-time cost yeah. to set it up. But, but, so the on, but the ongoing costs and the one-time costs are identical no matter what the discount is. That's what this is showing. Come. So, right? Mr. Henderson, yes. uh, one, one thing you might want to keep in mind is that um, this won't go from zero to full uptake in one, in one cycle. So we, we believe that there will be an uptake and that some of the, some of the associated yeah, costs... No, but my point is, costs. if we're going to do this, it's absurd to do it if most of what we're doing to subsidize it is going to the, going to the administration of it, right? If the real revenue loss is going to the administration, I, you know, it, just in terms of this question of whether we go 35%, 50%, or 60%, we will get the best value, ironically, for the investment that we put into administering the program and setting up the program. We will get the best value for that if we go for the highest discount. The actual cost per discount will be way lower because it's identical. To met, it, you, you know, the administrative costs are identical to us no matter what the discount is. Yes, Councilor, you're correct. Yeah, okay. So I think that's something we need to keep in mind. And I guess I'm a little bit puzzled about how this, you know, why that this is so complicated. Because we're doing, we're, it's a once a year thing for someone to go in and, and get themselves. Now, in the case of an, of an access card, it's not a monthly thing. They're getting a one-year pass, right? That's correct. But there is probably a piece of paper that they have to carry around or a card that they have to carry around that says, I qualify, right? That was the original idea of that program. That's correct. They get their pass right. with their picture on it, and that gets them full access to all city rec right. facilities for the year. So I don't, what I don't understand is we, we do multiple products right now when we sell our bus passes. We're not charging one. You know, we have a youth price. We have a, so all of our vendors are already dealing with the multiplicity of prices, Correct. So why would someone not coming in with a, with a leisure access card not be able to be dealt with by any vendor we currently have and just charge a different price? I don't get why it's so hard. Uh, we'd have to take a closer look at that, but certainly now what we're doing is putting the onus, uh, onus on the private vendor to... Uh, to check a card. We ask them to do it program. for youth, do we not? Do they not check how old they are? 
Presumably, they're already doing that. No, actually, uh, in, in fact, a parent can come in and buy the youth pass at, at an outlet for, for their sons or daughters. All right. So, because I think this comes back to the question. I mean, it, it re, you know, adding a million dollars to this to deal with a fraud problem that probably is more easily dealt with for the few people that are going to get through the system that choose to gain the system, I just wonder what we're doing. You know, I mean, I, I think we need to have, a, and, I, and I think the other thing we do need to look at, and, I, and granted, is, is a really hard look at who we're trying to serve with this so that we understand and make sure that we're making it easier for us to get it. Because if we make it, you know, if, if, if we make this so complicated, then we're not going to be getting to the people that in some way need it the most. And I, and I really would like to make sure that we're having a good hard look at that. I think ease of use of this, understanding you have to jump through that hoop once a year, but we're doing that already. Um, and, I, and I don't understand why we would make it complicated once we, once we have said you guys qualify to, to be able to then go in and get a different price on the bus pass anywhere we're selling a bus pass. Councillor, the other point just to, just to mention is the uh, LEP card that are issued to th these customers. Um, don't identify them as low income. They're the same card you or I would buy on an annual basis. But we could change that. I mean, I mean there is, or, or we could give them a second card at the same time if they wanted it, right? I mean, I... I mean, I, and I understand that, that there's, there's a down, but I, I think if I was given the choice of whether or not I had to go to an obscure place to get my pass once a month, or whether or not I had a card that said I get a different price, I know it's not great to say I have a card that get a different price, but I'm wondering if we actually gave people a choice about that, which one they would prefer. You, you know, I mean, I, um, and I think probably ease of service would be the one that they would opt for. I'm pretty sure it would be. Absolutely, no matter what our customers who our customers are, we always want to give them the ease of service. Just going back to the outlet distribution, somebody comes in with a, with a card and says, I want a pass, they get a pass. It doesn't show that it's anything about low income. So there's no checks and balances as they do with youth. Somebody as a youth, the drivers can challenge it. In this case, nobody can get challenged. There's no way of verifying how the, how the outlets distribute it. Well, and I just it's really quickly, I think I'd like to know if we would lose more by doing that than the million dollars it would cost to do it the other way. And I think we need to do a cost. I think we need to do a cost risk analysis on that. Thank you. I would venture to say that you're required to do a proper audit of it to be able to manage it, and so we'd have to look at it that way. Councillor Esslinger. Thank you very much, and many of my comments were uh, shared already by Councillor Henderson. <laughs> but for me, the idea is if we had a, a pass that they can get uh, our card, they could get uh, their bus pass anywhere, it's about dignity. They're not special that have to go to a certain spot in a certain location. Let's make it easy for them. I'm very concerned as well about the cost of the program. Do we have online purchasing available already for everybody else on for bus passes? Yes, there is online uh, purchasing available, and we uh, we would uh, include this as part of the program. Now, just uh, just to expand a little bit, if uh, a person who is registered for the program uh, wants to purchase a pass through our outlets or through the online stores, we would have a record uh, that they are eligible. That would not be available to each one of the. Uh, the, the sales outlets throughout the city if, if we did it through our general sales outlets. Um, I guess I had a hard time understanding why it would cost so much more and the additional cost to software development we're already doing that for everyone else. Well, um, in, in terms of the additional costs, one of the things that we did with this and taking a look at uh, this issue is we did lean heavily on the, on the experience that they have in Calgary in terms of uh, the number of outlets that they have, the number of staff that they have, and based a lot of our assumptions uh, based on a program that's been in place for a number of years. So our cost estimates have been built up using that sort of as a benchmark. Thank you. I mean, if I'm going to spend a million dollars a year, I'd probably want to give a million dollars away and get that many people on the transit. Um, my other question is, I know we heard a lot today about youth homelessness, that they don't have... Um, addresses, but uh, when I was talking to Grand Prairie, who is just starting the low-income pass, a large number of their folks also don't have fixed addresses. And I think using the agencies that know who those folks are, whether they're youth or an adult, it makes most sense to get it 
quickly to the people that need it. So I was just curious, have uh, you explored this agency idea at all that was suggested today? No, we weren't. It wasn't part of the scope of this report. However, from the discussions here today, we certainly will work with the mayor on the task force and bring that forward to have further discussion. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, yeah, obviously on board with the 60% all that fun stuff. So the only question I want to ask, walk me through right now, somebody comes in, needs to get an H pass, right? Because you have a, a pass for somebody that's on H. What's the current process? What's the timeline? So they walk in, they approach the counter, and it takes X minutes to follow. Uh, Mr. Davidson to respond. Sure. Similar to other fair programs, they, they qualify uh, once per year. In the case of AISH, actually, it lasts much longer than, than once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when they come to our, our city hall, uh, customer services center, our uh, clerks look them up, they're on the system, they're, they're sold to pass. So it's just like any other transaction once they call. So walk me through the qualification piece. How long does that process take? I'm just trying, because again, that's what I'm trying to understand on the cost side. I feel like if you've got a process that already exists to qualify people on H, I'm not sure why we're spending a large sum of money to qualify people on a program that would be identical to H. So that's, I'm, that's the part I'm just grappling with here. So I'm just trying to understand how long does it take from somebody walking in on H to get their pass? The H uh, application process itself uh, is not much different than the LAP application process. It's like say once a year. It may take a few days to actually go through the paperwork and set them up and, and, and qualify them for the system. The issue is, is having access to that database to verify that the individual walking up to the counter sales is the eligible individual. And so there needs to be a lookup function. <laughs> and so we did look at at expanding the H database as one alternative in terms of making modifications to it to accommodate, say, the household income. So the one thing we don't have in the H database, it's an individual-based system. But we're talking about qualifying households, low-income households, and there may be five or six or seven individuals that are all linked together, right? And so it's not necessarily the kid that's going to be coming in as part of the family. It may be the parents. So we've got to have some minor changes into the database that allows us to do that lookup. Okay. So again, just all, all I'm trying to figure out is time, how, long, how much staff time is going into qualifying them, getting them from the point of entry to on the database? Because that, that's the, the, a lot of the request for staffing is, is oh, we need more time to process. So I'm trying to figure out how many minutes or hours take, are we processing somebody on H? So we have two full-time staff members dealing with uh, H personnel, but it's not just the application processing that they do. They deal with all the concerns that are raised in terms of, because we have an automated debit withdrawal process for them as well, which you know, presents some issues on, on a month-by-month -month basis. I think it's important to distinguish between, there's two, two processes going on here that we, we propose, and there's the application process itself, yeah. which is done once per year. The cost that I think uh, contribute mostly to the program is the ongoing sales of a monthly pass, which enable you know which means you're you're selling and returning passes every month. That's where the costs reside, and the bulk of the costs are having to do with staffing, and that's where that almost million dollar comes from. It's the bulk up for staffing to accommodate the two extra locations at both Millwoods and Clairview. I see. Okay. Um, and right now, so again, if somebody wants to do this, the only spot they can come to is down here at City Hall, correct? So this would give now three options in the City of Edmonton versus one. That's correct. And I mean, is there a plan, I mean, because it, to me, as the mayor was talking about, it makes sense to get this out to more locations than the one, under the one city piece. Has there ever been conversation about, you know, libraries and, and different things, not just the low income, but just transit, making sure we offer this service, making it available to people? So. For purchasing and with uh, with the administration of the sales of programs there are some administrative requirements uh, staff in a number of these facilities are already as uh, mr. Smythe men mentioned early are already uh, fully utilized in terms of their time uh, the sales of, of 
monthly passes or transit fares can be extremely, um, uh, or there, there's certain peaks uh, at the end of the month, for example, where it will get extremely busy and definitely you have, uh, we would have to staff up for that. Should also be pointed out uh, with respect to AISH, we're dealing with uh, registration of 5,000 uh, AISH uh, uh, pe people that are eligible for that pass. We're looking with this program, our projections are over 20,000, so the volumes are significantly higher than we're dealing with the AISH now. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nack. Councillor Loken. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the question posed of whether or not this would affect donator right, I think it'd be difficult at this point to gauge that given we don't really have any criteria at this point. Yes, True. that's correct. Um, one way it might actually help though is we are the need of donator ride tickets for agencies that are given out every year far exceeds far exceeds uh, what we're actually able to give each agency agencies um, most agencies if not all rarely receive a full complement because we just even with the success of the program we still don't have enough tickets to keep up with the need would you agree with that Yes, I do. So, in a sense, this actually might help depending on how we, we roll it out. Exactly, depending on how we, if the district, if we use the, the donate, just at a cursory look, if we use the donate ride program structure, we might be able to deal with the agencies in that context with whatever design of a program we come up with. And I completely agree with the comments regarding the $250 fines actually at our donator ride launch uh, our wrap up we had a young man to give a testimonial about what the, what the difference uh, donator ride tickets have made in his life and unfortunately though it's not enough um, and he's received he received I think 10, 10 $250 fines he said so it's something we need to look at it's just not working and it's uh, it's absurd to continue to, to do something that's only costing us money at the other end all the time. So, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just, uh, with, I'll have a couple here too. So, we have several streams of getting at this. One of them, we heard the agencies uh, dealing with youth uh, would like to be able to take uh, some responsibility, uh, help us out with, with the vetting. Um, AISH is another stream. And then the leisure access program is yet another one. And Mr. Smythe, um, so and just kind of following up on Councillor Henderson's questions, would it not be possible to have a pass that was uh, identified in a, in, a, in a way that the average person wouldn't know the difference, and yet that person could take it to to a uh, to a uh, transit. Uh, ticket facility and be identified as someone that would qualify for a low income transit pass. Is there not some subtle way we could do this? I'm just trying to find some simplicity, simplicity to the system here that would help out. To be able to use all the outlets that transit currently sells all their products. Right. At. You know, we didn't explore that. Um, yeah, we thought it was best in terms of being able to provide the data of all the LAP users to the transit counter, if you will, then they can verify on that list that, that the person's in the system, basically, and then issue their monthly uh, transit pass. But it's certainly something we can look at. Yeah, no, I just, it, you'll know more about the simplicity from your side than I, than I do, but it would seem to me, if we're doing the vetting anyways, that their le the leisure pass they get then has, and again, something very subtle. So that we're not we're not you know adding uh, any any um, any issues of it's certainly the dignity piece. What, what was the overarching um, principle, if you will, when we launched the leisure access program, in terms of you know no difference between a regular user or a, a low income user, you know they they all come with this, on this level playing field, so to speak. So, but this is something if there is a subtle way to do that, as you indicate. Well, it's 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 one way because you're doing some vetting. Right to get to to be able to give a low uh, in, uh, income leisure pass. Essentially, you're doing some vetting there, and what we then would be able to say to them, and now you can use this pass to get a low income uh, transit pass or transit tickets. How would we figure this out? It would just seem to me to have an approach where we could simplify this 
for people and there's vetting done once. Not having to maybe set up other counters at a cost, hire other people that in fact we would then have a leisure access pass that would be, would be um, able to, any of the vendors for, for uh, transit passes could use that. Councillor, um, one of the things that I just discussed with Mr. Krapeski is that when we go to the smart card system and we're pursuing that ahead, is that these people could get registered on the smart card system. They would be able to purchase the cards online or, be, or pick them up at a certain location with a swipe. That takes away all that other interaction and keeps their privacy and the confidentiality around it. So that's, you know, two, three years out and we'll be there. Agreed, but that's two to three years out. I'm just wondering if there's a way to simplify this now. Um, those are my questions. Anyone else? Committee's wishes? Yes, Mayor Addison. Um, if it was the recommendation of the committee to, to move ahead with preparing uh, the pilot, uh, would it be useful to get the price point direction on the price point today as part of that to understand um, the order of magnitude? If we do, we could do three service packages or we just do one with the direction from committee. Okay. Well, and council can always amend it uh, as it sees fit when it gets to budget and it's ultimately a budget decision this fall. And we can put that, we can put the alternatives in the narratives of the budget. In the description now the other the other question though was um, it, you said it would take a year to to bring this online September of next year with budget approval you'd, this you'd year. aim for the fall so yes that's correct so in a service package there might be an ongoing expense plus if there are some one-time startup costs that could be handled in the annualization component as part of it yes that's correct so we don't need to spend money this year to get to still get to September next year we can you're working within resources to scope it right now, and then if we have to actually spend some hard costs on software or anything else, that, that can happen in 2016. Yes, we'd have the, the, the detail, we'd go into the detail plan based on what committee gives us here in turn. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I am, I think, prepared to put a motion out there that may stimulate a little bit more discussion to help narrow our options here. So. Uh, and uh, I'll give, can you pass that to the clerks so that they can type it up, but I'll read it out and it would be that administration one, continue uh, work towards a low income transit pass pilot with the initial discount set at 60%. Um, and I'll tell you why I winced in a minute. Um, two, uh, and two, reconsider the sales and distribution model, including options to better leverage existing resources and or a more robust business case for increasing counter sales and report back Q3 2015. So we'd get another look at this, uh, a chance based on the feedback from today. So just to speak to it a little bit, we'd uh, get a chance to think about the smart card piece and whether, you know, if it's really one year of counter sales until this all gets uh, much more easily automated, uh, then, you know, how much do we want to spend on bricks and mortar and hiring permanent positions? Um, uh, so I think we should look at that. I think we should um, uh, look at whether there are other distribution points, look at whether the, the eligibility card is one way to deal with this, if that's sufficient, uh, if, if enough security can be put around that, that any vendor can do it. But if there are real problems with that, I think we just need to drill down a little bit more into that get clarity on that before we, because um, uh, I'm hearing hesitation and I share the hesitation around some of the fixed costs and uh, the operating costs. This will have an administrative requirement to it. I don't want to suggest that we can, that we can uh, shoehorn this into everything that we're already doing, but I think we should really refine those a little bit and, and talk about that part further. And uh, I guess I'll just ask quickly, is Q3 reasonable to, to get that back so that yes, we can feed into budget? Okay, that gives you a few months to do that work over the summer. And then on the question of the 60%, I, uh, um, it, you know, it's the distance between four and eight million dollars, give or take, uh, on this. And, and uh, you know, if we don't ask other uh, pass holders to contribute that, it is 
taxpayers, it is property taxpayers picking that up. And it's just one more example of what, what property taxpayers are having to do to deal with um, the cost of being a service centre with this concentration of high need individuals. And I think that that's, it probably should be 60%. It's just that, like everything else that we have to do, when it comes back to the property taxpayer alone, uh, it's very frustrating. But there is, there is a very good argument in, in uh, page uh, 7 of this package that talks about how with Edmonton and Calgary implementing very similar programs, uh, us moving in this direction concretely, our case to the province for some special consideration here as part of the city charter, I think gets stronger. So this can be a case study of, uh, of, of a real justification for some support for the province. And so why I used the word initial discount set at 60% is I think for the pilot that's what we should set it at as, as a matter of leadership but I'm not sure we can guarantee that we can maintain that if we get no support from the province and that, that, that uh, for the pilot that we would start at that and then if we get support and we can maintain it open-endedly at that, that would be good but that I might leave the option open for us to reduce that if we get no support from the province for this program. So that's how I would position this but I think uh, Mr. Colkman's points about leadership are well taken and, uh, and Mr. Roos points about uh, consistency with AISH are well taken. Uh, uh, and then if we have to revisit those, it would be because we continue to not get the support that we need from the provincial government for programs like this for vulnerable Albertans who happen to be clustered overwhelmingly in the cities of Edmonton and Calgary. So that's how I would put the charter hook on this motion. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's my rationale for, for doing this. But overall, I think this is an integral part of, uh, of a city poverty reduction strategy uh, in turn uh, which supports a provincial poverty reduction strategy by enhancing mobility for low-income Edmontonians to be able to get to services that will help them increase their capacity to get them to jobs that will get them the income they need uh, to be more successful and to help their families access services and amenities in the city so that they can have a more rich uh, quality of life in the city of Edmonton because it's not all about money it's also about being able to fully participate in community life and transportation in a city as busy as this one is absolutely fundamental to that so that's why I'm happy to put this forward in these terms. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor, just to clarify as we're working motion, was it your intent to, uh, to clarify the, the uh, pilot be funded through property tax levy as part of your... As, as opposed to going back to the pass, the pass holders? Or silent on it. Uh, I guess that option would always be there for council to determine, but I, I think it would be a, a levy draw rather than a... Um, that's, that's my assumption. We, we just want to capture... It's a public good. It's not, it's not necessarily something that should be cross-subsidized by the other riders, not through their fares anyway. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gibbons. So, Mr. Mayor, I totally agree with this, but I think it has to be clarified um, on, the, on the fact that uh, the explanation of it doesn't start until September of 2016. So... Can I get an answer so the, for the public and sort of for myself as well? I, you know, we've got a September right. date coming back to us. We've got the budget coming and we've got smart card coming and whatever. Can you explain to the public the timing? Because some of this is a lifetime in some kids' age group. Well, you know, we, it could, that's a long time away. You're losing a complete generation of, in some cases. When we looked at the budget cycle, it would take us up till the end of December till it's approved you give us time to set up the program get people registered say if we're if we depending on the distribution um, if we have to put up infrastructure vaulting things like that and staffing updates um, that's the challenge that we have with that would take us till September because we want to do it right the first time you know we don't want people showing up and not being able to put through the applications being able to work it through with with recreation as well it's well, a good partnership. I'm There's going to push you on that date when it comes back in September. So I hope you have some better answers than that because it's a, it, it, it's not a, it's not a cut and dry. Oh, it's down there. It's matter of fact of what it should have been before. So and I and I really believe that it's a tax levy item. It's not anything else. You can't take from Peter to pay Paul. It's really all the, all the citizens of Edmonton have to come to the table. Thank you. Maybe Thank you. maybe just if I can interpret that as a question. Maybe if we put continue to develop a low-income uh, transit pass pilot 
for 2016 implementation and then you can bring us the timelines if we can go a little faster that's good but you know September is kind of the opening but we're clear that we're not talking about doing this a few years from now we're talking about doing it next year subject to budget approval and subject to the implementation details being worked out thank you councillor Henderson well just quickly to add uh, for the reasons why I think the 60 percent is right I and and one of the uh, I, I think lining this up with AISH makes sense. I think coming up with two different pieces to the puzzle doesn't make any sense, and I think uh, having one. I, I would add, though, that I think what's interesting about that question is that in the case of AISH, um, it's about allowing everybody in the city to be able to enjoy a quality of life and giving them access to transit, despite the fact that probably they're permanently going to have those, those limitations on, on income was something that was really important. I think the point to understand about this, though, that moves beyond that, is that there's an element of investment in this as well, because in actually going and helping people that are in those low-paying jobs, that are, that are new immigrants, that are, that are trying to get themselves going in this city, this becomes a mechanism to let them move above LICO and get themselves off this program. And, and I think that's a really important thing to understand about what we're doing here. And part of the whole point of this is this is about trying to create and help people move into a situation where actually they do not need these kind of programs anymore. And, uh, and that's, there's an element of investment on this that will come back to us, that will bring benefit back to us. And I think that's something we need to remember in all of this work is the objective is not to keep people here. The objective is to give them the tools to get to the point where they don't need this anymore. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, very, very supportive of this motion. I wanted to echo Councillor Gibbons' comments. I, I guess, Mr. Wanzer, you made the point that, you know, this isn't going to be 20,000 people showing up on day one. Um, and, you know, we've already got interested partners willing to start working. So, I mean, I, I don't see why we couldn't start rolling pending budget approval, <laughs> that we couldn't start rolling this out right away. I think they're ready to get to work, and if we could start doing some of this, even on an early stage in January, why not? So I uh, just want to echo Councillor Gibbons' comments there. Um, maybe to the mover, and, and this would be just the, the question. I know we love to do pilots in the city of Edmonton. Um, this, we probably won't, you know, eliminate poverty in one year. <laughs> and, I, and I mean, we're going to keep track of this regardless. I, I know they're going to follow and, and track the statistics. Is there a need to really call this a pilot? I mean, I just, I know that's the report. We called it a pilot, but this really seems to be something that's going to have to be ongoing. I like the comment of the initial discount still. That might need to change, but I think the program is going to need to continue and yeah it's a fair point I mean I think the to, to be really frank about the politics of it Calgary did it as a pilot because they wanted the province to chip in and that didn't happen and uh, um, I think once you do something like this it is pretty hard to back out of it I mean uh, um, uh, you need a pretty it would have to go administratively very wrong as opposed to because it, it is going to make a difference in the lives of tens of thousands of Edmontonians and then taking it away you know the difference between an age discount of 50 and 60 already is hard to take away for that for that group of people so as we've heard so uh, I, my, so maybe you have a you, ha you have a point and maybe if we can if we can set our um, our uh, last line of defense around this question of the, the the discount level that we're prepared to sustain over time that's being being what would be at issue that we would do a program but that we couldn't guarantee that it would be this uh, um, generous over time from the property taxpayer then and, that and might be a better way you, of doing just, it yeah I just um, I wanted to throw that out as a suggestion because I think we're going to continue this you're going to yeah, track it you know what honestly counselor it's a very good point I think it's a friendly suggestion let's not uh, Let's not mince words. I think it's friendly. We should take the word pilot out of there. If we're going to do this, let's do it. Let's show some leadership. Then I'm even more supportive of the motion. Uh, thank you for that. We uh, do not encourage applause or booing or heckling or any of that, but thank you. Uh, Councillor Knack, you're done. Councillor Sohi. Oh, first of all, I want to thank the uh, committee for making this uh, first item on the agenda so I could participate in this discussion. I have an AMA meeting uh, to go to uh, after this. Uh, you know, Edmonton is absolutely a wonderful place to live. Uh, but the reality is that for some people, 
poverty is a hard reality and homelessness is a hard reality. If we really truly want to build a socially inclusive community, we need to deal with those social issues. And uh, public transportation and access to public transportation is a component of uh, many other things that need, we, we need to do in order to lift people out of poverty and, uh, and, and make them feel part of the community and fully participate in, the, uh, in all aspects of, uh, of community life. So I think this is a big step in the, in the right direction and I, I, I am fully supportive of it and I really appreciate the, uh, the leadership of the committee on, uh, on this. Uh, let's move forward. Thank you, Councillor Sohi. I see no one else. I will just briefly add that I am in, uh, fully supportive of this and, and uh, committee members and others have been particularly eloquent on this, so I won't go on, except to say that uh, as a police commissioner and having some recent experience with uh, an indication of the level of poverty that some Edmontonians are living in and wanting all Edmontonians to have a look behind that curtain. Most of us don't have to look behind in our, in our comfortable lives, but seeing that for myself, um, I think that if everybody knew and experienced uh, the poverty that some Abitonians are experiencing in their daily lives, that we would get 100% support for an issue like this. So I, I am fully supportive and, and uh, thank everybody for the contributions today. Uh, I see that Mayor Iveson uh, would like to say something. To close, if I, if yes, I can, really absolutely. briefly, I just want to add that, of course, this will uh, come back to budget. This is subject to final decision by Edmonton City Council uh, as a whole this fall. But uh, point two will give us, uh, hopefully, uh, some different approaches because uh, I think administration has taken, and I understand why, uh, I think uh, a, a traditional approach to thinking about how we might distribute this, these passes. And I, I, I think that not only uh, should we take a second look about whether there are some other things we can leverage or whether there are partnerships, particularly with agencies, for, for some very targeted populations of this that we can explore um, uh, for getting these passes into the hands of people who really need them. But I also think that, uh, as, as I was suggesting earlier, there are some opportunities to look at this as a touch point for, for uh, vulnerable Edmontonians, Edmontonians uh, with low income to bring them other services and that we should think about that a little bit more. And that really requires a, a, a corporate leadership team discussion. Uh, and so I would encourage that to occur as part of the work uh, for number two. And that that may actually be something that, that strengthens you know, all of the different units of the city, including transit and their interactions with vulnerable Edmontonians. So I, I hope that there's time to do that. Um, I, uh, as I, I won't go on and belabor the point about the charter, but this is again one example where Edmonton property taxpayers, all other things being equal in their generosity are supporting uh, vulnerable people from all across northern Alberta who cluster in our city to access services and who when they fall through the cracks become an expense for us and in turn again an expense for the province and that cycle needs to be broken that's why we're doing this work on with a vision to end poverty and this is an essential part of the work and so I'm glad to have council support for this uh, or committee support to move ahead with this and then the last item, we've learned a lot as I was uh, vocally supportive of increasing the fines and I still think $250 fine is what you need to get the attention of everyday Edmontonians who are lackadaisical about remembering their bus pass or remembering to validate their ticket, but I am heartbroken by the consequences of, the, of that decision and what it's meant for young people who shared their story with me about the disruption that's caused to their lives and I really hope that we can remedy that in short order. So I know that there's parallel work happening on that and that the, this is only a piece of it but uh, I really do think that there's an opportunity to write uh, an unintended consequence of taking a hard line on, uh, on fare evasion on our system there as it's, as it's created uh, a lot of heartache for for some vulnerable people in our community. And so this is a piece of, uh, of uh, preventing that from happening in the future as well, so. Thank you, Mayor Iveson. And I will call the question on the motion before us. All in favor, that is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
What's that? Yeah. Um, might be a little turbulence here. Um, 6.9 is next. Huh. Smooth, smooth sailing. You ready? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Excellent, thank you. Good. Go ahead. Uh, we had no presentation. So you're just here for questions. We're here for questions. Oh, and we do have a speaker, don't we? Uh, so we'll ask you to step back. In fact, we have to add a speaker on. Do we have a speaker on 6.9? Yeah. Yes, we do. Right. Mr. Robertson, good morning. Morning. Uh, I just want to clarify, I'm not actually speaking on behalf of the Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board. I'm speaking as a almost retired a member of the Edmonton Transit System Advisory Board. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, this has been a long road for us getting to this, the position that there's actually a bylaw before you gentlemen. And um, you know, at times it dominated our agenda far too much. And uh, I just wanted to say, please with haste, uh, give us a new bylaw so that our current and future members can get on with dealing with issues that they really want to deal with, transit related issues. Uh, issues like the low income transit pass that you guys have just uh, moved forward. Um, but I'd also just like to thank uh, Vicki Gunderson for being patient with us and helping us and uh, especially uh, Ann Kaplan who um, it's amazing how one person can actually remove a, a roadblock and we had a meeting with Ann it's got to be probably 18 months ago where all of a sudden it was just like almost this process of going round and round and round and round in a circle something I'm sure you guys can all understand. And that one person in the room and the roadblock disappeared. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none? Oh. Let me just say thanks for your service on the committee, Mr. Robinson. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, we will ask you to step back up, please. No, I'll move the recommendation. I got oh. no questions. Okay. Good work. Unless there's issues. Questions? Well, thank, yes. You, well, the, well, it's not. It's not often that the thanks comes from the citizens to the administration. So, uh, I'll just echo it. Well done to get to this point. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to call the question. All in favor? That is carried. See? Thank you very much. And we're carrying on. And we're now six point three. Are we? Uh, yes. And yeah. Mayor Iveson, would you uh, oh, yes. add a speaker for this? Please? Yeah, I will move that uh, we hear from Dennis Fitzgerald on item 6.3. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will call the question on that. All in favor? Thank you very much. Uh, so we have. Good morning. morning. We have. There, I'm sorry. Is there a presentation on this? One? Mr. Mr. Chairman, could uh, I just within a discussion with my other uh, uh, constituent running a business, Matt Alltime, if he could be out of 6.3 as well instead of all the way down the list, he needs to get back to work as well. So I was wondering if Mr. Alltime would also be able to uh, just come and speak to the to the situation so they can be off on their way. He was here to speak on 7.1. But 7.1 and 6.3 are related in the sense because they're, they, they will speak about the direct consequence. Is, is Mr. Fitzgerald uh, really wanting to speak to 7.1 though? Is it, is it about that or yeah, is it, it is. about both? Yeah. It's but mostly it about the 90. Well, what we could do, Mr. Chair, we, I could suggest we bring forward then 7.1 because, well, is Mr. Chand here? Because he was registered as well. 
Oh, I couldn't see you behind there. So we could we could hear the speakers on seven one. Yeah, and I so would, that the speakers are done, and then that, we can carry and then on. Then we can the carry on uh, simply because Mr. Fitzgerald's in the middle, middle of a movie shoot right now, and so he just pulled up I'll everything out of the way. I'll accept that as a motion to move seven point one forward. Yeah. Oh, uh, Councillor Henderson. Well, just to un to understand that the intention is not to finish seven point one before we deal with six point three, but to hear from the speakers, and then we postpone yeah. seven point one. Then we go, and go back, back into order. I'm Does fine that with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whew. Okay, that's a very good suggestion, I think, so. So, you've moved. I, I will move to, well, what, what I will do actually is um, uh, move to reconsider uh, hearing Mr. Fitzgerald on 6.3, so we can delete that, and then what we can do is add Mr. Fitzgerald and the other individual to 7.1, then we'll bring forward 7.1. Does that sound, okay. does that work? Yep. You're challenging me. Okay. All right, <laughs> I'll, uh, oh, oh, uh, is that right, Mr. Clerk? To reconsider? To okay, I'll yeah. move reconsideration of uh, uh, hearing uh, the speaker on 6.3, since he really wants to speak to 7.1. We will vote on that. I'll yep. call the question. All in favor, that is carried. Okay, so that motion's now actually on the floor in front of us. And Again, I will move I will... to bring 7.1 oh, no, 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 no. We have, to amend, we have to amend my motion on the floor, which was to hear from Mr. Fitzgerald on 6.3, to, if it's friendly to the group, to change it to 7.1 because that motion's on the floor, and also the other individual, we just need to get your name. Matt Alt Altheim? Matt. Yeah, which is Matt. A-L-T-H-E-I-M. So I will then move that in addition to Christopher Chan, we will hear from Dennis Fitzgerald and Matt Altheim in a panel on item 7.1. And Elaine Solez? Is she on 7.1 as well? Yes. Was it? Well, no, because we're going to still hear from Mr. Chan on 6.4, and if hers comments are for 6.3 or... So do we want to hear from a panel for all of them then? Uh, Ms. Solas, do you want to speak See, to now, me? Now, no, this is all breaking down, because if it was just to hear about 90, 97th Street, that's one thing, but we, we'd have to get administration's presentation on it on any one of them before we go. So I think if there's a presentation, is there a presentation on 7.1? Uh, we have a presentation if you'd like to see it. Well, I think we should bring forward 7.1, get the presentation on 7.1, hear from the speakers specifically on 7.1, and then we'll loop back around to 6.3, get the presentation on 6.3, hear from any speakers on 6.3, and then move through it in order. That would be my suggestion. Yes. Okay. So that so as long as Ms. Solas is not coming forward for 7.1, we're good then. Okay. So then, so the motion stands, Mr. Alltime, Mr. Chan, and Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald on 7.1. Call the vote. Thank you. Uh, what's that? I'm calling the vote right now. All in favor. That is carried. Okay. And then I'll move to bring forward 7.1. Well, to get the presentation and hear from the speakers before lunch. Uh, all in favor? That is carried. Okay. So we need the presentation first on 7.1. Um, Mr. Chairman, yes, so we have a, the reports in front of you replying to an inquiry from Councillor Nickel uh, in October 2014. We have a brief presentation. If I can get the clerk to queue it up. <coughs> Mr. Golly. Thank you, uh, committee and, and uh, Mr. Mayor. So this uh, presentation is, is uh, about Councillor Nick, uh, Councillor Nichols' inquiry regarding bike lane removal on 97th Street. The history of 97, the 97th Street route between 63rd Avenue and 34th Avenue was that it was installed in 2011. The cross sections on this graphic show you what the road looked like before the first set. Um, it was essentially striped as a two-lane roadway with parking, but some people also treated it as being a four-lane roadway without markings uh, at certain points. But at the intersections, there was a little bit more uh, pavement markings to designate the, the turn lanes and that type of thing. After the bike route was installed along 97th Street, uh, the parking was removed formally, and there's bike lanes along the curbs. At the intersections, however, due to um, some striping that had already occurred, the installation of the bike route included sharrows through those, those locations. 
Currently, there's uh, about 9,000 vehicles a day on this uh, stretch of 97th Street, and the traffic operations are within acceptable and typical levels uh, during the peak periods. Bicycle volumes before and after have increased uh, between 10 and 25%, uh, and collisions um, are fairly stable. They're down a little bit. One of the questions that Councillor Nicola had asked was the uh, impact on the industrial and commercial uh, businesses. We received an informal petition from Councillor Nicola's office. On that petition, there was 193 signatures, 187 supported removing the bike lanes. Uh, 93 people had uh, provided reasons of why that was. 32% uh, referenced low ridership, 15% suggested traffic safety related issues, 9% traffic congestion, and 8% due to loss of parking. There's also a question regarding the value that the bike route had uh, for the, uh, the bicycle community. And so to answer this, we just sent an email to the Edmonton bicycle commuters who uh, completed an informal survey of their members. Their findings was that um, there are a number of people that are using the lanes, that users feel that it's safe for, for all modes now with the lanes. Um, they identified a few problems around those intersections particularly, as well as with cleaning and debris and felt that the 97th Street bike route was a valuable part of the network and that it will become even more important as the cycling network is developed and matures. The inquiry also asked us to look at, uh, to identify some alternate routes. We identified three, uh, 91st Street, 99th Street, and the potential to upgrade uh, 97th Street, as shown in this graphic. 91st Street has uh, an existing shared use path for the, almost its entirety. There is a gap between 23rd and 34th Avenue, but it has limited connectivity to the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, so this would require, in order to provide the same level of connectivity that 97th Street provides, we would be recommending to provide east-west bike connections along some of the arterial avenues uh, or collector avenues to provide access to this industrial and commercial destinations. Uh, 99th Street is a, an arterial roadway, carries uh, high traffic volumes, in order to accommodate bicycle infrastructure, we would be looking at a separated uh, bike infrastructure consistent with our uh, recommendations and council direction from June of, of last year. And, and based on the constraint rights of way and the operating requirements of that roadway, it's uh, not uh, a viable option. Another option would be to upgrade 97th Street um, to improve the intersection operations, uh, to reduce delay and provide a left turn bay at intersections, as well as uh, assist with improving bicycle user comfort by carrying the bike lanes through those intersections that we had previously had shiros. This is uh, an illustration of what that could look like. In terms of costs, 91st Street really ranges depending on uh, the cost of um, removing the 97th Street bike route as well as replacing the markings and adding those east-west bike connections. Uh, that funding, uh, the cost identified, it does not include filling in that gap, which is already a priority project for the Active Transportation Capital Program. 99th Street, we did not generate a cost estimate due to its complexity. And 97th Street, um, again, has a range depending on the cost to, re to remove the existing markings and reorient those markings, as well as installing the upgraded design. In terms of next steps, our recommendation, since this was an inquiry and we were just reporting on the information we had available to us, we would recommend completing an in-service road safety review and operational review for the 97th Street route between 34th Avenue and 63rd Avenue. Uh, the findings of that review would then guide possible changes to this road. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Golly. We'll get you to step back now <clears throat> and invite our speakers back up. So, uh, <clears throat> if you haven't been here before, you have five minutes, and uh, that'll be indicated. You have four minutes on the green. The yellow uh, traffic signal comes on when you have one minute left, and then red will come on when you are done, and I'll ask you to wrap up at that point so, and to identify yourself. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Dennis Fitzgerald. I operate Fitzgerald's it's a bar on 97th Street. I opened it about six years ago. It was a small business when I bought it. It employed about five people. I was able to bring my staff up to about 13, 14 people. Uh, the bike lanes went in and I feel they were very detrimental to my business. It, I, I brought my sales up to just about a million a year and they've stayed there. I cannot increase them. I have nowhere to park customers. I, I 
can verify one fact. I was one of the favorite stopping po spots for a lot of, of the trucks that would pull up on 97th Street because it's a very big industrial area down there. I lost all of that lunch business, all of it. Not, not, none, nobody comes back anymore. So that was about at least a dozen to 15 people every day at lunch at an average of 10 to 15 bucks. So if you do the math over the last couple of years, that's cost me maybe 30 some thousand a year. So uh, the, the bike paths for my particular business and for some of the other guys that I know that come in and visit with me, it's been very, it's been very detrimental. There's no room for me to grow. I can't take my business to two million a year because uh, I've had customers, one people the other day, I heard, heard them talking to a waitress saying, that she said, oh, where have you guys been? I haven't seen it. Oh, we go to Bo Diddley's now. We just can't fight this anymore. We come here for lunch. We don't have time to waste our time. Uh, there's been no alternative. You know, the city asks me to buy a license every year for $1,600. I do. I contribute to the tax base uh, through my common area costs. I do that. But you've taken away my, my ability to grow my business. And there's no real alternatives. I can't park my customers three blocks away and shuttle them over to my business. And uh, I, I, I saw a number up there of 83 people a day on that bike path. Uh, any of you guys could come and sit in my bar and watch out the window. And if you saw 10 bikes a day, I'd buy your lunch. And it, they're, 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 it, this time of year, the bike paths have gone up. The use of that path, I would say, has quadrupled. It's, you know, you, so you might see up to 10 bikes a day on that bike path. In hit November, and to, to just, well, where are we now, May, uh, come, come late spring, then you start to see some bike. During the winter, you don't see anybody. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make this up or anything. This is me being there every day, watching what goes on. And uh, that's, that's what you've done, not only to me. You know, unfortunately, I, didn't even, I found out about this, that I could come down here and speak about 24 hours ago. And I asked one of the other businessmen, and he couldn't arrange his time properly to come also. He owns JB Electric. He would have loved to have been here. Uh, but he's lost customers too because he's, he, he used to have uh, a lot of the electricians would line up with their trailers and stuff then be able to back into his warehouse to buy their supplies and they can't stop anymore and he said so he's had trouble with them they just they've just gone to other suppliers and uh, these are the these are the day-to-day -day things that have, have happened uh, since these bike paths and when you have a, a a route like 91st Street where there's no business on it and there's no residential on it, uh, I, I just don't see how uh, practicality didn't come into play with these bike paths and why, why uh, you, you know, you have bike paths that direct people out of Mill Woods past 91st Street and you bring them all the way up to 97th Street before they can go north. And 91st Street has a paved path on it with a yellow line, and it feeds right into Mill Creek Ravine, which to me is even safer for a biker. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, hi there, my name is Matthew Altheim. I am uh, own a company called Nordic Filmworks, a film company. Uh, Dennis himself right now is actually on the set of Blackstone uh, involved with that, so two local filmmakers in the area. Uh, 97th uh, Street is an industrial area. There is a, a lot of uh, tractor trailers driving that daily. Um, I saw there the, the, the diagram there of the streetways and there's a couple of turning areas and when you have a tractor trailers turning in and out of these, uh, out of these side streets to go into businesses to load goods and whatnot, it, it just seems to me it's a safety concern um, to have uh, also bikes going along these paths, along these giant warehouses. Um, we have I think two dozen uh, bays just on my corner which is 97th Street and 47th Ave and they all receive uh, uh, industrial goods and, and large uh, large uh, transport uh, trailers there. So for me, the primary concern is actually safety. It seems more sense there with the alternate routes like 91st Street where you have a large uh, side green space where you can have uh, bike cyclists go safer, to me is, is better than losing a life on this uh, 97th Street because it's going to happen eventually with the large volume of traffic. 9,000 cars per day. 
Um, I saw also a figure there said 80 cyclists. That just to me is not accurate. My window faces that street in my office. I sit there from nine to five every day. Most days I see one or two cyclists at most. During the winter months, again, uh, his business is losing parking, which he could increase revenues, increase staff, all that sort of thing. So uh, for the limited use, I'd say it'd make more sense to make a safer alternative bike, bike path. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chan. Good morning, Council. My name is Chris Chan. I'm the Executive Director of the Edmonton Bicycle Commuter Society. Uh, we have a paid membership of uh, about 1,600 <coughs> members now. Uh, in November 2014, we conducted uh, just an informal survey of our members. It was just one week. Uh, we got about a dozen responses, and all of them indicated that they drive along 97th Street in that section, uh, bike, walk. Uh, they work there. They, uh, about half of them work in the area, uh, and the rest live or travel, commute through uh, using 97th Street in that area. Only one of those respondents expressed a preference for 91st Street. And I think the, the, the reason for that is 91st Street is a better route if you are not going to that area. Uh, if you are starting out east of it um, and if you're passing farther north beyond it, uh, 91st Street has that separated shared use path. Uh, but the purpose of 97th Street is to form a a part of the network of the cycling infrastructure and to provide access to that area for people that want to be able to uh, access it. If you take away 97th Street, uh, the bike infrastructure there, uh, anyone who still wants to access that area by, by bike, uh, and indeed uh, one respondent mentioned that south of 38th Ave people, uh, especially in the winter, use, <coughs> use the bike lane because there is no sidewalk, so pedestrians are even using that. Um, but if you take away that bike lane on 97th Street, then anyone who still wishes to access that area, who works there, who wants to bike to work, uh, and then perhaps get in their company truck once there, uh, will still have to drive, or bike rather, down 97th Street. Uh, so removing the, the route on 97th Street uh, doesn't, doesn't improve accessibility for, for cycling. I think the, 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 um, very real and apparent um, impacts on businesses who have become dependent on that on-street parking speaks to kind of broader issues in Edmonton about how we deal with uh, expectations around around businesses and residence, residences uh, and, and how much on-street parking uh, is essentially allocated to, to the businesses and, and residences there. And I think it's a difficult question to address um, and, and Council is going to have to balance, is this network, is this section of the network uh, important enough um, versus the negative impacts that it may be having on those businesses that have grown dependent on that on-street parking? Are there other solutions for parking? If not, um, how do we address that? Um, I think the administration's presentation uh, presented some of our uh, reasons why 91st Street just is um, inadequate as an alternate route for 97th Street. You're looking at about at least 1,600 meters in a, a round-trip detour to access 97th Street from 91st Street. Uh, when you take into the uh, account that there's a 1.6 kilometer gap uh, across the White Mud Drive along 91st Street where there's no east-west connections to 97th Street, um, you're looking probably more at an average of about two to two and a half kilometer detour for anyone trying to access that area, making it not an effective alternate as a, as a bike route to access that area. Uh, the only option, therefore, that our organization would endorse if the costs were supported by the findings of a safety and operational review uh, is to upgrade 97th Street, uh, especially at those intersections where people have identified concerns for drivers and cyclists, uh, especially at you know, rush hour leaving, leaving the area. Um, and, and then examining those, uh, those improvements to see if they address some of the issues. If, if 97th Street were to be uh, considered uh, as an option for removal, um, then we would uh, strongly argue that, that uh, no money from the active transportation budget should be used for that process. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Um, and we'll see how we're doing here. Yeah, okay, uh, Mayor Iveson. So, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, what avenue is your business on? 46th, or excuse me, 47th. 47th, so north of? Uh, 34th. North of 34th, okay. Just wanted to get a lay of the land. And you estimate 30,000, is that gross or net? That'd be out of my gross sales. It, it's probably a touch higher than that. I'm kind of that's kind of my, the lunch crowd, right? Sure. So, so it's not affecting your your after work when there's probably more parking available. After yeah, after six o'clock, I'm fine. Because you because you're Cause you're sharing parking on your the on-site parking in your area is right. available. So it's just when all the other businesses are have all their employees there during the day that there's less parking available for you. Correct. So the on-street parking was was a bonus enabling you to, a, to a take bonus at, at lunchtime yes and I, I actually phoned uh, transport department probably two years ago and and asked I said well is there a way we could get uh, uh, you know a moratorium like not a moratorium but a, a an hourly thing where between 11 30 and 1 30 uh, people could park because I will when you do see bikes 90% of those bikes too, and I throw these numbers around loosely, I, you know, I can't back them up, but most of your bike riders are commuting to work and going home at night. So that's when you see the bike path being used. If you do see the bike path being used, that's when you do see it being used. It's early in the morning or late at night. And you know, my big cry out is, is, is lunch, but they weren't, uh, or even on one side of the street, but they weren't prepared to even entertain anything like that. Well, there is there is a lot of width there, and there might be there might be some options we can look at uh, as part of the safety review as well. And uh, and I don't know if two. is there any uh, are you close enough at 47th? Like, is there any parking along 47th? Uh, it's actually no. There's no park. It, it's fully park uh, parking <coughs> parked. Uh, I asked if I could get on 96th Street. They have avenue si or signs up that say two hour limitation. Uh, but one of my neighbors has quite a number of staff, and I, it's, you're going to find this crazy, but I would actually stack cars and, uh, and bring a tray, pull a trailer behind me sometimes so I could plug up 47th Avenue beside my bar so his staff wouldn't take all my parking. So there's larger the sort of, of parking supply there is, demand it's full, issues you can in the park area. anywhere on 40 on 47th Ave recognizing right. that the, the the implementation of the bike lanes has taken away some of the informal exactly. parking along 97th well that's useful there, for us and there hear. is just to clarify the gentleman here there is a sidewalk on 97th Street on the east side of 97th Street at your area or yeah, yeah I yeah. think he was talking about further south but oh sorry yeah. but uh, right from 34th all the way north to 50 to 97 63rd is a Okay, thank you. Councillor Nichol. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for being very patient, Mr. Fitzgerald and Mr. Altheim and Mr. Chance. Always good to see you again. Uh, let's, let's talk about some of the, because every time we talk about bike lanes, we talk about everything but, it seems, about the fiscal impact that some of these bike lanes might be having on local businesses. And isn't the question right now, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, that it doesn't really make a lot of sense running bike lanes through a commercial slash industrial area to you. You're correct. It, yeah. Simply because, let's, get, let's talk about your petition, for example, um, because in the report, it's, it, they, were, uh, they didn't know when you collected it, when you collected these signatures, whom you collected it. Can you tell me a little bit about the, the petition? I, I'd say it was about eight months ago, seven, eight months ago, and I, all I did with, the t with it was I just canvassed north of 34th Avenue and uh, one, only one business south of or excuse me, uh, north of 51st Avenue. I basically just stayed within that perimeter 34 to 51 and went, went door to door to most of the businesses along 97th Street. And, 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 I, and it says right here in the petition, and I have shown council uh, uh, that loss of business, loss of parking. Awesome. And uh, it's not being, and comment after comment after comment, not being used, not being used. Uh, that's pretty much the, the uh, and then the, then the question of safety, safety and hazards. 
because, uh, Mr. Altime, you talked about tractor-trailer trucks. How many tractor-trailer trucks do you see part of this 9,000? I mean, it is, it is a, quite a large quantity, is it not? Yeah, it's probably 30 to 40% of the traffic, is, is, at least during the daytime. When people go to work before 9 o'clock, it's all uh, cars and trucks. I don't see many people commuting on bikes to these areas. Most of these workers are in pickup trucks because they're transporting goods throughout the day. Yeah. And, and Mr. Mr. Fitzgerald, I know from our conversations with uh, you've had with other business owners, part of the problem is is that for some of the contractors up and down the road, they, the problem with the no parking in front of their commercial entities is that they can't pull into the parking lot, right? Because they can't park in front of it because that, they have a trailer on the back, and so they can't go in. That's Can correct. Talk that the, through. The gentleman I mentioned from JV Electric, a lot of those tradespeople, the electricians, all carry their trailer supplies. He actually said to me that he had to go out into the break up a fight, and the, not they were going to fight uh, because one trailer had pulled in because he had no he he had to load up, but he couldn't stay on the street. But by pulling in, he plugged the other guy in. And he had walked in, and then the guy came searching for him to get him out so he could move his trailer. You know, and Mr. Chan, to, to you, and I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult, right? But I'm trying to approach this. This is a commercial and industrial area. And for, you know, for 1,600 meters, and what we're talking about is I'm hearing from business people up and down that street that they can't retain employees because they don't have parking, or they've lost sales. There's that element, and they put a cap, as you've heard from Mr. Fitzgerald, on the growth of their business. Shouldn't, shouldn't a fiscal um, priority be put on top of your 1,600 kilometer reroute? I think the question is more, um, how do we balance providing safe access to people, for people to, to access that neighborhood? Uh, the people that work there and the people that travel through there um, with with the needs of the businesses. Uh, and if that can be done, if we can find parking that will work for the businesses uh, while still maintaining that safe access, then I think that should be our... With my last minute, I have spoken to the people who actually use that bike lane. And most of that ridership is on a Sunday, to be quite frank. That's why the businesses aren't seeing it. They're right, they use that route on a Sunday where there is no traffic and not in the middle of the day or as a main commuter route. This is, the, this is what I've received from uh, people who have actually used that uh, as I've spoken to them. And I, I just want each of you three to, to provide a comment towards, because it was just Mr. Mackey yesterday talking about parking, and he said he's, it's the importance of on-street parking in terms of community vibrancy, and certainly business is part of the community. So, you know, Taking away parking is not just hurting, it's, it's hurting the business community, is it not? And I just want your comments on that. Well, uh, you know, my style, my business depends on people being able to pull up, get out, stay for an hour, get back in their car and drive away. Someone else comes and uses that same spark parking spot and does the same thing over and over. Uh, what I've tried to explain to you is what the previous council did by pu pushing this through so quickly without looking at it properly, is they basically stymied us. We have, I ha we, there's nothing I can do. I, there's no sense that I plan big promotions, spend money on advertising, do that, because there's nowhere to put these people. So I, it's not all about just, you know, they have, you know, if I do a, a punch card like we used to do and the guy fills his punch card for lunch, well, some of them don't come anymore, you know. You have to have, sorry, I get carried away, but yeah, yeah, my business can only survive on parking. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Yeah, I'll respond to that. It's an absolute uh, quagmire in that area. I invite the councillors throughout the next few weeks just to drive down there. If you're down uh, going to the south end of Edmonton, the amount of cars between uh, you know 11 o'clock and 3 o'clock is, is, is enormous. My neighbor is the Alberta Seniors Housing Association, a not-for-profit. On Thursdays, I have to be able to find parking for about 15 cars, these, these elderly seniors, because they drive there for their monthly meeting. So we actually move my vehicles out of my five allotted spots, and we try to find parking on the street to accommodate them. It is a quagmire is the way I describe the parking and the traffic situation down there. It's just not safe for these bike lanes, and it is affecting business <coughs> significantly. Thank you. 
Um, Mayor Iveson. We, we are getting well, we're, we're uh, going to need a Wichita. motion to extend uh, I would say till 1210 to see if we can finish with the uh, uh, the, the speakers on this one because I think that's that should get us through what's left so I'll move that thank you um, all in favor that is carried councillor Gibbons so mr. Chen you, you made a comment the only way you'll accept you got 1,600 members. Are they all commuters? Are they mom and pops? Are they what, as bicycle people? Uh, we have a uh, pretty diverse mix. We have uh, youth, seniors, uh, commuters, parents, students. So how many you think would be coming down 97th Street? If we're hearing the numbers we are, are they commuters? Uh, well, about half of the, we had a very small you know, informal survey, about half of them were working in the area. In the area. Yeah, and then, and then uh, um, about a, another quarter of them were passing through uh, as commuters and about another quarter were shopping in the area. So what do you mean about the only way you'll accept? Do you run the city or do you just, is, you know, you've written, you've got made comments about when I've talked about uh, license plates for bikes before, that it's, you know, it's, you seem to be sitting on the other side of the table without helping us move things along. You've already said you do not believe in 91st Street. How can we bring things forward if you just sit on the other side of the table and say, I don't know why we accept that? What I was referring to is of the options presented in the report, 91st Street, 99th Street, and 97th Street, the only option that seems to make any sense as providing that network connection is 97th Street. Uh, we are certainly not anti-business and we don't want bike lanes that are going to be negatively impacting communities. What we want is bike routes that, that make a positive impact on the communities. So we would like to see these routes, this route, um, perhaps be improved in a way that works well for the community. Improved, so if we had a chance that we could save the parking as well as having bike lanes, is that a way? Certainly. Because we're, you know, this is where the conflict is going to keep coming, is the fact that um, um, I believe in business. You know, that employs people. That moves, uh, uh, keeps the economy moving. You know, I'm yet to think that, um, I, I've been in Europe, I've been through Co Copenhagen, I've been through lots of places where bicycle lanes work. But I don't want to chase away business from this. So I'll listen, I'll ask questions to the administration, but I, I, I don't like the term, this is the only way you'll accept this because then you're never going to get my vote and I will bring the possibility of the bicycle license forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Henderson. Well, just, just to be clear, I, Mr. Chan, I think what I heard you say would, you'd have trouble accepting and I would ask would, that we use active transportation money to take out bike lanes. I, th I think that's, to be fair to what you said, that was the only thing you said you wouldn't accept, correct? We said we would, well, of, the, of the options that were yeah. part presented, yeah. I mean, we'd endorse it, 97th Street, and, and yeah, we wouldn't yeah. want to. And I, and I agree with you. I mean, I mean to, be, to be fair, I mean, saying that we're helping active transportation by taking this out is, I mean, this would be about something else. So why we should be using active transportation money to make active transport to less than active transportation, I think is a, quite a legitimate argument, and that's what I heard you say, and I would agree with that. I do want to explore one other thing with you, though, because I, I mean, I have some sympathy for this, and you know, these, this is all about balance, but it strikes me when we talk about 1600, we, when we talk about 1600 meters, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's actually over a kilometer and a half, correct? That's, that's a pretty big detour. Yeah, generally that's, that's a much larger detour than, than someone riding a bicycle will take. They'll instead take the more direct route. They're going to stay on 97th is my guess. It's, and, and, we, and the numbers we have show that there were, there were a fair amount of, you know, the riders that were there, two-thirds of them were there beforehand anyway, right? Yeah. Whether they were safe or not is another question, but they were there and they're not going away. So it's about making sure they're safe. And if there's safety issues, we need to be able to address those because those bikes we're there before we put the lines in. We have to make sure they're safe. That is a responsibility we have, correct? Yes. So whatever solution we come up with, we have to recognize that those riders are not going away because they predated us putting the bike lanes. Yeah. Right. Um, 
The other question I have, though, and I wouldn't mind your thinking on this, because understanding there's not a lot of res to understand what we're trying to deal with here, my one other worry on this is if we don't have something in here, we're going from 106th Street to 91st Street with no north-south connection that is safe for bikes. And, uh, and that's 15 blocks. So that's, I mean, the reason why we have to find something in here, I mean, that's a pretty big gap. We can't use Calgary Trail. I think anybody would be suicidal to bike along there. And there's been no suggestion of putting, 99th Street has the same problems to it. Um, so we're, it's a long way to go west before you hit another good route. And if you don't have something in the middle, you've got a 15 block gap for anybody in that part of the city. And it's a pretty busy part of the city. I mean, 99th Street, Calgary Trail are major routes that, were, that are really car only. And we need to find some way through the middle in order for anybody on, a, on, a, on, on any other kind of mode of transportation like the bicycle to be able to access all the stuff that's north and south in the middle of our city, which is a pretty major route for all other modes of transportation, correct? So yes. what would be the other solutions to that if we didn't look at 97? Well, one of the nice things about 97th Street is the way it crosses the white mud. You don't have to, to uh, traverse an, uh, an interchange. Uh, and I, I don't know that uh, any of the other options really provide that kind of um, safety uh, and comfort. So uh, it's looking looking east and looking west, it, it is 99th Street or, or 91st Street are the nearest options because there aren't really many north-south routes through that area. So, so probably for that reason, one way or another, the bikes that are going to be using 97th are still going to be using 97th. They don't really have anywhere else to go that would be any safer. They're not going to, going over to 106 is way too far, and I would argue going a kilometer and a half over to 91st. You will have people using it. 91st is already there. It's there for a good reason, but it's there to, it's there to serve a different purpose, correct? Indeed. So um, figuring that out to make sure everybody's safe has to be the objective here. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Understanding that there's a trade-off here that we need to deal with, and I, and I understand that. I, I have huge sympathy for what this trade-off is, but I, I'm, and I, and I guess my one other question is, um, we, uh, you know, we've, we've gone down this road, we've opened this question up, but it was an inquiry, so we've had no real ability to do any kind of, I mean, there's a lot of complaint about consultation when we put these things in. We've done consultation in terms of taking it out now. There would be, if we're going to look at this, there's a, there's a larger discussion we're going to have to have. I'm, you know, because none of you have been in position to sort of really do the kind of quality of, of a larger discussion with all the interests that we need to do. Would that be fair to say? Uh, well, you know what, I was going to say also, thank you to everybody. This is the very first time, you know, other than when Councillor Nick, uh, I asked about the petition, this is the very first time that anybody has ever approached my business to find out, you know, what's going, do you want to say something, do you want to talk, or da, 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 that kind of thing. Also, just to comment on your 106 to 91st, uh, if you take a close look at that, west of, nine, of a, a Calgary Trail, there is residential, but just about that whole area that you're speaking about, there is no residential, and I appreciate people go to work, but you're directing people now out of Mill Woods past 91st Street and sending them up to 97th Street so they can travel north. So you're actually taking them past 91st Street and telling them to go, your bike arrow things on the road say, don't go north on 91st, go all the way up to 97th and then go north, which is kind of crazy, but that's what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Mr. Chan, there was a suggestion made that um, the parking be allowed from 11.30 to 1.30 uh, weekdays, I would assume that would be. Uh, awkward to, to have a bike lane essentially blocked for two hours a day. But is it feasible? Could it be something that is worked with? Um, I think at this stage in our bike network and given the usage, I think it's something that certainly should be considered. I don't know anything about the engineering and the safety and, and those kinds of things, but it, it is something we would be willing to consider. Yeah, I don't know the realm either whether or not there's almost like a sidewalk run around you could do there, but I wondered because that would seem to be a fairly s simple compromise and given the amount. And uh, the other thing I want to ask you, uh, 
A lot of the people that have been using 97th uh, Street traditionally, pretty hardcore cyclists. They're fairly comfortable in traffic, I would think, traditionally. Yeah, most of our most of the comments we received said they they were more comfortable uh, than before, right. indicating suggesting perhaps they were using it before. Right. So so the impact. Uh, I'm not su suggesting we remove the bike lanes, but the impact of of doing something to help with the parking there may not be as devastating as it would be in another area where we're really trying to sort of in, uh, entice people out to use to use cycle infrastructure. I think so. I think this, this network connection is really for a different type of, of cyclist than, for instance, what we're trying to appeal to with 83rd Ave and 102F. Right. right. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Iveson. Well, one, one uh, I, I don't mean to ask this in a flippant way, but do either of your businesses have bike racks? No. And, and that's fair, because we're in a time of transition here, which is that you know, maybe not today, maybe not next year, but the purpose of this network is that over time that option would be available to more people, including, if not your employees, people who work in your complex. And what I'm hearing you tell me on the one hand is that traffic is really, really bad and uh, parking is really, really scarce. You know, if 50 or 100 more people rode their bikes into the employment area that you work in instead of driving, that relieves some pressure on the parking. This is why council at a strategic level is trying to do this. And I recognize that doesn't mean people are going to necessarily start riding their bikes to lunch at your business tomorrow. But in terms of the shift we're trying to make to make maximum use of the transportation infrastructure that's out there, um, does, does that make sense to you as, as one of the payoffs of what council is trying to achieve over time here, recognizing that I, the numbers haven't increased what, dramatically today? I agree with what you're saying, and I, and I think over time, people, you will see more people riding bikes, but I think the way it was implemented, there was no thought process put in. Those, those bike lanes, were, we didn't, we, I, got a, I got a letter, and three days later, signs went up out front. And, and you, you have to understand, like, nobody, he, you can mention that there's 80 people a day. I, I, uh, I mentioned that number yesterday, too, and it, it brought laughter. You just do not see bikes using those bike lanes. And if you guys were to, and that's why I say, you know, okay, maybe these guys could be inconvenienced for five years and use 91st Street because it is so practical. There's no business, there's no residential, and as the, as the population of bike, bikers grow, then you look for better alternatives. And you know, the, uh, my grandkids might ride bikes to work one day. You know, you'll never teach me to ride a bike. I'm, you know, over the hill kind of thing. But as we grow, and the other thing you have to combat, I heard somebody mention uh, uh, Copenhagen and all that, and I remember reading an article, one of the ladies, praising the bike paths that went in a couple years ago, and one day we'll be like Victoria. We'll never be like Victoria. When it's 40 below outside, we're not like Victoria. And you can come down and sit on 97th Street at any corner you want, and when it's windy and stormy and the snow is piled up on the roads, for, there's a five, four month period where you won't see one bike a day. You, I'll bet you you'll get maybe five bikes a month using the bike pass. And this is, I, I hear what council wants to do and I understand what bikers, uh, I'm not against people riding their bikes, but the way it was implemented and the way it was introduced to us as business people, we never had a chance and, to. And that's, that's fair and I think this council's heard that loud and clear and that's why we've taken special measures to increase the kind of consultation and again, any changes that would happen here would require a lot more engagement than we were able to do. Uh, previously when these were implemented. So appreciate your answers on those though. So Councillor Nichols. It's, yeah, I, just, I, well, you're going to lose quorum because I got a meeting I'm 15 minutes late for now. Quick so. last question in terms of uh, uh, a limited parking ban would help your business, but there are businesses up and down that street that work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. You're correct. Thank I you. was, I, I'm being selfish. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We will reconvene at 1.30. Thanks, everyone.
Shall we, uh, shall we get started? Welcome back, everybody. We are still on item 7.1. Mr. Chair, I believe you were going to hear from the speakers on 7.1 and then revert to 6.3. Is that my understanding? Oh, thank you. Thank you. So we're back to 6.3 presentation. Yes, we do, uh, and we'll start that right away. This report is in uh, response to a uh, motion by Councillor Walters in October of last year, um, wanting to look at more about how we monitor and measure the performance of our bicycle uh, routes in the city. So to answer this question, we wanted to uh, inform our decisions based on what other cities are doing in, and the best practices out there. So we asked a number of cities and professionals about how they were measuring bike route performance and how they were setting targets. We contacted uh, over 2,000 members of the Institute of Transportation Engineers and the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals and contacted 12 cities specifically to, to um, hold some interviews with those folks to get into more detail and were able to complete interviews with, with eight different cities. The res results of that, uh, of that best practice review was that these cities are monitoring the performance of their bicycle network on a citywide scale. Uh, they're setting targets and, and creating measures based on the, the strategic plans and policies of, the, of, the, uh, of their cities uh, approved by their local government. And uh, no city is setting specific targets on a route-specific basis um, to monitor, but they do monitor the usage and safety um, in, a, in the hopes to identify possible improvements to those routes. Uh, Ottawa is an example of that. So our next steps going forward is um, the creation of uh, and reporting of an annual monitoring and reporting of the citywide performance of the bicycle program where we will have specific targets and that will be reported in the bicycle program annual report. The second uh, scope of the review that we would like to do uh, in terms of monitoring the performance is to look at the individual routes and do those reviews on an annual basis uh, by sector and reporting those and identifying um, opportunities for improvements. So to provide you a little bit more detail, the bicycle program annual report, again, will be monitoring that citywide performance of the bicycle program based on the goals and objectives of the way ahead. Two, we have two targets uh, or measures with targets, the commute to work non-auto driver mode share. Uh, which was approved by City Council and is uh, a corporate measure of the way ahead. There is also a measure from the province through the Alberta Traffic Safety Plan uh, regarding collisions. Now there's also going to be a report that you'll be receiving uh, about the road safety strategy from transportation and I believe it's in May, um, which might, uh, might change this measure. In addition, there will be a number of other measures that we can track and, and we're planning to track. Um, we're following a great example from the City of Calgary, which is included in the report as attachment one, um, to report that progress. And again, we would be documenting our findings in an annual report. The second level of review is, the, uh, is to look at the, the monitoring the performance of individual bike routes. And we would follow the similar program that we currently use in the department to review and optimize the traffic signal network. Uh, specifically, we'd be defining the city into about five sectors and reviewing all the, the bike routes within that sector in, the, in a year. And then we would continue on to the next sector the following year. And in this way, we would be reviewing all bike routes within the city over a five-year rolling basis. The review will include the bicycle ridership, safety operations, and public satisfaction. It follows a very similar approach to what we were doing uh, last year in response to a motion regarding 40th Avenue, 95th Avenue, and 106th Street. Now the results of that review, um, it, it could sort of uh, be grouped into one of three categories. The results of the individual bike route reviews could identify um, safety and operational improvements and uh, or educational information needs. We have funding to do that as part of the Active Transportation Capital Program. Another result of the review could be in uh, developing a route design upgrade. Uh, that would require public engagement. Um, and there currently isn't funding allocated for, for that scale of improvement. The third option would be reviewing potential alternate routes and developing plans for those alternate routes. Again, we would need to do public engagement on that, and uh, there is no funding currently available to do that scale of work. 
So our next steps on this is to produce the bicycle program annual report for which I know a number of the metrics we already do collect statistics, we just haven't reported it in the past in this way. Um, we will also be completing the annual bicycle route reviews by the sectors and uh, we would continue implementing the 2014 to 2018 bicycle infrastructure plan that was presented to you in June of last year and that was funded um, in part in the capital budget in the, in the fall. Thank you. And we uh, do have a speaker, uh, Elaine Solis, will ask you to step back. Thank you, Mr. Golly. Good afternoon, Ms. Solis. Do I have to explain the five minute rule? No, you don't have to explain. Thank that. you. And hopefully, this won't take that long. Um, I, uh, good afternoon, uh, members of committee and other councillors. Um, I believe that it's important to have performance measures and I'm glad to, um, to see that uh, the city is moving in, in this direction. Uh, I, I worked in, it's an area near and dear to my heart. I worked in it for many years. Um, and with regard to the bike lanes, the increase in ridership where cycling infrastructure has been put in place uh, is, uh, very meaningful and uh, important to keep as, uh, along with uh, safety uh, considerations and um, other impacts as you've, you've heard this morning. Um, the impulse when developing performance measures though is to really overdo it. I saw that list that was attached to the, the agenda. I don't have it with me and it seemed like maybe some of it, um, you don't need all of those measures. It can. One of the basic principles of performance measures is to not to have it too costly uh, or too time consuming. And some of the things on the list might be um, seeming to, re to measure different things, but they may actually be re measuring the same thing over and over. Um, and then as long as we're on um, measurement, uh, I wanted to say that satisfaction isn't the only thing to measure, but it's important uh, you know, necessary but not sufficient, but it is important to measure satis public satisfaction and that it should, that when you do measure satisfaction, uh, it, it needs to be probed because people can be dissatisfied for different reasons. The cycling community can be dissatisfied because the cycling network isn't extensive enough or the cycling infrastructure isn't of high quality, you know, there are potholes. I mean, we know all that, you know, there's gravel in the bike lanes, there's potholes in the bike lanes. On the other hand, other people may be dissatisfied because they have to slow down when there's cyclists on the road and the parking is removed. You heard that this morning, uh, roads are narrowed and, and that sort of thing. So um, there, you know, your overall satisfaction rate isn't going to tell you very much unless you probe it. Um, so that, that's really all I had to say on, on the measurement side of things. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, Councillor Nickel. Well, thank you for coming down. I think you've raised some excellent <coughs> points, simply because there is a danger, right? And I'm, I'm with you about performance metrics and measurements and statistics. To overmeasure, and thereby it's to cost too much money, right? And number two, it might, might, if we don't use the right methodology, right, the right selection of criteria, of what we're measuring, then it's, we're not getting the, uh, the, the real answer. And that's what you mean by probing, correct? That's right. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we heard today a little bit about it's, it's sometimes it's about parking, some, like you said, potholes in the sections and so on. So dissatisfaction as a general category, in your opinion, would it not be just, I would agree, it's kind of insufficient, right? Just well, satisfaction say, as a category is an important category, but you have to know. But it's not the be all subs, and end all. Subs, yes. Right. right. What, uh, what did you think of some of the statements that were made earlier this morning re regarding some financial uh, implications or measurements that need to be that perhaps might need to be included where, where bike lanes go? Uh, I'm going to back up a little bit on that. Um, I think that it's unfortunate that there are financial impacts, and that might be something to look at. But I think it's the way the cycling infrastructure was rolled out in this city where there wasn't sufficient consultation, there wasn't sufficient consideration of, of the balancing of all the different uh, interests 
uh, before the um, network started to be built because I think that if you'd known some of those things ahead of time, it might have been built slightly differently or, or different accommodations might have been made. Um, and, and I do appreciate that this work started before the Complete Streets concept was very alive and well here in Edmonton. And I think if this Complete Streets approach was used and the prioritization of the various um, yep. users and, and all of that, that you could come out with a better, better answer. And unfortunately, um, my other, the other things I'm going to say with regard to the other topics uh, relate more to that, uh, more to this sort of uh, line of commentary that you're going to, I think you're going to be uh, redoing a lot of that cycling network that's been put in because of the way it was done. Well, just to give you, just to give you an example, they, we sur they did a survey of councillors and it's in 2014 in April, it says, councils identified pushbacks from constituents on the research presented to show the market potential of cyclists in Edmonton. Without personally seeing usage in a city where car culture is king, those who have experienced negative impacts for bike infrastructure have reacted strongly in disbelief that the numbers are true because they don't visibly see cyclists. This leads to concerns about bias and unrealistic program objectives. And it's not that here, here we're saying, and I'll be the first guy to say this, I'm not anti-bike lane, but with a demonstration of value has to be clearly made. Would you not agree with that statement? Uh, I do agree, and I think you've seen an increase of usage on all the routes, and I think you'll see more in the future as the network grows, uh, and as people get more comfortable cycling, and as the quality of the infrastructure improves, like it's going to be done on 102nd Avenue and 83rd Avenue. But for example, yeah, and I think those, 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 those ones make good sense, but the, turn, I'll turn around and say to you, you also made the comment about that parts of the infrastructure, because the way it was rolled out, uh, had some challenges, or yes. has challenges, yes, as I, it I exists today. Yes, Yeah. That's and so, right. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor uh, Councillor Henderson. I wouldn't mind your thoughts on this, because it's always struck me, and maybe this, I wonder, it, just to see if this is what you're saying, um, that we, you need to be measuring what you're trying to achieve. So if you don't really have a clear idea of what you're trying to achieve to begin with, if you begin to pick your measurements because of what you can measure, rather than actually measuring whether you're not you're getting where you want to go, you're going to end up with the wrong things. Yeah. Yes, but I would say that if you're putting in a cycling network, your objective is to increase cyclists. So having that kind of a metric well, uh, is that's important. Well, why, that's why I asked that question because I, you know, I think we need. I'm just wondering if we, if that, you know, if there's some clarity around that that we need to be the thing to start with because it may be about more cyclists, that's certainly one metric I think that quite clearly we said we're looking for. It may be about safety, right? So even if it's the same number of cyclists, making sure that they're safe might be one of the metrics we're looking for. Yeah, okay, you know, I, I that's mean, what I'm saying, yeah. it's understanding, but if we're unclear about that, then we may end up, you know, I just wonder if we're unclear about what we're trying to achieve, then you, then they well, might. Well, and if people feel more comfortable yeah. cycling, there are a number of things, yeah. a number of things yeah. to look at, yeah. yes. Yeah. The clarity is always important. Yeah. But, it, but it's rooted in, and I think this is, you know, the, the point of, of, of when you're measuring satisfaction, being clear about what dissatisfaction you're measuring is, you need to know what satisfaction you're trying to create to begin with. That's yes? right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're good. Uh, quickly, so there are a number of constituencies that, that are in play here. Dri drivers of cars, cyclists, and the community, uh, and the business community, and the community, residential community, uh, in which these bike lanes are uh, hosted by. So, and do we do we want to make sure that we're engaging with all those various constituencies as we look at something like satisfaction? Uh, yes. Well, and also as you're looking into what kind of how the, the cycling network is going to work in that area. Um, and I know that sometimes there are, there are pinch points. We all know that, especially you're retrofitting a city that was built without the, the cycling infrastructure. And there's plenty of room in some places and not so much in other places. So that all has to be balanced. And I think sometimes drivers in this city, and I am one, um, 
like to be able to drive anywhere that it's easy. You know, they, they create these little shortcuts and, you know, oh, I'll, I'll avoid all that traffic on Calgary Trail and I'll take this other route, for example. You know, sometimes you have to, you know, in order to accommodate the cyclists on a, a less busy road, you have to in, implement things that will make going on that busy Calgary Trail preferable to doing the shortcutting through um, a, a, a smaller road. And I think that that's, that's where, um, that's, that's probably the thing that's, and I, I, that's um, it's gonna be your, a problem. Get your comment on the fact that at initially in satisfaction surveys, we may see a negative, even a strong negative that may, so it al I'd almost be more interested to see if we could get a positive trend on that rather than, you know, given yes. what you just said. We're yes, putting exactly. bike lanes in a in a in a in a in, in a city where we haven't had bike lanes, so we know that that is a, a cultural change and, and, and all sorts of changes. So uh, the initial some of the initial reaction is going to be negative. We just know that. Yes, that's right. And it may um, people get used to it over time, and that that negativity may go away or be lessened. I'd, I'd say, you know, that if you get a, a strong pushback right at first, it doesn't necessarily mean you're in the wrong, going the wrong way. Right. It's just um, people need time to get used to ideas, and that's another reason to do more upfront consultation yes. rather than this kind of imposing it and really quickly and, and not giving people time to get used to the idea. Right. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Solis, thanks so much for your presentation. Appreciate your time. Mr. Golly will ask you to step back up and be interrogated by committee. This is your job, man. Um, who wants to start? Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm actually going to channel Michael Walters because he's not here and he had some questions to be asked. So I've, I've received the questions. And I'm now Michael Walters. So I'll talk about Elevate a little bit to start, just for some reason. And uh, then we'll kick it off, with it, which is, um, he wanted to know, have we assessed the gender and other demographics of our bike lane ridership? To date, we have not. Uh, a lot of our counts are done with myovision technology, which is used across the country. Uh, you could um, mine that video data to do that, but you'd have to do it manually or have staff on the road manually uh, differentiating between gender. Um, Calgary, that is something that Calgary tracks, is gender as well as uh, they try to break it down into age demographics as well. And, and I think the preface to that is that he's provided a number of statistics about the differences in cities where they have separated bike infrastructure and the increase that they've seen in women and children riding, so that's part of the context of that question. Um, I wanted to know what type of infrastructure is possible in Edmonton to separate bike lanes. Uh, bollards and planters are, highly, are popular and highly rated and might not require as substantive an, an investment as fully moving the lanes, just in general, where we're having to. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to design bike infrastructure. It all depends on budget, right-of-way availability. So there's bollards, there's um, planters. A lot of the planters are usually placed on concrete medians. Uh, Vancouver is sort of like that. Um, sometimes they, some places just use parked cars and initially they've found that you need to have some sort of flex post, plastic post in between the parking and the bike lane until people get trained that they should be parking against this line as opposed to against the curb. So there's lots of different ways to do it and I think it, uh, each city needs to look at that on a uh, route by route basis. Okay. Um, he references a study that had been done uh, in Montreal um, comparing Netherlands is sort of the benchmark where you see a very high ridership compared to other spots like in the United States. And some of the statistics talk about percentage of trips overall made by bicycle, percentage of female cyclists, bicycle rate of injury per million kilometers. Um, and also goes on to talk about um, how people, of the different types of bike lanes available, uh, how the average of 28% safer people felt when, again, they're in that separated piece. And uh, so the, the other question I have here from him is, if we wanted to collect similar data from our current ridership, um, and I think he started talking about it, but what would be the best way to go about collecting that data? Uh, okay, you touched on a lot of different factors there. So um, some cities try to track the number of kilometers cycled in a year by users. It's kind of tough to do that. It's usually an estimate. Um, 
but some cities have been able to do that. Our household travel survey should provide us a lot with a lot more um, up-to-date data. The last time we did that was 10 years ago, so I think we might be able to mine that survey depending on the uh, the sampling to get to some of those metrics. But I th you know, we have automated ways to do that. Um, we have manual ways to count things, and and uh, there has been a study recently done at the U of A looking at um, hospital admissions um, to look at that for injury and collision statistics as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lots of there's lots of ways to do it. A lot of the, some of the ways we're currently um, already doing, which makes it easy to, to include in a report. Additional methods are a little bit more time consuming and resource intensive. Okay. So it, it'll affect on um, how much we can do. And I mean, that was, that was sort of the last of his questions. But I guess when we're talking about trying to determine effectiveness, um, perceived safety is probably one of the most important things because if, if people who are considering riding again food fall in the interest of a concern, aren't going to jump on the lanes in the first place. We can measure the ridership on a current lane, on a pain, whether it's painted line, separated lane, but if we're not touching the people who, are, who aren't there in the first place, that might be a really good measure to determine um, if the infrastructure that we've created in the first place is, is having the impact we want it to have. So yeah, I guess I just sort of flag that as, as something as we go forward, making sure we're reaching out not just to the hardcore cyclists. Okay. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Well, uh, I mean, it's great to see this. And I, and I guess just to go back to that question of where we're trying to go and therefore what we're trying to measure. Um, so if we were going to sort of put those into two things, I think the first thing we're trying to measure is change of mode share, because we've said that pretty clearly. Ultimately, one of our goals is getting it so more people can make this choice or do make this choice, right? Yes, that's the only measure we have right now that's approved by council. Okay. Um, and then the other measure, though, that probably comes to other places but may not be specific to bikes is around safety, is it not? Yes. Because, and it was on that one, you know, and just as an example, I suppose, of what I was, you know, and, and you know, again, figuring out what we, you know, and, and in some ways, if you were going just for safety, you might make one set of choices. If you're going just for mode share, they cross over. But it's why I asked the question of, of Ms. Solis about, you know, being clear about what we're trying to achieve. Because I was, I was pretty struck by the numbers in here that are a target for our three-year average, which we're getting close to, which feels great, but is still 180 collisions. And, and I, you know, I'm guessing, you know, we, we saw a number of 180 collisions on, on automobiles. I think we would understand that to mean something different than 180 collisions between all, that's And that's automobile bike collisions, period, right? And, I, yeah. and I'm guessing, you know, from what I know, that the severity, if we, if we measure the severity of those, is probably pretty high, is it not? Most of those collisions result in injury, for sure, yeah. yeah. We've been one averaging more. the last yeah. couple of years one fatality a year. Yeah, so, because I, you know, and I just, it just, that jumped out at me because accepting 180 serious injury collisions a year, it seems to me is a, not what I would call a stretch goal. Um, and I, and, uh, or an acceptable goal. Um, and I, you know, I think that's one of the other things we need to keep in mind if we you know where we think about where we're trying to go and what we're trying to measure, because I think it does come back to some of the debate we had earlier. It may not necessarily always be about the number of people that are using a lane. It may be about going to people that are using a facility, making sure that they can use it safely and that we can get that number down. And it's got to be about both of those two things who are trying to do, yes? Yeah, there's a number of studies that also show that as you increase ridership, safety is also improved. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I no, think but, I just, and, but I would hate to think that we were just deciding to do this. I guess this is the question I'm asking, and this is why we need to be careful, and it's good to see these in here. But I would like to see that 180 number be a, be a, a much lower number in terms of where we're trying to get to. I mean, really, ar arguably, it should be zero. And that's what our overall, tra that's what our overall traffic safety strategy is saying, zero is really the only acceptable number, correct? I haven't seen that strategy yeah. personally, but I think that's what well, we're working towards. we had that towards. conversation yeah. this place a year ago. And so, so, so yeah. currently, yeah. this is the only target that's available. I, I understand to that. It's not critical. It's just yeah. what's surprising, right? And, and yeah. the number means something different when you think that that's 180 probably fairly serious and, and if not fatal accidents, collisions. Um, so, but, so when we make this decision about what we're doing, it may not necessarily, I, mean, I guess my point is that I'd like to know that as we go forward that uh, that we're not just making decisions necessarily in terms of just trying to increase ridership on a route, 
but it's also where we have a route where there are a lot of riders. We want to increase their safety. It's those two things that we're trying to achieve, right? Yes. Okay. And, and any measures that were going to come in place or any kind of reporting that would be in place, I would hope would understand that those, we need to achieve both of those things. It's not just getting a lot more people riding. We need to take care of the people that are already riding and be making those choices for years and making sure they can do so safely. Yes, it's a, yeah. I think it's a both and. Yeah, great. Yeah. Thanks. Mayor Iveson. Um I think this is, uh, this is very good work. Uh, the, um, would we expect then to see an annual report sort of like Calgary's? That's the objective, yes. Sorry? That's that the is objective. the objective, okay. yeah. And um, you'll produce that within existing resources. You're collecting a lot of this data anyway as part of the ongoing evaluation. Yes. The, the household travel survey is going to periodically give us much richer information every few years, however often we do that. Even the census gives us a little bit more information every few years. That's yeah, in, in the attachment to, um, I, I attempted to note where our source of the data would be coming from for yeah. the annual report. And so a lot of that is already in place. Um, some of it, as you mentioned, the household travel survey is more intermittent than the other uh, data sources. But On yes. the federal census too, and there's even the city census, yeah. intermittent. But, but there'll be other things. You'll have something to report, I guess, every year because if you're doing these uh, five sectors um, review, do you have a sector map or are they the same sectors that Roadways uses? Or Roadways uses, uh, they have more resources. They, they balance it, it's quadrants. Uh, they're balanced with the number of traffic signals. So we have a, a very preliminary map for the sectors, but we need to refine it based on the, the length of bike uh, network within each sector to try to balance it so we can... Uh, so that's under development? Change. Yes. But would the core be its own sector? That, that was what we had sketched out, was okay. that the core would be a, uh, its own sector. I think that makes sense because there's very different, as we discussed at length, there's very different considerations in there and our objectives are, are uh, well, the same, but maybe uh, we may go about them a little either more ambitiously in terms of the quality of facilities Council is deemed uh, worthy of, of uh, putting in. So I think that may need to be evaluated separately, which, okay, that's reassuring. In terms of the... the, the um, those sector reviews, um, the it's it's hard to say, it's hard hard to determine um, how involved that would be, and as a result, how much of a resource obligation there would be for the city in in doing that. I think we should be doing it. I guess the question is, how does that fit into your the resources in your area, and and does that create any challenges for other work that you can't do because you're because I don't see a budget ask unless something's actually recommended to physically change in one of these. So I'm seeing that you would do this within your existing resources. Sure. Um, one of the places we're trying to go, Mayor Iveson, is um, to get away from a reactionary, um, reaction, on a reaction basis, diving in and looking at, at different routes and cycles. Which and uses areas, resources today. And, and moving towards a more program, systematic approach to an annual review. So we've had a number of, you know, I think there's four, four bike uh, reports and inquiries in this, this agenda. We've had about probably half a dozen in the last 12 months. We're trying to shift all those resources to a, a program, cyclical, annual, systematic review that we can table and have a conversation with the committee. And that'll be easier for you to organize your, muster your resources to... Uh, Infinitely to easier, kind of yes. Okay, and then this way every, every route gets looked at every five years? Okay. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. Okay, thank you very much. And it, a little bit, I need to talk about a little bit about your methodology and kind of the way you're thinking about how to do some of these measurements. Because uh, you heard the earlier comment I read to the previous speaker, concerns about bias and unrealistic program objectives. And of course, I, I, we want to build support and we want, we want people to buy into this, into this kind of program. But it has to have some sort of substantive rationale and which needs to be based on facts so you know um, when you're doing your counts it's about frequency it's about time of day it's about uh, is the numbers going to be seasonally adjusted and measured that way because I noticed in the Calgary report for example they don't talk about seasonal seasonally adjusted numbers uh, but the highest use in the Calgary report was on the pathways and the park system and not necessarily the roads in terms of usage so, and so that kind of gets to the um, question I ask. Here's a question I, I wanted to ask about later on. You said there were 84 people on 97th Street. Uh, 
how did you determine them? Is that 84 a unique rider? And if so, how did you determine that? They're counted the exact same way as we count cars. So every bike that passes the camera gets counted. Okay, um, so it's not necessary. You see, this is an important distinction of whether we're, we're, we're growing in certain directions or not, because we could be growing in frequency of a particular one rider, as opposed to cutting that number in half and saying there are two riders. Do you follow my, my, my meaning on the statistic? Yeah, it's the way we count it is exactly the same as the way we count vehicle traffic. Yeah, but okay, but what I am what I'm getting towards Councillor Henderson's point is right. If it is about the question of are we getting to the objective, right, and a meaningful objective is a unique point data point as opposed to the data point repeating itself back from back and forth. Do you follow? If not, we can do this later offline. I can explain to you my thinking on that. I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. Our methodology Good. is to count exactly Good. the way we count because vehicles. At, because at one point, and you're, you, you've heard it from several people, and we've heard it, I've heard it in my constituency, uh, very, very loud and clear, right? Some work, some don't. So w what in terms of, uh, you know, this is about putting lanes in. Where do we start talking about where some lanes are not working and what kind of metrics and, or, or what, what's going to be the cutoff to suggest, nah, this, this isn't uh, where it should be? In our review of the cities across North America, we are all pretty much in the same spot. We are building out a connected network of bike routes. It's sort of like um, a transit. You know, our transit network is a fully established network. At that point, we can evaluate a link, uh, a, you know, a route by route specific basis because it has other connections that it can get to. So if that route isn't carrying the load or the, meeting our expectations, we could either redesign that route or relocate that route or remove that route. At, the, at our current state of our bicycle network, we don't have a connected network that allows for that evaluation because it may not be connected to the other routes that were part of the bicycle plan. Fair enough, but so we will have a, we will have a, a what we would call the magic cutoff point, whether it's going to stay, change, or go. That eventually has to be built, does it not? That could be something once we build out the, the bike network and our current rate of construction, we're talking 25, 30, 40 years until we get to that point. Yeah, and well, here becomes my problem is, is that, for example, on my particular case, you've, you've heard the business impacts. I don't think they can wait five years. And how should I approach that situation if we go up and down that street? And I'm sure if we did that, if I took you with me, and I'm happy to do that, uh, they could give you the, the, because I don't see a financial indicator or financial in impact assessment uh, as part of your criteria in any of the documentation, which kind of concerns me because we take away parking or it has a negative effect, right, in certain areas. I'm not saying all areas, but very certainly in commercial and industrial zones. I think there, there's a different question there. There are, um, New York City has a, has a great report that they've created, it's, um, I can't remember the exact title, um, it, was, it was about implementing their Complete Streets program and they identified a, a number of corridors that we, they wanted to collect statistics on before and after statistics and some of the statistics they included were things like you're talking about, about retail sales, about the, the value of land, uh, lease rates, that type of thing, um, but they, they broke it down into a very specific number of corridors that they could look at. And yeah, I would, I would not to, suggest doing it citywide I, yeah. Yeah, because it would, like, like our earlier speaker said, it can get cumbersome, costly, and time consuming and take you off track, so to speak. Yeah. But, um, uh, Councillor, see, that's what happens when it gets talking about statistics. Every um, <laughs> business retail sales are being measured in other cities. Um, the impact of bike lanes on on, on retail districts. It's it's uh, not specific to bike lanes. I wouldn't say okay. it's it's more predominantly about complete streets programs. Okay. So it's bike lanes may be a part of that um, as part of that that defining a complete network. So New York New York a lot of the, their projects did have a bicycle component to it, but it also included the creation of plazas and more public space. And I'm not at all contradicting uh, Councillor Nichols' viewpoint here because it's different if it's industrial 
light commercial or light industrial commercial is different than a retail hospitality district. But there's been a considerable number of studies to show that bike lanes can be a positive impact on retail areas. Yes, there are, there are more, and those, more and more of those reports coming out. Um, we do have a meeting with the University of Alberta to look into a research program, uh, a longitudinal study looking at that type of thing. Um, I believe that meeting is next week. 102 Avenue bike lane uh, has, uh, will feed into a, a number of retail areas, so that would be interesting to know, and there's been some concern about the impact, as you know, and you and I have discussed offline. Um, so we're not going to measure that, but are, in measuring satisfaction, we're going to measure satisfaction. Yes, we, we were thinking of using a telephone survey like we have in the past to understand people's preferences and, and their satisfaction with the bicycle network or the bicycle program or city services in general. So we wouldn't target the communities in and around a new bike lane. I believe that uh, for the two major projects that Council has funded, we do need to have a monitoring program established for those. I think you've committed uh, a significant amount of money to invest in something that's quite meaningful, and I think we need to be evaluating that. So that's part of the discussion with the University of Alberta is to try to get a baseline for some of those metrics. Yeah, I think there's some hard uh, metrics. Uh, again, Councillor Nickel has gone through a lot of those, but it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think vehicle speeds along 102 would be interesting to know too, and, and 83rd Ave, uh, see if there's a, a, a reduction. And, and, and I think there will be a positive impact on retail uh, and hospitality, and maybe on community too, on the feel of the community. So I don't know how we measure those things. You know, I think it could be very positive in some neighborhoods when you run a bike lane through it that there could be. Uh, advantages that people didn't think of ahead of time and change the feel of the place. Those aren't hard metrics though, but uh, any other questions? Seeing none. Do we uh, need a report, uh, move for information on this one and then yeah. this, uh, we'll start to see these reports. I guess one would be the first time sometime next year? We'd be, yeah, we'd be looking at producing one for next year. That's good. All those in favor? Oh no, you're chairing. What, uh, uh, yes. You have made that, uh, uh, the mayor has moved receipt of information. All in favor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're throwing your weight around. <laughs> uh, Force of habit. Yeah. Force of habit. Thank you, Mr. Golly. We're now on 6.4. Alternative bike lanes for 95th Avenue. Like what did you say? What is going on, eh? I told you. I warned you. Warned you to start. Mr. Golly, you're up again? Thank you. Good, good to see you. <laughs> no, no, I'm leaving for that one. The rest of these, I'm here. There's a bike lane on that bridge one day. <laughs> there will be, yeah. Maybe. I'm going to excuse myself from that one. Um, so this, this report and presentation is in response to a motion uh, made by Councillor Anderson on behalf of Councillor Knack, I believe was how it, how it went, uh, regarding looking at 95th Avenue and relocating the 95th Avenue bike lanes that were installed uh, in 2013 to the service roads. So 95th Avenue uh, bike route was installed in 2013. It's an eight-kilometer route, runs from 142nd Street to 189th Street. Uh, and we... It was part of the, uh, the safety and operational reviews that were evaluated and reported to, to committee in October of last year. The, um, when we looked at it, the, uh, the motion was, was uh, quite broad to look at relocation to service roads along the entire corridor. So um, really the only, the only portion of that route that had continuous um, service roads was between 156th Street and 163rd Street. Outside of that, there was intermittent uh, service roads or non-existent service roads. So that is the area that we uh, completed our review on. The cross-section for 95th Avenue before we installed the bike route um, was the top picture there. It was a four-lane roadway with service roads, with parking on the service roads. Um, and technically parking on 95th Avenue as well, it wasn't prohibited. So um, with the bike lane, we formally prohibited that parking on 95th Avenue. Um, and we converted it into a three-lane cross-section with a turn lane, a left turn lane in the middle, um, and service roads obviously staying on the side with parking. When we looked at the feasibility of shifting the bike route uh, between 156th Street and 163rd Street to the service roads, what that 
cross section would look like would be uh, going, getting back to the four lane cross section that we had before and we would be installing sharrows um, in the service roads. In more of a plan view, not just cross section, um, the red dashed lines would be the, the shared use lanes that we'd be installing in the service roads. Uh, we would need, in order to transition cyclists onto and out of these service roads, we would need to, to construct a ser shared use paths uh, that are noted in green, yeah, they show up okay, um, west of 163rd Street and before and after 156th Street. We would also be looking at intersection upgrades at 163rd Street, 95th Avenue, and 156th Street, 95th Avenue, as well as a, a little bit of grind and overlay to remove a median and, uh, and redo that intersection at 163rd Street. So the cost of this work um, is estimated at fairly high level, um, $1.1 million. So the outcomes of that would, would see a redesigned intersection on 163rd Street to a more simple radius, not the right turn cutoffs, which should uh, improve sight lines and reduce turning speeds. Um, there would be marginal improvements to the vehicle level service through this corridor by shifting the cyclists to the service roads. They'd need, need to stop at all the stop signs along the service roads, so it, it would increase the delay for the cyclists. Um, and there's actually, if you count the number of conflict points by placing the cyclists in the service roads, there's an increase in the number of cyclist uh, conflict points that they need to navigate. Um, in addition, there's a shared use path transition zones that they would now have to navigate, and the shared use path width, um, based on the available room, would be a substandard to what we would typically like to provide. So in summary, you know, the operational safety review that was completed in 2014 did not identify any significant safety issues. Um, the relocation would slightly improve vehicle operations, um, but may or may not improve the safety for cyclists. The cost is fairly significant, and we would recommend doing public consultation uh, of some sort would be required. So we're not recommending the relocation due to the cost, the limited benefits, and it's only um, changing the route or addressing the, the concerns for that one segment of the eight kilometers. Um, so our next steps would be to to implement the operational safety improvements that were identified in that review last year, which included a signal timing change at 163rd Street, some pavement marking changes, and some geometric changes. The budget for that is allocated in the active transportation budget and comes in at around $45,000. Thank you very much. Um, and we do have a speaker, Ms. Solas again. I'll ask you to step back, Mr. Gully. Uh, 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 I have I have Mr. Chan on. Okay, okay. Did I, did I... Yeah, yeah. You're right. Sorry. I also have Bruce Robertson on this as well. Mr. Chair, I know he had to leave, and um, if he comes back, we can let you know. Thank you. Ms. Solas, would you like to start, please? Yes, good afternoon again. Um, really, I um, signed up for all the items because I had sort of one thing to say, and I didn't know how you were going to package the four items. Um, no, I, I, I had something to say about performance measures, and I had something else to say about the other, other three. And I think that um, what you're seeing here, what I'm seeing as I, as I read this uh, that I wanted to convey to you is... Um, there are three items on how to accommodate cycling in various ways and on various routes, uh, sort of an after an ex post facto or something uh, situation. Um, and to me, it indicates how important it is to consult early and often sort of what the new approach that uh, you've been taking recently with the, uh, the two routes that are under uh, consideration right now and also how uh, the application of the Complete Streets program and, how, and the type of cycling infrastructure. Uh, I think the three, the three things are sort of, are, are very uh, interrelated here because before the, your recent shift in how you're approaching this and before those Complete Streets um, guidelines, um, it seemed like there was a citywide pilot, only it wasn't called a pilot. No wonder you're so interested in pilots now because you went to a citywide implementation of something that kind of fell flat on its 
uh, not totally flat on its face. It did some good things, but it also um, pointed out some uh, some things where improvement uh, was needed. And I, I just wanted to um, mention the experience that some of you uh, are aware of, because I was involved uh, with Central Area Council of Community Leagues when the uh, routes, uh, way back when the, the um, bike plan was first um, first developed, we even had um, someone come and make a presentation uh, to us, ask, ask questions and all of that. And it was all good, and, but the routes hadn't been selected at that time. Then the next thing we knew, some of the communities got a notice, oh, lanes are going in. And we were just absolutely incensed that here was bike, a bike-friendly area of town, and we hadn't even been consulted about the routes or how they would work or anything like that. Poor Audra had to, uh, it wasn't personal, Audra, <laughs> had to bear the brunt of our, our fury. <laughs> and, and I think the, um, this council's recent change in the way you're approaching uh, uh, the development of routes is, uh, is uh, um, you know, you've learned, you're not doing the same thing over and over. Um, <coughs> anyway, to, to, uh, the, to us, it's um, important, you know, it's very important, and I think that bike routes and pro bike projects can benefit from that local knowledge. People actually use the streets in, in all the various ways they are used. And uh, through the, our, the efforts of our counselors at the time, uh, Henderson and, and Iveson, we were able to have a little bit of input at the um, sort of at the at the very end uh, to to help those that situation. But I've, I've got to say that on 76 and 106, I see as many people cycling on the sidewalks as on the lanes. Um, the um, there's some uh, a cyclist from Leduc who cycles into town regularly, um, comes up 106th Street, as soon as he gets north of uh, 51st, he's on the sidewalk. He stays on the lanes, because it's plenty wide. This, and this is not a cyclist who, you know, this is a fearless cyclist, and who uh, hops over to the, the sidewalk when he gets uh, north of 51st, when uh, the, road, the road narrows there, and the lanes narrow, and it's, uh, uh, it's not as comfortable. A cycling thing, and uh, what we're seeing there, as you as you know, through the uh, efforts of the QA Crossroads Group, the city is look, re looking at that both of those routes again, um, just a few years after they were put in, because something uh, something else is uh, is needed there. Um, and I regularly, um, because I'm in that area, I've regularly seen, uh, as I say, more people on the more people on the, the sidewalks than on the than on the lanes. And for various reasons, some of it's traffic, but some of it's condition, you know, gravel in the, in the lanes, uh, potholes, and, and so forth. Um, so some of it, it isn't all just uh, a matter of does it fit or not, it's, it's other, it's maintenance issues as well. Um, in, a, it, in an ideal world, we'd have, you know, buffered or cycle tracks or something everywhere, and that, that's just not feasible. Um, in Edmonton, or if it is, then there are other pinch points. You know, there's parking. You know, parking will be removed. Um, one way, one way streets will come in. You know, so it's you know it's that balance. But I think that it's important to have that discussion with everybody, and, and might come up with something that's that's workable instead of you know taking a look at one one piece or one stretch and another stretch. So let's. Yeah. Am I approaching your five? five? Is up. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, no need to say sorry, but. I have to cut you off. Thank you, Mr. Chan. Thank you, Council. Uh, so there are two aspects of, of this 95th Ave route. One is addressing, addressing traffic operations um, and, and the concerns around, around traffic flow. And then the other is the, the bike safety concerns. And I think uh, looking at the results of the report, uh, you know, with words like limited benefit, marginal, and, and substandard uh, in terms of what you get out of making the changes, uh, the potential changes, I think uh, both of those things, the traffic operations as well as the bike safety concerns, um, are more about perceptions than, than actual uh, quantifiable changes that you're gonna, that you're gonna get. Uh, so just looking at the 
cost benefits and the looking at those technical, looking at it from the technical standpoint. I think the recommendation that um, those intersection changes happen, uh, the timing, uh, if timing needs to be changed at signals as well as the, the geometry and the, the structure of those intersections, uh, I think those should go ahead and, and hopefully that will address, um, help address uh, whatever traffic operation issues and safety issues there, there are actually. And if that's enough to address those concerns and make, make residents and, and users of that roadway happy, then I think that would be, that would be wonderful for everyone involved. And that remaining half million dollars could be spent on widening Saskatchewan Drive shared use path or building a, a, a shared use path along the Strathcona Streetcar right of way or building a shared use path along the Royal Gardens uh, utility corridor. Um, or finishing missing sidewalk links for transit uh, and, and improving accessibility in other areas that I think sh really should be higher priority for the city. As someone with an engineering background who advocates for reasonable, rational, evidence-based decisions, it's hard to, to look at something and, and look at the, the non-rational, non-technical non aspects of something uh, and, and the factors, those kind of non-rational factors that might justify spending this kind of money on a change that really has very little functional uh, effect. But if that's the position, if that's the choice that, that council feels it needs to take to buy back the political capital, um, to support really improving bike infrastructure across the city and making the city a better place to live for everyone. Um, you know, if this is, you know, one step sideways, I guess, uh, uh, to, to make steps forward in the future. Um, I, think, I think the change to move this into the service road and, the, and having more conflict points, having the shared use path, it's, it's not necessarily preferable um, from a functional standpoint, but I think, I think at the same time, it won't greatly negative, imp negatively impact cycling access along that route. Um, probably it won't have dramatic changes in, in terms of safety either. Uh, so uh, we, would, we would prefer that the intersection changes uh, be made those kinds of shifts be, it, uh, be done uh, and take a look at how, how it affects traffic operations, how it affects safety. Uh, and if that's not enough, then, then we would not be strongly opposed to, to shifting this, this bike lane into the service road. Thank you very much. Councillor Henderson. Well, Mr. Chan, I'm curious about something because I, mean, I must say I'm attracted to this idea for a different reason, understanding there's trade-offs. You know, we have heard loud and clear uh, that sep actually creating separation between where the bikes are and where the traffic, because I actually don't think it makes any sense to do this from a traffic point of view. I think it's not going to change anything. And having, I, but, I, but the idea of creating better links so the bikes wouldn't have to travel with the traffic and could have that physical separation, which is essentially what you get by going to the service roads, does seem to me to be attractive. So. Um, and I think all you'd really need to be changing is, is, is what was happening to allow them to, to allow at the end of the service lane to get back out onto the, onto the existing bike lane. And I, so I guess uh, I'm curious to know what your thinking is about that because essentially what you're doing is you're getting this, you get the thing with existing infrastructure that we have just by creating some connections at either ends of actually allowing for that physical separation between the higher speed traffic and, and the bicycle. And that's what was attractive to me in this, and I would like to hear your thinking on that. I would agree that, that definitely that greater separation is preferable, and certainly in terms of the perception of safety, people will feel better cycling on that service road. I think it comes down to the, the cost benefit again. So um, people who don't feel comfortable right now on 95th Ave uh, in that bike lane are taking that service road. Uh, I think that's, that's clear. Um, so is it worth the $500,000 to, to formalize that? Uh, the people that are happy biking in the bike lane along that, that uh, several block stretch right now um, 
do appreciate having it, uh, and it is it is you know more direct and and in in many ways actually safer, if not if not necessarily in perception, um, just because of the reduction in conflict points. So, I think that's why yeah, in some ways, uh, that service road is preferable, but it's not necessarily worth the cost for such a you know it's just a segment as well of this route, so it doesn't even address the people who want to bike in that. Uh, service road and aren't anyway. going to feel comfortable, yeah. they still don't have any place to go on uh, at either end. Right. So um, so the, the conflict point concern, I'm guessing, just to check this with you, is the same concern that people biking on the sidewalks feel safer but actually aren't because the car doesn't expect them to be Correct. coming off that sidewalk at the speed that they are. And the same concern would exist in the service roads at the turnoffs. That's the concern, right? Correct. Most bike car collisions happen at intersections, and there are more intersections, uh, driveways, et cetera. Well, those intersections, I mean, the bike is going through the intersection either way. It's still going through the same intersection, but it's going through in a place where you expect it to be rather than where you don't expect it to be, correct? Correct. Okay. And, and theoretically, the bike would have a yield or a stop sign or something like that, which it might or might not pay attention to is the problem, which is not an issue if it's traveling with the flow of traffic on the main road. It, it, uh, putting bikes onto the side takes them out of the field of view of, of drivers. Yeah. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, years ago, in learning a little bit about bike safety, I was, it was said to me that if you're riding along beside parked cars, and then you have quite a stretch where there's no parked cars, and then you have parked cars again, you stay on a consistent line. That, that offered the best safety. You were consistent, you were predictable. And I just wonder if there's an element of that here in that we're having bikes going along a bike lane and then we're allowing them to go off and then they're going to come back in again. And if there's really, and I, and I hear you about all those conflicts, having ridden service roads, I know all about those. And there's a perception issue here, but the reality is it's probably no safer. In fact, it may be less safe to send cyclists onto a service road. Certainly, if you're if you're being visible and predictable, and you have that, you're able to communicate with other drivers, um, and you're just biking down a straight line, you'll be very safe. Very few drivers are going to to collide with you. Everyone coming up behind you can see you. They can predict what you're going to do. They may not like seeing you there, um, but they know what's happening. If you're disappearing off to the side and then popping back into the roadway. Um, intermittently, it becomes much more difficult as a driver to safely interact with that and to predict what's going to happen. Let me ask you this question this way too. I think we're in the midst, the early, early days of a, of a culture change. And, and, and I wonder if we, your advice, do we stick to our guns here on this culture change knowing that we're going to get some backlash? Or do we bend over backwards to reduce um, impact on drivers from cycle lanes? A little bit hoping to leave that to you. Um, I asked your advice. <laughs> it certainly is a, you know, it, it really depends on, on, on not technical considerations, but really it's coming down to emotions and, and those kinds of uh, political considerations of is it is it worth um, fighting for this and is or conversely is it worth spending that extra half million dollars to to make really marginal changes um, certainly from a technical technical standpoint it, I it's better to leave this as is and spend that money on other priorities you know maybe not even maybe not even um, cycling priorities, but just, you know, making for active transportation, making the city a better place rather than uh, running around in circles. Thank you. Any, did you want to add anything, Ms. Soares? Uh, I would, um, especially, uh, specifically about 95th. About 95th. Yeah. I'm with Chris on that. I don't think you're going to get a whole lot out of spending more money other than the, the intersection improvements that uh, are called for, uh, the, the review called for. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd get more out of that money spent elsewhere. 
you might buy a little bit of goodwill might. From, from the motorists. Yeah. Yeah. But then, you know, when the change came, the cyclists might not, um, and, and the traffic might not feel a difference or see a difference. Right. Okay. Yes, uh, Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I think, you know, the challenge as we talk about this is that there were a couple different approaches we could take, right? These came in September 2013 after, unfortunately, not the greatest public consultation in the world, this particular on 95th Ave. We held the open house at Metal Art Community League. I was there because that was my role at the time. And by the end of that consultation, we saw about five people in the West End provide consultation. So when they got painted and brought in, as you can imagine, there was a lot of uproar because you know, people didn't come out. We did give them a chance, but people didn't come out. And I heard over and over and over again, uh, including from, I would say, a number of the 25 cyclists that use that at most per day, um, that this wasn't the best way to go in terms of the painted lines. And I think we've recognized that now we've made that change in terms of focusing on higher quality infrastructure, 102nd, 83rd. So I went about looking at this in two different routes. We could, I could come back and if I was trying to represent the majority of constituents, we could say, well, let's just remove them all in the meantime and then come back and rebuild it all to that higher quality standard. But in the meantime, have nothing. The approach here, because ideally, if we're going to build bike lanes, on, and, and Mr. Chen, you would probably have the best knowledge on it, using it as well, but everything west of 149th Street, if we were going to build high quality infrastructure, um, most of that route would have separated infrastructure. And that would be ideal for all of us, right? I mean, correct? It would be better to have separated infrastructure all along 95th Ave from 149th to 189th. The versus traffic, the painted lines. The traffic volumes would certainly justify that. Yeah. Absolutely, right. And this, so I guess I want to ask you the question because you're talking a little bit about perception is that instead of waiting, you know, four or five years and continue to sort of foster some of the, the negativity that's been around this, we have an opportunity to make one upgrade along the entire route because if we were to make the change, we would likely use where we're talking about using right now. Um, so that's why I guess I wanted to get your take on, on is it worthwhile to, to take a baby step towards getting it to the ideal situation versus leaving it status quo now and having that perception issue and having that negativity that's continued to, to sort of exist? I think there's two, two aspects to that. One, this would be an opportunity to, opportunity to re-engage with the, with the people in the area and the people that use that roadway about, about this design and about the, the bike route along 95th Ave. Um, before really jumping ahead and spending money on, on, on piecemeal uh, changes, I, I think it would be prudent to, to look at that whole stretch if that's, if that's the end goal uh, to, to improve all of it, I think. I think to make sure that changing this is going to connect well with any future changes would be would be important. Yeah, and I will ask that question, but I have a pretty good feeling that, that this would in fact make a really good connection to a future upgraded 95th Avenue, which could actually be the best of all worlds. Great for drivers, great for people to bike, great for pedestrians, sort of a win-win-win for everyone. So, Okay, no, I just wanted to ask this question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Further questions? Thanks so much for your presentations. Mr. Golly. Hot seat again. Count, uh, we'll go with Mayor Iveson first. So the uh, safety and operational improvements identified, did you say at the end of your presentation what those would cost? What they would cost? Yeah. Yeah, 45000 45000 And so that's precisely the kind of thing that I think we did imagine the active transportation budget would, would provide for, is that if there were some things that we learned out of these safety reviews, operational reviews, that there'd be dollars to, to, to do them. And in the, uh, so, so can you give me a sense of tangibly what might change after if you go ahead and do those? Yes. Um, they're sort of towards the back end of the report, but uh, we worked with operations to look at uh, additional uh, green time for the east-west uh, movements along 95th Avenue at 163rd Street. Um, 
through the, re the safety review, vehicles were encroaching into the westbound bike lane at 163rd Street, so we'd be looking at a geometric uh, improvement at that location. And then at conflict points where vehicle, uh, vehicle movements would be crossing the bike lanes, we'd be looking at adding pavement markings and uh, signage to um, highlight those, those conflict zones. A little zones. clarification around the yeah. conflict there. Where's the, because um, uh, it talks about in the, in the options here, if we were to do the, the whole, the, the full meal deal, grind and overlay required in the intersection. That's, is that to change pavement markings or, uh, or would we be into geometry modifications in a big way at 163rd Street as well? It's predominantly to reconstruct the intersection and make sure that the pavement grades all work. Okay. Now, w do you have any idea where those, uh, either of those roads are, that intersection is from a life cycle point of view when we might be able to pick up some of that work as part of rehab? I happen to have a map. Um, 163rd Street, there's nothing planned for the foreseeable future. Portions of 95th Avenue are scheduled for uh, 2015, I believe, but much further west. And then uh, 170th, 178th is, is looking like it's uh, 2019 scheduled right now. Okay, so we're not, we're not looking at... Because if we were in there anyway and we could piggyback and that's the most expensive piece, that would be one thing. But if we're a few years out from touch in that intersection otherwise then uh, I tend to concur with the speaker's suggestion that the cost of that uh, just to prove the point might not be worth it but uh, um, okay uh, those are the questions I had thank you Councillor Dack just to clarify though actually the work that is going to happen on 95th Ave goes from 170th to 165th Street that's happening this year so we're actually only two blocks away from where we're talking about just to be I just wanted to clear that up you can, I've got it on my email so I just wanted to make sure we had clear information that we're yeah. yes you are correct yes there is some work going from 165th to 178th yeah, should just have printed wanted, the map a little bit larger. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, no problem. I just wanted to make sure we had that as we're as we're going through the discussion here. So, um, I guess first I want to talk about a little bit more about the intersect. Not the forty-five thousand, but the the larger intersection improvements that was that were being discussed in the report at one sixty-third Street. Um, and there was a note in the in the report saying that regardless of whether or not we changed the bike lanes, there would be value, or at least it's something that we could do. And something we would likely do, from what from what I understand, we wouldn't design intersections like that. It, we wouldn't want to have that sort of right out turn, so you can uh, have that high speed exits, right? So I mean, ideally, this this would be a standard upgrade that would at some point be on our list for for upgrades, anyways, right? Um, that's correct. We those are usually driven, I believe, by uh, by uh, vehicle collisions, mm -hmm. rear ending that sort of thing. So we have a prioritized list and and get it that way. Perfect. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's a fairly high volume. Um, pedestrian intersection because we have the two high schools uh, along 163rd and they always cross 95th Ave uh, at lunch and after school every day onto that so it's your both JP and St. FX are uh, pretty high volume pieces there so I'm not sure how I don't know if we have that information on hand how soon do we think that would be done anyway forgetting any bike lane conversation do we know offhand how far out we'd be for that I don't know, but I, Mr. Seabrook's in the back, and he might have a better sure. idea. Uh, Councillor Knack, at this point, we've got um, some prioritized locations. However, uh, as a part of the rollout of the road safety strategy, we'd be identifying uh, the programs that would be required to fund that. And at, at this point, there's nothing uh, in terms of a definite timeline, certainly nothing in 2016 or 15. Okay, no, that's fair. Um, when we've been measuring ridership on 95th Avenue, we never measured ridership on the service roads. It was always exclusively on the lanes, correct? That's my understanding. Yeah, I believe we have some... Uh, my understanding is we've, we've predominantly looked at the, the street. And we have um, at other locations, and I, I don't have this count with me, uh, we have looked at um, the ridership as well on the sidewalk as well as on the on-street facility to, to track how that changes over time. Um, we may have ridership on, on the service roads. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry. And, and, no, that's okay. I was just curious. Um, 
part of the conversation we were having is that you know, if, if, we had, if we were in the ideal world, tomorrow we had unlimited budget and we were starting from scratch on 95th Avenue, we wouldn't have done what's currently there, right? We would be um, from 149th all the way west, we would either be making large multi-use trails, um, cycle tracks. We, most of 95th Ave, unlike the other parts of the city, is actually wide enough to support both lanes of traffic in each direction as well as a larger uh, multi-use trail. The only stretch that might not fit in that category is 149th to 156th, which we're not talking about today. But for the sake of the discussion, between service roads and large boulevards, we would actually design something separated, not unlike what we're doing in 102nd Ave, right? Yeah, you know, I think if you look at the network and the way it's designed, um, 95th Avenue is a very important east-west yep. link through West Edmonton, and it ties into the 102nd Avenue route. So that's, you know, if you're thinking West LRT, this is the West Bikeway. Yeah, really important corridor for for sure. cycling, and and I am, I, I freely proclaim, I am the one of the 25 that use that every day, right? Um, so I see it in a very important piece, and, and I, I guess I wanted to go just again to sort of that safety conversation too, because. The whole reason I took it in the first place, June of last year, was because I was approached by a number of constituents who wanted to go on a ride with me and wanted me to experience it firsthand. Had I not gone with that group, I still never to this day would have been on that bike lane. And for perception reasons, I just, it didn't feel safe to me. So if this is the, the starting point to help people, this is, this is what I'm, I guess I'm trying to find out, is that this work to me is, is the start of what we would do in the larger scale of improving 95th Ave, this would be able to tie into a future upgrade on 95th Ave, the conversation and the, the work that we're, that we're proposing or that could be proposed today. I, I think it could. I, I believe um, we, we need to do more design work on this. Um, so through that design work, I think we would need to purposefully make sure that the redesign of the intersection, for instance, at 163rd, would be able to accommodate Absolutely. a couple different options uh, of facilities to continue further west. Yeah. I'm out of time, but I'll need another round, please. Thank you, Councillor. Any other? Hmm? Councillor Knack. So one of the things I was considering that I that I would like committee to consider today is uh, moving forward with this work because if if the plan is, and you would obviously do more detailed design, but that work at 163rd would in fact take into account future upgrades to 95th Avenue. So my only concern is that obviously with a limited active transportation budget, um, I, I don't want to be using 1.1 million of, of an already limited $20 million. Um, so I, I guess Mr. Wanzura, I was going to ask the question, we, the intersection work that would happen at 163rd Street and 95th Avenue, um, not the 45,000 we were talking about, but the overall intersection upgrades, if we weren't having this bike lane conversation and it was on the books for this year, it wouldn't be coming out of active transportation, correct? Um, so if we were having this conversation, well, if we were re, if you, if the, the decision of committee and council was to re, re, redesign for the tune of $1.1 million, is that what you're asking me? I, I'm just forgetting the bike lane conversation. If there were work scheduled at 163rd and 95th Street solely for improvements to the intersection, that wouldn't be coming out of active transportation. That's about five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars of the of the one point one million. Right. If there was, a, if we had an existing program that was dealing with um, the condition of the road, the quality, the geometry around the, the right turn cutoffs, and we had a program that was where that was in the in the priority queue, yes, we would be dry, we'd be addressing that under under whatever program that happened to be. Mm -hmm. If there's tie into active transportation, we'd be making sure there's coordination, but but it would be funded out of a, a dedicated program. And the reason I ask this question, because I know that in the past, when, when the lines have been painted, uh, when this happened in September 2013, I mean, we were paying money out of active transportation's budget for painting of lines, which one might argue wasn't what, you know, our, I don't know if that was our, you know, I look at our most recent budget in active transportation, our goal is to build multi-use trails, sidewalks, curb cut extensions, um, not painting of lines. And so why I bring this all up is that I think there's work that needs, there's work that's going to happen at some point anyways on 163rd Street. The work that's, that could be done on the bike lane would be able to tie into a future upgrade at a later capital budget cycle. Um, and I just want to make sure that, that work is being distributed appropriately between the departments that should be paying for it. I, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. And, and, and just as, as an editorial comment, though, if you're looking for how to, 
if you're looking for options to fund something, if you choose to do it, uh, you know, council strikes the budget, they appropriate money to certain programs, it's entirely within council's authority to, to direct that monies be moved from here to there or to meet your meet the needs of the day. So I, I just my, my advice would be don't be don't be uh, sort of constrained by what current funding envelopes we have if you really would like to do something different. Um, so I, I'm gonna pass that along as something I, I would like to consider, which is that the work actually, something along the lines, and I don't know what the final, you know, final wording would be, but the, the work is listed in attachments one and two to move the 95th Avenue bike route uh, to be approved with the 163rd Street intersection work to be paid for out of the appropriate department's budget and then the remainder of the work coming out of active transportation. Um, that's a suggestion. That's obviously up to committee if they want to put that in motion forward. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was with regards to just the, con the conversation about consultation. And since these have been implemented, I guess I'm, I'm curious, has there been any city-specific consultation on 95th Avenue, on, on how it is, on people's thoughts? We do, uh, from time to time, have surveys to reflect and, and gain appreciation for people's comments. Um, I believe there was a survey through the Insight community um, looking at satisfaction in general, mm -hmm. but uh, there has been nothing uh, targeted to 95th Avenue at this point. Okay, and, and, and that's, again, to the committee, part of why I bring up this, this suggestion, which is that I don't have a desire to see the bike lanes, to remove bike lanes from 95th Ave, period. Um, but I have, over the last year and a half, there's... There's one issue that has come up more than anything else, more than taxes, more than anything else in, in Ward 1, and that's the bike lanes. And there's still a level of frustration. And, uh, and again, not just from the drivers, that's the thing. I mean, we know through the stats there are at most 25 cyclists per day using that. I'm one of them, and I can probably name each of the other 24. Um, and just through interactions and getting to meet them. Uh, and I can say that even with the other 24 cyclists, there's not you know, an undying push to, to keep this the way as is. Um, they'd rather see high quality infrastructure, something that in the long term we develop something really nice and this gives us that opportunity to take one small step to addressing the entire network on 95th and maybe in a future capital budget doing something uh, to continue on in that work because I think there's a lot of benefit to connecting that network. So, um, so I wanted to bring it to the attention and uh, I'd appreciate the opportunity to whether, I don't know if this would have to go to council for approval or uh, if committee it's under committee's purview, but I'd like to have the opportunity to at least see a vote on it. Thank uh, you. Another time, thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Mayor Ibis. Well, my, my suggestion would be to bring a motion at council and, and that it be debated because it ultimately would have to go there for budget. I would not be, based on what we've heard, prepared to spend a million dollars to try to appease this situation because I think that unless we address the whole corridor, people are still going to be concerned about the next piece of 95th and the next piece of 95th and, and simply doing this one change, uh, I'm not sure really addresses the issue. If we were going to spend a million dollars on something and really talk to the community, then it should be the design work for the, for the proper facility that we might put down there over time. And we might not have the funding for that in this budget but we could work towards that in future budgets. I think that would be a more constructive and forward-looking approach than just, um, uh, you know, patching over this one issue of, of uh, 156 to 163rd uh, and introducing, as we've heard from, from a technical point of view, potentially more safety issues that way for, um, for minimal, uh, minimal payback in terms of uh, roadway performance and so so I haven't heard anything that that would I, I could I have absolutely heard enough to justify the 45,000 of upgrade work that uh, that they think is is warranted based on on the work and I trust that that will continue as it is but I would really encourage you to focus on design and the corridor rather than than this this one piece because I think a million dollars to move these routes uh, would be would be challenging but but really uh, you know any member of council can bring forward that motion at any time uh, at this point, my, my suggestion would be to receive this for information and then uh, think about options and then for council to debate it if you want to bring something forward. So, so. Uh, and I, uh, I concur um, and I appreciate your advocacy and uh, I think it's important that we do speak for communities and, and when, they, when you have a, a pinch point in a community 
political pinch points, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I agree with the mayor on his comments about the million dollars and how best to spend that million dollars. I am uh, interested, though, in, in if, we are, if we are changing intersections to hard right turns, uh, that that should not be on the active transportation. Was that part of your motion? Um, something that you could bring to council as well, though, I guess. Yeah. Well, and there, Go ahead. If, if I might add, I mean, if there is a, I think that's something we could either, is that, well, I guess, is that going to be addressed when the traffic safety strategy comes forward, or would it be useful to give direction to have that thought included in it so uh, that we don't create bike safety problems yeah. while we're trying to address traffic safety problems? So in, in the uh, traffic safety strategy, we do talk about uh, right turn redesigns and how it impacts both pedestrians and vehicle safety. So it also will uh, encompass uh, cycling safety. So it is um, one of the countermeasures that are included and identified in the road safety strategy. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor Ivesen, have you made that motion? I'll, I'll move that we receive this report for information. Thank you very much. But, you know, we should probably all hold on to it as reference for... Yeah. yeah. Okay. Please. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that. I'll, I'll definitely bring forward a motion and, and I'll try and bring forward some additional information. And the reason I've been bringing this specific piece up is that um, everything from 163rd to 182nd Street, which were the two higher volume traffic corridors of average car trips per day, uh, didn't lose any lanes of traffic. They have both lanes of traffic in each direction as well as the bike lane. This stretch has about 11,000 car trips per day, just below the stretch of 163rd to 170th. That's why I wanted to flag this. That's why through conversations with um, all of the communities abutting 95th Avenue, this has been the key focus point, the area where they feel absolutely needs to be addressed. There's actually not really any concern from 156 to 149th Street um, because it's really, it's a much different residential road design as is the case with everything west of 182nd Street to 189th. Your average car trips per day drop to 7,000 or lower. Um, so I actually, I'll bring forward the motion because I actually don't think this is a, is a piecemeal fix. This is something that actually will help address the long-term plan is that because when we do that next capital budget, uh, I think there's absolutely just cause to do a nice design on 95th Avenue. But uh, I want to make sure we actually have the public uh, on board understanding why we want to develop high quality cycling infrastructure. And unfortunately right now in, in all of these communities uh, they don't see it. Um, and again, uh, even as myself as somebody who's actively using that lane everyday cycling, um, it's not ideal for me. It's not really doing what we want it to, which is generate new ridership. I wouldn't have been on that lane had it not been for that group of individuals. So um, I'll bring forward that motion at the next council meeting because I, I do really think it's important that this work gets done to help, uh, help the public uh, continue to buy and actually generate higher ridership to accomplish the goals we want, to, we want to do as a city. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Uh, we have the motion received for information in front of us. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you very much. Um, 7.2? 7.1. Right. Oh, yeah, we didn't complete that. We're back on 7.1. We've heard from the speakers. Administration is back before us. Questions of administration? Not, not really. I think I just want to speak to it because we've, we've gone, we've done the runabout here. So. <laughs> I, uh, I have a question, but do you have a question, Councilor Newton? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. So what came up uh, in the fact of these businesses? So if, if we did a change of where the bike lane was on that particular stretch uh, to help this particular business, the businesses came in, is that going to upset anything or you have to do it the whole strip? Say you move it into the center of the road like you did on 40th Street up in my end of town and or something. So it gives the okay, curve I see, I see what you're saying, yeah. Um, you know, the upgraded, um, it was an inquiry, so we didn't, you know, we could only really report what we had. Um, so looking at that cross-section that we had 
proposed as a maybe possible upgrade. What you see in that is a, is a left turn bay and one lane of traffic in each direction and, and a bike lane. Um, I suppose you could maybe instead of having that left turn bay, use that as a parking uh, lane on one side of the street, um, similar to what an iteration of 189th Street maybe was, although obviously this is a straight street, not curvy. Um, but I think in order to look at that type of option, we'd need to do more analysis and, and, uh, and design work. So we've got leave as is, receives information and or move it to 91st Street and or what? Do well, the next steps for us would study? be, yeah, the next steps for us would be to complete this operational safety review to identify uh, and to do the work to look at what are the safety, the observed safety issues, to look at the traffic analysis, to assess the parking, and to look at design alternatives. Um, so that's the work that we're intending to do on 97th Street, that operational safety review, similar to what we did last year with 106th Street, 40th Avenue, and 95th Avenue. So if the biggest amount of population is, as the presenter, Mr. Fitzgerald, I guess it was, uh, said comes out of Mill Woods to go somewhere, would it not be that it would be better for 91st Street, that they're coming out of there, they're coming straight out of there uh, where the high population is, moving down towards 63rd Avenue and dispersing from there? It, it all depends on where your origin and destination are. I think if you're the, the person from Mill Woods that's biking to get to the university or downtown, um, 91st Street is probably the place you're going to go. If you work in the industrial area, um, using 97th Street is a preferred route because it actually gets you to that industrial area. So I think it depends on where people are coming from, where they're going to. Well, yeah, and I could throw it another way. What if you're coming out of Mill Woods and you're going to university? Is there an east and west that can actually take them farther over to 106th Street? I mean, it seems to be a concern about that the distance between 6th Street and 91st Street is such a big distance. Um, I just, I think that it, that you should be looking at this and should be looking at the fact of um, alternatives anyway. Yeah, and, and that's exactly what we did last year with the in-service uh, road safety reviews and operational reviews. For, um, for 40th Avenue, for instance, we looked at, I believe it was three, the, the current location as well as two alternative routes. So moving through that work, we, could, we can look at that in more detail and actually generate the reports and do the data analysis. Because when, I, when we get to mine 7.2, it's, it's a fact of how can we use something but a road. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Iveson. So, um, since this, er, the previous one was a motion and it directed you to, to, to do the kind of work that generated the, the report that we had with some more information in it, um, I wasn't quite clear. Next steps in, in your PowerPoint say to do a complete and in-road safety operation review and uh, changes will be guided by review findings. Will that happen anyway or would it be valuable to get direction from MIDI? from committee to take a look at that? I, I think that's going to happen regardless. Um, I mean, if committee wants to make a motion to, rec to direct us, that, that is fine. Uh, the intent, um, certainly depending, I mean, there's a lot of interest, I believe, with council and Councillor Nickel. Um, I would imagine that he, uh, the results of that review, even if it was just an identification of some minor upgrades that we could fund through the active transportation budget that wouldn't be a, a significant redesign, you'd probably still want that report to come to you. Um, so I, I would suggest that we would bring the report regardless, but if you want to make a motion to have that in the books and we will respond to that, that would be fine. Now, is the, um, I mean, the other issue that we've heard that I think is, is the most, creates the most hesitation is, particularly since this is a business area with a lot of goods movement and uh, truck movement, trailer movement in particular, and, and special loading and unloading considerations that, um, I mean, we, it may be reasonable to expect the businesses to have sufficient parking on site for their, uh, for their employees and for people coming and going, but loading and unloading, again, in a business area, a little bit different consideration than we've dealt with up to this point. So is the carriageway potentially wide enough at the risk of compromising all of the users if we try to cram too much in there, but is the carriageway wide enough to provide some uh, loading and unloading spaces around some of the uh, some of the businesses that have been affected. We heard about an electrical business that has contractors having challenges loading and unloading, for example. 
I think that I can't tell you right now. I think that's the type of work that we'd have to look at is are there opportunities to provide um, dro drop off zones or loading zones or, or some sort of uh, facility maybe within some of the boulevard space. I mean, that, that's all the types of options that we've. Too. Yeah, there is some pretty wide boulevard. There's sidewalk that's intermittent. A lot of it's curb line walk. Um, but I, yeah, those are the types of, of options we'd be looking at to try to meet those, uh, the needs of some of the businesses. Um, I did pull the traffic on there. It's 8.5% heavy vehicles. So it's not, um, you know, it's on, not a 50-50 between those very large trucks. Um, yeah. As we had sort of heard before. Well, I, I think it was more the, the uh, you know, the dually with the tradesperson trailer behind it. It was kind of the, that's a little hard to get in and out of the, the on-site parking. You know, and I can see that. I, I can, I, you see a lot of those kinds of trades vehicles in that area too. So um, I think that, I think before giving up on the route, I think it might be worth looking at whether there are some ways we can accommodate particularly the business traffic uh, that, that comes in and out of this area and whether, you know, one option, I don't know whether there's enough boulevard space to look at multi-use trail, uh, the length of it rather than on street and then return some of, and even use some of the street space, narrow the, the road itself a little bit, but then leave parking maybe at least on one side where there's a lot of loading and unloading issues. You know, and, and net cost of that might actually be lower than taking it off and and uh, and moving it to 91st, where there already is a multi-use trail. So, so I, I mean, I'm very open to looking at some alternatives uh, to this, particularly in light of what we've heard uh, from the businesses, and then also to make sure that some of the turning movement things that you've identified here could be addressed as well in short order. So, thank you. Um, the, the one of the suggestions made, and it might be impossible, but was to allow parking 11.30 to 1.30, which I guess would eat into the uh, southbound uh, bike lane. Could you have that, or is it just too much of a conflict to consider having parking and bike lane in the same space, but for two hours a day, you would have it be for parking? I think we'd have to look at, there's a lot of considerations. Um, That's one thing you could look at. We could look at it. Certainly, would fly in the face of best practice and preferred practice, and a lot of safety-related elements. But yeah. we could look at it. Okay, uh, Councilor Nickel. Uh, that was that was one of the points I was going to try to uh, to make. There are many different kinds of businesses with different kinds of operational hours, and it, it's not just about Fitzgeralds operating it as as a bar, but it is people who start at six and can clo they're closing their shop at six. And so that, where that, that's where that conflict comes into being able to pull in and pull out and park and not, uh, not being able to move the truck around. Um, it's, um, I guess I'll speak to it a little bit. Um, both Councillor Sohi and I have heard numerous complaints about this stretch of road. And we're both of the opinion that this should be on 91st. And speaking, I guess uh, from a Mill Woods perspective, uh, we're going we're gonna to argue that it needs to be moved. Um, and so for all the various reasons that we went through and uh, the discussions we went through, um, I'm speaking to it now. I understand and appreciate the 1,600 meters uh, that the extra, uh, the, the cyclist is going to have to go. But measured against employment and the loss of probably hundreds and perhaps million, a million or so in sales, if not employees, in terms of the number of employee loss, this is just not the right place for a bike lane uh, to an industrial commercial area. Well, we have better places to put it. And if it is about building better, a better view of bike lanes across the city, and if it is about building support for bicycle infrastructure, I think, what, uh, Doran, you said you want to go where you're welcome as opposed to where people are going to fight you, correct? Pretty much. And so um, I do appreciate your, your movement towards uh, the counting methodology. Um, you know, uh, between 2011 to 2014, we've added 14, 14 data points 
Okay, I'm not sure what those are. They could be that cyclist going three, four times a day as opposed to going twice a day back and forth when you're, when you're doing your counts. So that's why, you know, in terms of saying that we've had a 25% increase over three years, well, you just, you just heard Mr. Fitzgerald say he's lost into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so from that point of view, there's got to be that, when I discuss this, there has to be that cutoff. There has to be that metric that has to be put into, and the, uh, that financial metric when you're going around. Because we've had, we had a similar problem in Ritchie uh, on 76, if you recall, about a uh, bike lane going in front of some businesses there. And it, the community was in an absolute uproar because we took away parking space for handicapped people, we took parking space away for churches, we took parking space away for even some home-based businesses. And again, uh, that goes to the consultation sort of it. And it really, uh, and if we've heard from this, uh, a few speakers today, uh, it really undermined uh, the rollout. It really did. And I do believe Mr. Fitzgerald, when he said he got a letter and three days later they were painting the lines, I think, that, I think that's what happened because I've talked to a few of the businesses up and down that street and that's just not going to help anybody. And so um, I'll have a discussion with Councillor Sohi on this. I appreciate uh, uh, your worship, uh, your, your perspective on this, but kind, kind of coming from Mill Woods, um, we're kind of seeing that 91st Street is really the preferred option uh, from, uh, from, a, from our ward perspectives. But... Um, I will talk to Councillor Sohi and we will go on from there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Committee, your wishes? Oh, Mayor oh, Ibsen. Oh. I'll move this uh, report for uh, information. Okay. Well, just, just a question on that. I, might, I, I, I think we can interpret from Councillor Nichols' comments that a motion will come forward uh, at, at Council on this. And so I just want to flag that we until until we deal with that, we may not want to spend money on the in-service road safety and operation review. We may want to hold off on that. If if you're uh, if you if you're if council is going to have a discussion about that, I mean you're giving informal notice of motion, I suppose today. Uh, and 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 um, respectfully, I I'm not sure you quite know my perspective on this um, because if there was if there was one area where I do have hesitation. Uh, about impacts on businesses. It's, it's from what we've heard here uh, uh, and looking at this street and understanding there are some particular needs in an industrial area that I think we need to be cautious about. And if there are some other alternatives that, uh, and, and this may require enhancing some connectivity into the area from, from uh, uh, the uh, east on, off 91st if it's the will of council to go in this way. And this may require some additional connectivity work at the, at the top end between 63rd uh, or Argyle Road and, and to get it up back up onto 97th if you're moving through the neighborhood rather than going down into the valley uh, through, the, through, the, um, through the ravine, which is already well used and well connected. So I think, I think this, this precipitates some other work if it's the will of council to go in this direction. I'm, I'm open to looking at it and if we were going to spend a million bucks on something, <laughs> Uh, this would this would be higher on my list. So, thank you. But I'll wait for the motion to come forward, and we'll see what the see what the alternatives are at that time. You have moved this received for information. For the questions or comments, call the question. All in favor? That is carried. Seven point two. Bike lanes, utility corridor. Mr. Golly, good to see you. Yes, nice to see you too. It's been so long. Yes. Um, so this final report on bike lanes for today um, is in response to an inquiry from Councillor Gibbons, um, looking for more information about how are we incorporating bicycle infrastructure through utility corridors, Anthony Henry rights of way and that type of thing um, to look at alternatives other than just on street bike lanes. Starting in 2001, we, uh, we had the multi-use trail corridor study. We've changed names, they're now called shared use paths. Um, but we've been implementing that since 2001. There's been a number of things that has happened um, to include shared use paths into a number of our projects and our, our infrastructure program. Um, 
One is that our design construction standards have had been revised or has been revised since this approval to include shared use paths on one side of the arterial streets. So that's providing a, a fairly good network um, in new areas. Uh, we've also been building shared use paths as part of utility corridors and uh, as included through the Anthony Henday expansion. Um, so the city's been building these, the land development industry has been building them, the province of Alberta through the Henday project and the River Valley Alliance. So there's been a number of players. Our network currently is over 425 kilometers of off-street uh, paved shared use paths in Edmonton. And uh, for the most part, they're really good for recreation. And in, um, in the interior of the city, the older parts of the city, they're less effective for commuting because the network is, uh, it's more difficult to fit them in. But in the new areas of the city, uh, they're going to be quite good for commuting purposes to get to work and to school. And I have, um, through Councillor Gibbon's advice, I've included a number of maps here to sort of illustrate how some of these new neighborhoods and areas uh, will, be, will be functioning and be connected. So there's a lot of colorful lines on this map. They all represent, um, for the most part, the bicycle network. And you can see the... Sorry, Gabriel. Okay. Um, sorry, I thought you were flagging me down. Um, so you can see all these lines on the map, and, and the blue line is uh, the primary bicycle network, the black lines are the secondary primary ne uh, bicycle network, um, orange is showing shared use path, and so the blue and black lines could also be shared use path, and what you see is that you'll have a complete connected network through the Horse Hill neighborhood uh, one. Uh, Dakota ASP in the southeast, again we have the arterial roads which are dark gray, and then we have the uh, active transportation network in the pinky magenta, which doesn't show up on the screen all that well. Um, and again, showing a fairly connected network of shared use paths to get to uh, the various destinations within these neighborhoods as well as transit. Um, as the neighborhood plans come in, we'll see even more detail. Hawks Ridge is in Big Lake area. Uh, again, we have an addition, uh, shared use paths along the arterial roads as well as internal network of pathways to get to uh, the school and parks and uh, the recreation areas and the natural areas. Um, Riverview ASP is in the southwest uh, of the city. Um, we're currently reviewing one of the neighborhoods or two of the neighborhoods uh, for their active transportation network, which would uh, build off of this. And again, the dark gray lines are arterial roads that would have shared use pass along them. There's the utility rights of way where my mouse is going over here in the dashed yellow, which would provide a shared use path that would connect to uh, crossings of the Hende and existing uh, trails that are through the Anthony Hende corridor. There's also top of bank trails. So again, in our newer areas, we're building these connected networks of pathways, which uh, will make them very accessible and safe to cycle around, regardless of if you're going to school or for a su Sunday, Saturday ride, or trying to get to work, um, particularly as we're adding more employment in, in our industrial areas. So the next steps is, is we're going to continue on the development of our shared use paths through the various partners that we have. And uh, one of the key updates, I guess, is, is we're creating a, an updated GIS map that, that catalogs and uh, collects all the information on the existing shared use paths, which will help, uh, help us to identify gaps and opportunities to improve network connectivity uh, throughout the rest of the city. Um, and that should be um, available, um, I believe, in June of this year. Thank you. Um, Ms. Soles, you're signed up. Ali Solas show today. Oh, hello again. Uh, hello. This is our a marathon day, I guess, on, <laughs> on cycle uh, on cycling. Again, my um, comments relate to the areas that I'm uh, more familiar with, and I'm just going to carry on with what I um, what went beyond five minutes before. Um, I, I agree that we've, we've done a lot with the, uh, the, uh, um, the off street uh, where, where we could, and I, I think that, that um, Tyler pointed that out uh, quite well. Um, one example I wanted to, I wanted to use two more examples that uh, came to my attention when I was with the FCL last year, and they aren't these, uh, the areas today, but I think they're illustrative. When the, um, all that concern um, uh, broke out, or whatever you would call it, happened um, around election time, I guess, in 2013, about the uh, cycling infrastructure on 40th Avenue and 106th Street south of the White Mud. 
um, I went down and took a look because I, I thought, well, gee, you know, this sounds like it's some great big um, problem. And I took a look and I was absolutely um, astounded. It was marvelous infrastructure compared to what we had in our area on uh, north, on 106 north of uh, 51st and on 76. No parking had to be removed. No, um, their sharrows weren't needed. You know, the site, there was so much width in those roads that they could add the bike, the cycling lanes, keep all the parking, keep all the, you know, their, keep the sidewalks. No sidewalks had to be turned into multi-use trails. There was room for everything and yet the, there was this huge hue and cry about the uh, cycling infrastructure. So on the one hand, I thought, well, the people in other parts of the city would be, you know, they'd, they'd be drooling over this on the one hand. On the other hand, I looked at it and I said, there is so much room here. You could do separated lanes. You can do cycle tracks. You can do something so that, you know, when you see the bike lane go be between the traffic lanes, you know, no lanes had to be removed. There were four, still two in each direction. You see the cycle lane in between the traffic lane and the parking lane. It looks like a recipe for disaster. You know, I don't know that it is, but that's, you know, how people feel, you know, feel it, that it's um, not comfortable cycling in that, in that um, spot between the, uh, the travel lanes and the parking. And again, parking on both sides, nothing had to be removed. So it, um, and I asked someone about that who worked um, in active transportation and it was entirely a cost issue. Um, you know, there, there was just limited amount of money so they painted the lanes. But it would, you know, that sort of thing I assume in the, in, I expect to see in the future would be upgraded to uh, a cycle track because it's, you know, the, the space is there, uh, is there for it. And then another example, um, I was talking with a league representative um, last year in another part of the city, and they were concerned about shortcutting and speeding in their neighborhood on roads that went in front of a school, um, and they weren't uh, really pleased uh, yet. I don't, uh, you know, they, they were a little concerned that transportation wasn't doing what they'd like there. And it was on the network. It hasn't the the uh, cycling infrastructure hadn't been put in, but it is you know designated for cycling infrastructure. Ms. So I Solis, said, well, I, I just again, wanted five. To, if you're getting to utility corridors, because that's what we're talking about, oh, this okay. item, please get to that oh, okay. before you run out of time. No, I, I was just going to say I um, when I suggested that they look into the bike lane option on this, you know advancing the bike lane in this area. They said they were so opposed to bike lanes. So I, again, I think that that points to the need for the early and often consultation. And, and in some instances, you can't, use, you can't use utility corridors. I mean, you can use them in many instances, but to get to certain places in town, you, you can't. You need them um, in the streets uh, as well, is what I would, um, my contribution on that on that point would be. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Councilor Gibbons, you have a question. So on the last um, slide that they had up there, next steps, shared use paths will continue to be built by city development industry and other partners. So really, it, in, if you take a look at some of the plans that they had up there, they're using under Elta Link um, power lines, they're looking different things. That's mm -hmm. what I was trying to drive at because Back when I brought this um, forward, uh, back in 2013, it was a hot issue just before an election, and it was a hot issue on people being concerned on a lot of different wards. Uh, what can we do? Because not everybody is a, a commuter to work. They're recreation. They're moving. But there is ways you can do it. Like just in, in the River Bend area, you have a pipeline that goes uh, and power line that goes down through uh, across from River Bend through the ravine and uh, by the Providence Center and all that. Can we use it? Can I don't. We? I don't see why not. But it doesn't solve the whole whole no, problem. Because no, no, if no. you're trying to get to work or trying to get to school, your school isn't going to be along that power line. You know, you can use it to a no, certain extent. There's, there's a couple different ways. But I all I did when um, 
Tyler came in front of me and showed me uh, these different plans that are going forward, whether it's the Horse Hill or Dakota or uh, Hawks Ridge or and, and or um, Riverview, it's happening. And it yes. might be the commutes, it might not be, but it's just, um, it falls in the line with what I was asking for. Mm -hmm. Can we use it? Can we uh, proceed more in that? I've got quite a few power lines going through Northeast Edmonton. Why not? Tie into it. That's, so that's what I was doing. Yes, I, and I don't disagree with that. It's just that it won't solve all the... No, we're never going to well, solve never. It. Well, no, it, it's not that it won't solve all the problems, but it won't provide all the cycling infrastructure that's needed. No, and um, I don't think that I ever thought that it could. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Gibbons. Anyone else? Thanks, Ms. Solis. Appreciate your time. Mr. Golly. last time. Councillor Gibbons, you have your hand up again. So I'll start with you. So, with um, the plans that are going out, if, for example, if you're in the, the far northeast as we're doing the neighborhood structure plan two and moving forward, they can use the Alta link, they can use the other lines that are down there. But really, are we driving it toward the, um, the potential of the LRT being up there? Is that some of our connections? Because otherwise, it's you might as well be living in Fort Saskatchewan and ride downtown if you're going to be doing that for a trip. So it's got to be linked in with something else, would you not? Yeah, we're, we're trying to link to employment zones, schools, park sites, as well as transit is a big one. So in the northeast with the existing LRT and the planned uh, extension, hopefully with the federal dollars, we can do that sooner than later. But yes, that's a very important piece of it. And that would be the same with Dakota. It would not necessarily be LRT, but it would be to a transit center that would take you somewhere else. Correct, yeah. So there's that, that linkage between cycling, walking, and, and transit for sure. So I guess it's, it's a shared use. In, in the uh, example I used on, on the um, river bend across into Blue Quill to go farther east, can, is there ways that you've looked at that to plan that, those strips forward? I guess you take a, um, an overall map of the city where there's pipelines and or power lines and or whatever. Are you using any of those linkages onto what we'd call the, the more, mo uh, the older type communities? Yeah, there are certainly are, are some of those. Um, in uh, in Hazeldean, for instance, there's an old rail line up around, I believe it's around 68th Avenue, um, where there, there was a trail put in. Um, another opportunity that might be presenting itself is with the redevelopment of the CP lands um, through uh, Old Strathcona, that, that linkage. There is some talk about adding, um, Councillor Anderson's not here, but he, had, he was asking about the north-south connections. Possibly that's another way to get a north-south connection through some of these old rail lines. Um, so yes, those are part of the, uh, part of our metrics when we're looking for, for bike infrastructure. Yeah. Let it run along the high-speed tra uh, train system there, right? Eh? Yeah, we'll, we'll elevate the train and have the bikes underneath. Right. Yeah. Th thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Mayor Iverson. Well, I was just looking at, uh, on the previous item, we have that, um, that uh, the map, and there's the CP right-of-way, which they're abandoning from the north, and I, I don't know how far south they've gone with that, but um, that that between that and 91st with some cross streets might give us a different way in and out of those employment areas over time um, while still maintaining 97th as uh, some kind of route but but the high quality facilities might be easier to fit in on uh, next to the, in the wide right away of 91st and and in a, a rail corridor for example if that was the direction we go certainly yeah and our, our roadway maintenance folks and parks maintenance you know, clearing shared use path throughout the winter is much easier than trying to do uh, clearing the on street. Clearing cycle tracks or on street. Uh, on street bike lanes in particular, line. cycle tracks, they're quite confident they can do the same uh, level of service as a shared use path. But, oh, okay. Uh, That's yeah. good. Ops is cooperating with you? That's Always. great. Cool. <laughs> Things can change. That's good. Great. Done? Yeah, well, I'm done. Are you done? <laughs> I'm, I've said more than enough. Uh, thank you. I have a couple quick questions because I've used uh, the LRT shared use path going northeast, and which is fabulous uh, as the crow flies. And yet there's those breaks at 12th and 18th, I think, and further on. Is it in our overall long-term plan? Are we looking at some 
better connectivity there with signage and other maybe even infrastructure? Yes, there is. The, the one station, I believe it's Stadium Station, It's uh, the right-of-way is very tight there, so that's why we had to bypass, and that was one of the on-street routes that we had provided. Um, I, I believe it's in our uh, work plan to review the signage through there to, to navigate around the station to tie back Tight in. is it in there? Could it, is, it, are, are, is it our engineers being too, too, too conservative? It, uh, I'm, I'm an engineer, so um, I know. Yeah, uh, and it, it is it is very tight, especially with um, some of the some of the um, the protections that we need to have in place for some of the other rail movements. So, in time, maybe there's another alternative. Yeah, no, yeah. I just think that's the, the routes like that are so fabulous. If you were working in Fort Saskatchewan, it could hop off the LRT at Clairview or Belvedere and ride your bike downtown. That would be another option for you. So those are great. Anyways, that was it. Uh, Councillor, I'll move, I'll move uh, the report for information. Thank you very much. Any discussion? All in favor? That is carried. Just we a are thanks at, to admin for all this information. Yeah, That's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, seen enough of you for a while, though, Mr. Golly. Yeah. 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 We're at the break. Yeah, we're, we'll be back for item uh, 6.1 after the break at 3.45 sharp. Thanks for your help today.
Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fair. Um, and we're on item 6.1, 102 Avenue Bridge Replacement Project Update. And we're all ears. Mr. Chairman, we have a, a short presentation. We're going to highlight some of the, uh, the consultation and planning on the lead up to, uh, to the 102 project. We'll cover a little bit of, of uh, the city's response during um, March 16th and April, April 7th when then we had the girder incident. And we'll talk a little about some potential options going forward for traffic mitigation, given this could be a, an extended schedule project. And I'd also like, we have uh, Craig Walbaum, and I'd also like to introduce Stephanie McCabe, who is our uh, new Director of uh, Policy Implementation and Evaluation in the Transportation Planning Branch. So she's here as well to talk about the broader network impacts of traffic and, uh, and obstructions. So I'll turn it over to Craig. Thanks, Dorian. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll try to make this presentation uh, brief. So today we're just going to go over the 102 Avenue Bridge Replacement uh, Traffic Impact and Public Engagement Measures. So that's the overall main project as, as it began. And then we'll specifically get into and talk about uh, the measures that we took uh, for the Grout Road extended closure, both the immediate measures as well as some of the long and medium term measures that are being reviewed. So one of the big elements in, in any major plan project of this scale is public engagement. Um, there were two official public meetings. One was held September uh, of 2012, where really what we were identifying and showing at that point was just the design and the concept of what the uh, new bridge would be. Uh, later to that, once we went away and did our detailed design after that meeting, there was a construction phase meeting where we went into more details about some of the staging of that, more specifically what the bridge would look like, and that was held in 2014 prior to entering into the project. In addition to that and all the way along through this process, we've had significant effort in circulation of communication materials uh, through all the various stages, and attachment one in the report identifies a list to the date of when we wrote this of all of those elements that were, that were included. In terms of the traffic, traffic impact measures, just highlighting some of the higher level ones, um, the report specifically asked around traffic signals. So this is just a graphic which is attachment two in the report which identifies that there were over 25 traffic signals that were uh, changed or adjusted. And this wasn't just going to each one and tweaking it a little bit. We actually broke out this whole area of the city and when we did what's called a retime where we looked at more significant changes to try and coordinate the flows in these whole areas for the the change in the traffic patterns that we anticipated. In addition to that, Edmonton Transit adjusted for the routes, primarily the ones that were impacted directly from the 102 Avenue, uh, as well as having a shuttle bus service around that bridge closer uh, using Stony Plain Road on either side of the, of the ravine. Uh, in addition to that, there was significant effort, and, and this is ongoing in terms of parking restrictions that were implemented around managing traffic in that whole area. The main project was primarily around 124 Street, Stony Plain Road area and it extended, of course, when Grow will close into other uh, corridors. Now shifting focus to Grow Road itself. The immediate measures that we took um, were to uh, deploy an extensive amount of roadside message signs. There was in the order of, well, over 20 between our dynamic message signs that we can move around as well as static signs that were put out. Those extended right out onto the major corridors of White Mud Yellowhead just to give guidance uh, far out uh, of the impact of this closure and notification so motors could take uh, various choices. Edmonton Transit had to uh, detour Route 128 which specifically uses Grout Road and they moved it to 116th Street and added extra service to uh, maintain their schedule reliability with that and that stayed in place through the duration of the Grout Road closure. Um, there were a number of uh, signal changes that were implemented as well. I'll just uh, shift back so the larger orange sorry the larger orange dots that are on the map there. Sorry about that. Uh, identify the extra signal changes that were specifically made and implemented the Monday of the closure, uh, given that we were gonna be extending into at least a few weeks, uh, ended up being three weeks. So it just shows the scale of effort made on the signals. In addition to that, uh, we had a number of further parking restrictions that we initially put in place for all times of day just to try and maximize the traffic flow. Those were monitored throughout the first week of the closure and we backed off on a lot of those restrictions just to be the AM and PM peaks once we saw traffic settle down and what the patterns were to try and provide again that balance of providing some of that parking service while still maintaining the traffic. Uh, in addition to that, there was a, a significant amount of work that Stephanie's group did on reviewing a network-wide traffic modeling 
and I'll just go into a little uh, few key elements of that. So our department has at the network scale a regional traffic model which really uh, is a personal travel model that identifies by mode, so transit, auto and other modes, what's happening throughout the city and region. It also includes commercial vehicles and does have ability to look at associated emissions with it. So that's a kind of higher level, the, the model that we've had for some time that looks at that scale. Uh, so that's a land use based model that we can look at what's happening today and predict the future of growth for the city. We also have a dynamic traffic assignment model which is fairly new to our city and Stephanie's group has built and developed one of these models that basically covers the uh, from the inner ring loop and all of the arterial roads within it. This model allows us to look at a, a much more higher level of detail to look at our uh, detour route prediction, so origin destinations where we think traffic is going when all the roads are open and we can look at dynamically what happens if we close roads down. Since we had this model built for the PM Peak, we utilized it to test what we were doing and to validate what we were doing through the process and it really helped us look at the associated travel times that we thought would be happening and that we were trying to adjust for and accommodate. So what we observed through that uh, through the models is that the regional traffic model was used to look at those impacts and it identified that given the duration of this closure we didn't expect a lot of mode change. So we weren't anticipating that we'd have a lot of shift to transit as an example because of, of the nature of this closure and the duration of it. What it did identify however is that we expected traffic with the greater delays to probably spread out their time of leaving or, or spreading of that peak period of that uh, peak traffic activity time. And that's what the model basically uh, identified and we did observe some of those patterns happening. For the dynamic traffic assignment model, we used it to validate our signal timings and that they were basically making a positive difference to the network flows. Uh, and we did analyze the overall network delay and saw clearly there was increases in that and there's graphs in attachment three in your report that identify individual corridor travel time increases as well as the overall network delays. So we saw up to 20% additional delay overall with the closure of Grout Road. Significant traffic was shifted, but we did see a, a, a small increase in benefit to that from the additional signal changes we made. So with what we could do on the corridors we could, we were making a difference. And again, we used that model to validate and look at the travel times from our field observations and they were of similar scale. So we were seeing anywhere from about five to 10 minute travel time increases at the peak times of day from the, the closure. Some of the medium and long term options that we explored were um, the reversible lane concept on Stony Plain Road and we have here that it's not recommended. Stephanie's group also did a model validation of looking at if we shifted three lanes one way, one lane the other and what basically it identified and, and we believe would be the case is that there's actually a, uh, a negative impact overall to the overall flow because of the nature of how peak the traffic is in the peak direction restricting one lane to a single lane actually causes quite a bit of congestion to that single lane and the benefits to the three lanes happen in the in the corridor limits but they have to get to a constraint point anyway so we just get them to that constraint point faster is basically what we found through that model analysis. Uh, the dedicated tow truck operations was another element that I included in the report. In the report we're basically just showing if we were to dedicate a tow truck or two to the corridor to be roving around to keep things moving. Depending on many hours it could be anywhere from about $500 to $1,000. There is another report that is coming forward that Councillor McKean requested where they're going to go into a lot more details about our existing contracts and the whole spectrum of that more from the parking enforcement side. What I provided in this report is just the scale of dollars if we were to dedicate a, a tow truck to be monitoring and keeping traffic flowing primarily. So getting stalled cars crashes out of the way faster. So that's the context for that. We are continuing to look at how we can improve our off street parking situation for the businesses around 24th Street and Stony Plain Road and uh, there's some elements of that in the council report as well. So those uh, efforts continue as well as our work with the business association in that area to try and improve signing for existing parking and uh, guidance for the businesses in that area. And that's the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll start. Um, first of all, I want to um, thank you um, for one, in, in one thing in particular, um, we were applying for a parking, to have a, 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 to develop a parking lot 
lost that appeal, and I thought <clears throat> the meters along Stony, uh, just uh, west of 124th, I thought you would pull them or bag them, and that didn't happen. And I think that showed, even though it's not necessarily appreciated, I thought it showed um, uh, real consideration for small independent business in that area. Probably not appreciated, but I appreciated it. Um, and I think we're continuing with that policy that uh, peak hours, it's, there's no parking, but the rest of the time they can, there's still parking there, metered parking in front of those businesses west of 124th. We did make a change to it, so it's now restricted 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., but we left evenings and weekends to try and strike that balance. Okay, I have a phone call that I must return, so that's good to know. Um, and that, so that, and we know that's helped, the six to six, it's improved things. It's yeah, worth from, it. from a traffic flow perspective, there's been less congestion and delay of weaving around those parked vehicles in the day when traffic's busier overall. Do we know that since the uh, 102 Avenue Bridge has been out, that traffic is now sort of some of the kinks have worked out, more people using maybe 107th to come in from the west, that sort of thing. Do we, do we see it sort of settle down after a while, less uh, congestion and gridlock? We did. Certainly when, when just 102 Avenue was closed, we saw that, that transfer uh, away. Like there was a lot of users still used on the plain road. Some used 107, a few less used 111, but it, it got to that point of equilibrium where everyone was choosing the routes for their origin destinations, and it had reached that state. It was Grote Road, closure of Grote Road. When Grote Road closed, I think traffic, typically traffic's going to take even longer than that to get to that full state of equilibrium, but we did see traffic move around a little bit. Um, but we did see, you know, really there was extra delays on all of those routes, but even the modeling showed that the greatest extent of the delays would be to Fox Drive, where people were now using White Mud Drive because Grote was did closed you, completely. Did you say it was sort of a five to ten minute maximum delay, though? That's correct. And is that modeled or is that, do we sort of... That's both. So the worst case, you're going to work, Grote Road's now closed, you're, you're ten minutes later. Unless there's a stalled vehicle, which I did see one day when I was checking one of the routes. So it, when traffic's moving, flowing smoothly, we saw up to 10 minute delays, additional delays from before it was closed. Can anybody give me any, uh, do we know at all in some of these key routes where there's metered parking and there's no parking during peak hours, whether or not we're giving out tickets, but we're, whether there would be a need for tow trucks? I know we're getting a report at the end of June, I think it is, but do we have any, early information on that and whether or not there is an issue, like people are coming out 20 minutes later seeing a ticket, but meanwhile they've been blocking traffic for 20 minutes? Yeah, I don't have the specifics on that. I know as part of the Grout Road closure, we specifically asked for added enforcement and asked them to be ready to deploy tow trucks, but I don't have stats on and if that was necessary or actually deployed at this point, but that should be part of that report coming forward again. You said you're still working on improved off-street parking on 124th. You're still doing that. That's still an active program here. We are. Even when we looked at the lot you had mentioned, there's a six-month window uh, where we're not allowed to consider it. But after that window, we can consider it again. We're also talking with other businesses in the area to see if there's any opportunities there. So we do continue to try and pursue providing that service okay. if we can. Yes. Great. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thanks. Mayor Ives. So the, uh, with respect to that parking lot, is it, it's privately held, it's not owned by, or that potential parking lot, it's not a parking lot yet, that's held by a third party? It is. Okay. Um, the six month delay uh, is to go back to SDAB, but is there anything council could do uh, by way of zoning to expedite that? The process of why it's where it's at is because we had to do a zoning change to allow it to be used for parking, and that's what failed at the SBA. Well, no, that was a, that was a development permit of, of, uh, application that failed their zone because the zoning doesn't automatically allow it as a permit. Okay, so, yeah, fair enough. So, yeah. so I was wondering whether we can override that by looking at the zoning, but uh, SD's not here, so and neither of the lawyers, and I'll get nervous that I'm even asking about it. So. We can we can uh, pursue that. Well, the lawyers are here. Uh, just a thought. We'll pursue it more. Yeah, our understanding right now is we don't have that ability, but we'll look further and clarify. 
Okay. Well, I mean, I think we'd want the consent of the landowner to participate, even if there was going to be a, uh, an application to put a direct control on there with the normal use, and it would revert to the normal afterwards. And even that takes weeks and months, though. So six months might be up before that was over. The, um, the so just to be clear, the the five to ten minute additional delay was with the incremental addition of Grote being closed on top of 102. That was, Correct. Okay. And so that cumulatively across all the people using the system is shows up in this in this bar graph on uh, page 24 of the overall report which which is the um, the additional looks like about 16 1700 hours uh, delay in vehicle hours that's correct it's about 18 percent increase so if that's say it's 10 minutes per then six cars being delayed by 10 minutes would be an hour so if I understand this correctly, it's it's 60,000 cars being delayed an extra 10 minutes, roughly, is how you would get to... Uh, it's 150,000 cars within the inner ring road that were delayed. So every car inside the ring road was delayed, or every, or that's how many cars are inside the ring road? The network-wide delay, $150,000, or 150,000 cars are within the inner ring road, and that's the total delay within the inner ring road. Okay, so so some were delayed by a lot, and some were delayed by very little. Okay. That's and your model would, would catch all of that. What, what did, uh, just out of curiosity, and if you mentioned this, I apologize, I missed it, but wh uh, what did we develop that model for? We developed it so we could have a better understanding of route diversion. Um, we are using it for a number of things in-house, um, LRT planning, That's community really traffic right. management plans, as well as detour analysis. This was kind of our very first uh, real application of this, this modeling tool. So, but this this will help us understand what sort of signal light modifications we need to make over time as uh, West LRT opens up through this same area, for example. It'll help us to understand where we should focus for the best travel times. Mm. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm glad we have these kinds of tools to bring to bear to uh, into forward-looking planning, but then also when something like this arises. So that's good. That's good to know. And. Um, I had one other question. Well, I, I don't know if now is a suitable time to ask about it, but any, any further news on the bridge itself? Um, we do, and I'm... Well, there's Barry. Um, I think I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask Barry to give you the update. He was the, uh, the, the lead person on the file. He, he dealt just, directly on site. I need to know if I need to tweet out shakes fist at girder number five or, or not. I was going to say maybe we have to ask the media to leave because they're not interested in this anyways. It basically, um, if you go back to that uh, three-week closure of Grote, uh, I'd just like to mention publicly it was a minor miracle for us to get that open within three weeks. So our contractor, in this case Graham, and their subcontractor, Supreme Steel, did everything to allow that to happen. So we just wanted to mention that. Um, your question going forward on the project, um, we have a road closure strategy in place, making sure that any work we're doing on that project going forward will be nighttime and weekend, which was like last weekend, so that's a key thing, again, to minimize the overall uh, traffic movements. Our girder strategy that we did last weekend when we did close it from Saturday morning to 10 p.m. on Sunday evening was to survey all of the seven girders. Technically, it was to survey six of them. We know girder seven is 100% because it was not up when the buckling occurred on March 16th. And uh, based on from last weekend, girders 1, 2, and 3 are also okay. The suspect girders are girders 4, 5, and 6. Uh, we will close it again uh, this Saturday morning at 6 a.m. with plan to open up uh, 6 a.m. On, on Monday. And that is to allow for some more temporary bracing to allow us the following weekend to remove a girder or more. And that when we do remove a girder, um, the girders are 110 feet or 40 meters long, roughly. Uh, they're about 14.5 14 uh, meters high, so 4.5 meters high, around 15 feet. Basically, you have the steel in the middle and you have the flange on top. The flange on the top and the bottom are what gives you the strength. So going forward, one of the options, again, it all has to be supported by engineering to make sure it's safe. That's why this weekend putting in some more temporary supports allows us to remove a girder 
and still allow the existing girders to stay in place and have traffic flowing because it's all about safety for the structure and more importantly for the people underneath. Um, one of the, our options are to take that girder out, being number five, remove the top, replace it with new steel, put it back in. Uh, obviously in, in doing that it would still mean that we would not complete the project this year. Uh, but we're doing everything humanly possible to make sure that we shorten that time frame because we do understand not only the impact as you've mentioned overall from a traffic perspective but it's the businesses that are adjacent out there that are the ones that are being truly impacted. So we're, we're doing everything possible from a safety and an engineering perspective to shorten that time schedule and, and uh, get the project onto a schedule that we can make sure we can safely open it. Well, thanks for this additional information and uh, for the continuous communication that you've provided to us and to the citizens. I think it's a di very difficult situation we all find ourselves in, but, but the clear communication you've provided has helped people understand that everyone is doing their best. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mayor Robson. Uh, Councilor Gibbons. So when you shut down, what did you base the dollars and cents, um, 15,000 I think the figure is, to shut the Grote Road down per day? What was that based on? Basically when you're looking at a project, and especially if a project when you take a road or a bridge out of service, you're going to want to make sure there's remedies in place to make sure that if the time schedule is impacted, that there's going to be a cost to the contractor. And anytime you're putting in a on the remedy a bonus or a penalty you can't put in one without the other you look at what the project costs are any of your remedies that you're going to put against the contractor is it's not to make money it's to recover any costs you may have so the 15,000 on this one we knew there were major detours with the transit when we originally came when we were putting the bridge in place it was anywhere from one to two million dollars just on on that cost alone and you bake you base that down uh, if the contractor is going to have to work longer, you're going to have to pay the consultants more because consultants are paid by the hour. There's going to be more city staff time. There's going to be more detouring. So that daily cost is based on a project by project. For example, a couple of years ago when we did Scona Road, it was a $10,000 a day uh, penalty. So each project we're looking at what the cost could be to offset costs that we may have to occur. So I just... Um looking at the diagram of all the different uh, light adjustments and the major ones, that's all part of it, right? That's all part of the 15000 That would be all part of building into what that cost per day would be. And when they take the girders out, I mean, you're quite a pinch point on 102nd Avenue. You're hoisting everything from both sides of 102nd Avenue? The, 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 there's, um, each girder is basically the ones that buckled were the middle girders. There's end girders on either side. This is just taking the middle out. Uh, the good thing by taking the existing girders, whether it be four, five, or six, I'll, I'll just say it could be any of the three at this time, we wouldn't need the big crane like we had before. This would be the smaller cranes that we would just put on the road so that we could easily take those out using the, 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 the Grote Road itself. It's never easy to sling properly, so I hope There will be a, uh, uh, and part of the meetings that my team is in just right now, and, and as far as, uh, this is probably just, you know, it was breaking news, news about 15 minutes ago when I'm on my, uh, you know, iPhone going, yes, we're going to close it this weekend, and we got a plan. But it's looking at the plan that the contractor's going to give us, and all the slings they're going to use, how they're going to do it, making sure that's all approved and then it's a step-by-step -step process because at the end of the day when the girders were put up we had an you know the contractor had an issue we don't want to see any issues happen again when you're going to use that reverse process can i give a suggestion of communication that doesn't seem to be out there because i do come out of the industry and every time i'm running into somebody you know supreme's a good company i mean you can't ask for a better company and when, when bridges and that but they don't necessarily they bid to a contractor the graham do they not? They're not bidding directly to, uh, or to the city. Yeah, we're the city of Edmonton, the, the prime contractor on this is Graham, and then those contractors choose the subs that they want to hire. So we deal directly with the contractor. So there's an, an awful lot of people complaining about the fact that we're going out of country, it's Koreans or whatever. But the fact is, it's not the steel people that are, we're taking the tender from. We're taking it from, like what you just said, Graham. Right, so and in this case we do have a good steel provider that's locally and working with that contractor. No, I, 
I'm just saying that seems to be a missing link because they're still asking the same darn question to me. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Henderson, did you want to Yes, go? a couple of little questions. Uh, while that theoretical girder that sounds like it has to come out to get repaired is out, um, is there any other work to continue or are we really stuck at that point? I mean, I have to assume you put the girders in because the next work had to happen with the girders in. Does that mean work comes to a stop or is there other stuff? Right, do we gain, do we, can, can we continue to gain time at the other end what, if, if other stuff can happen while we're waiting for the girder or does it really just throw us back until that girder arrives? It's a very good question and for clarity it gives us an opportunity. As I mentioned, the end girders are still in place. So with all the bracing we're putting in uh, for permanent and the temporary support, it allows the middle girder to, or the middle girder to be lifted out, the end girder stay in place. And if you've uh, looked out there between where the end girder ends and where the road is, there's quite a space there. That will be called a bridge abutment, all formed up and a lot of concrete being poured. So work is not stopping. It allows us to continue working to, towards the project being complete. So, so, and that is a key point. So even if we're now delayed waiting for it, it means that once it goes in, the length of time from when it goes in will be shorter than, because that's, I mean, that's useful to know. So, so it's not, it doesn't push us back an entire year because if we have to wait till same time next year to put that girder in, worst case scenario, I don't know if that's the case, for instance, we would have caught up a lot on other parts of the project that we would have had to do anyway. That is correct. And, and, and a, key, a key time in the, in the journey of this project is uh, once uh, the girder, if it's just the one girder that has to be repaired and stamped and engineer approved by the engineering team, which is our, you know, our city bridge engineer, our third party engineers and the engineering firm that's very well established uh, you know, with the engineering team. Once that girder is back in place, it, that's a key date and then we'll be reporting back because it'll take 90 days from that point to build the bridge deck. So that other work is happening on both ends, 90 days, and then we'll know exactly in counting of where the end of the project would so be. The, so the good news is because it's, because it's central girders, that, because the, extra, the outside girders are, are good, which we now know, it means that we can do work. So the good news is we can do work we didn't know we could do with the information we now have. That would have I mean, if those outside girders had been, had been in trouble, we would have been stuck, but we're not stuck in quite the way we thought we would. The worst case scenario was not going to happen. Yes, how you've explained it is, is perfectly correct. It allows us to continue with workers on site moving forward. So that's better than we thought the worst case scenario was. That's good to know. That's useful. I'm curious, in, in the other kind of maybe silver <coughs> lining of a dark cloud, um, I'm, I'm interested to know um, uh, with the modeling, I mean, obviously you've done the modeling, you have the computer model set up, it was ready to go so you could test this stuff. But we now have, I would hope, some real-time data to know whether or not, you know, so that you can make sure, I mean, for the future, if we, if, are we grabbing the real-time data we got from what happened for those two or three weeks and putting it into the modeling to make sure the modeling's playing out the way we thought it would? Because I'm guessing all of these things have to be fine-tuned, they're not, they're imperfect, and the more real data we have, the better the model will be. That's exactly, yeah, we've already done that. Taken tra real travel time data and put it into the model and validated the model again. Okay, so I'm curious to know, given that we now have the real time data, how the real time data matched up against the model. 90%. Great, that's good news. Super lining. So that'll help us in the future in terms of plan, not in terms of trying to avoid this kind of thing in the future in terms of planning, right? It'll that's help us the idea. In, it'll help us with other detour analysis, yeah. yes. Yeah. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, just a couple uh, more then. So the original uh, date of opening of the 102 Avenue Bridge was what? What was originally? It would have been October of 2015. And we, and we talked originally about a year delay. Basically at the beginning we said a year because the, it would put you into the next construction season. So from a, you know, from a guesstimate at that very beginning it puts you into the next season. Is it actually a year? That's something that won't be determined until that girder being repaired is put back in place, and then we'll know whether it's mid next season or towards the end. But it puts us into another construction season, so we basically said at the beginning, we, you know, we lose or just basically say another year, and then we work our way back as we move forward to hit milestones. Best case, this does not open until mid. Yeah, so we're not going to get this done in 2015. 
very, very unlikely in 2015. It puts us into the 2016 construction season, right. which would start next May for this type of bridge work. Uh, not only is there concrete decking and forming underneath, it's going to be an asphalt driving surface. So at, at the end of the day, it, it pushes you in for that type of work to make sure you have quality. Right. And, um, and I just wanted to add uh, one more thank you because we are, we're looking at uh, some signs to help out High Street. I don't know where we're at on that, but I, anything to report on that? Yeah, we actually were looking at two elements for them, uh, the high street area, extra signing and cleaning up some of the detour guide signing, as well as uh, considering additional parking guidance for what's available in the area. And that's being expedited? Yep, we have staff that have been out this week taking a peek at what's there today, and we're working with Jeff directly on following up and getting that done. Great. Thank you. We seem to be... Uh Oh, actually, I just have one other question. I guess is which is when when will we uh, when are we likely to get more information or your next update on? Uh, I appreciate the information about the closure today and the clarity that your your the purpose of that this weekend is to uh, evaluate the suspect girders, as you put it. Um, uh, when do you suspect you might have information about the outcome of those tests? That's probably still two or three weeks away. From an open communication, there'll be a public service announcement going out at 3 p.m. tomorrow. And um, there will probably be a quick uh, note from Dorian's office to uh, council and, uh, you know, just let him know kind of what we've said here and prior to the 3 p.m. tomorrow. You'll, you'll tell us how many you think you take, how many, well, you'll tell us how many you take after you, we'll all be able to see how many girders you take out, but... Yeah, so we, and we probably won't, we won't know that tomorrow. That's probably going to, you know, there's no, going to be... not until you're done. Yes, until yes, done. yes, because that would be a key mil a milestone and a key information piece, and when we hit those things, the key thing is to communicate and share that information because it will end up being, uh, you know, a determination of how long we're going to be behind in the schedule in the long and then term. And as, as far as the other, the other big question, which is still out there for all of us, is uh, understanding the cause. Is that one of the things that, that you may be able to ascertain through the removal and uh, inspections? That is part of the analysis uh, girder strategy that we have in place to come up with the root cause. Girder strategy. Well, I, I, as I said, I, I appreciate the continuing open communication. I think citizens want to know that the, first and foremost that, that safety is, uh, is everyone's top priority both during construction and that the bridge that we get when we're done is safe for everybody to use and will last 100 years and we get our, our uh, value for investment and, and that after that, now we're trying to minimize disruption and speed up the construction as quickly as possible to make up for any time. So I'm, I'm feeling that assurance from you, which is good. Thank you. 20, 30 years would have been enough for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, well, I'll I'm move receipt for just, information well, just, just so the motion is Yeah, I'm just, a, just curious. If, understanding you don't know the answer to this, but this is a what-if scenario, if the, say, one girder is repairable once you have to take it off but you have to repair it you're not rebuilding it from scratch so you're repairing it is it conceivably possible that that could still go in in this season and allow you at least get started on the deck this season is that in the realm of possibility or do we know is that a pipe dream if i could paraphrase you it could be in the realm of possibility yeah, I, I, but until I, I, the girder I, I, is is back in i would not say with any certainty yeah i know but it but so but if, if, if the existing girder, once it's down, is repairable, that repair probably takes less time. Is that still, is that still months and months and months to do, or is...? Um, like I mentioned, it could be like four or five, let's say approximately five weeks to repair the girder. Right. When the girder goes back in, we still need a full 90 days to build the bridge deck I from know, the bottom. But if you can get going on that 90 days in this season, it means that you don't need quite so many of those 90 days in the next season, right? That is correct. Right. I understand that you're not going to hit this year. I'm not suggesting that. It's just whether or not we can get some of it done this year. So, so we're talking about spring of next year rather than fall. That's theoretically still possible. That is our goal. Yeah. That's a good dream. Um, we have a motion before us to receive this for information. All in favor? That is carried. Carried. Any notices of motion? I'm calling this meeting. Good job. Good Adjourned. Time. First time out, Councillor. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, one and all, for making it so easy. Except for you, Ben.